Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour. Sooner or later, when you least expect it, there comes a point of no return, a dead end from which there seems no escape, a moment in time, a moment of crisis. What is about to happen to Floyd Steiner is a particularly American situation, one which would warm the heart of Horatio Alger. For what is about to happen to tall, ingenuous Floyd Steiner is living proof that virtue is its own reward. Young Steiner is about to be catapulted from obscurity to fame, from impotence to power, and all because of the insatiable hunger of politics for a perfect candidate. That Floyd Steiner could become that candidate is the essence of the democratic experience. But to say that it's all because Steiner is a typical American boy would be to understate the case. As you will see when we begin our tale of suspense, The Perfect Man, right after this. And now, John Amendola stars in Fred Sanchez's offbeat thriller, The Perfect Man. The room is appropriately filled with smoke. The men are political kingmakers, the local leaders of what has become a very embarrassed political party. Dismayed by the daily revelations of wrongdoing by big-name party members, the search is on for a candidate for governor, a candidate who will survive the most microscopic examination, a candidate whose past contains not one whisper of scandal, not a pinch of impropriety. But I say there isn't any such guy. Yeah, yeah, there is, there is, somewhere. Who says it has to be a guy? Now just pipe down, Amy. Somewhere in the computer there's a name, gotta be. Of a guy who's never been on the take, never made an unpopular move? The guy you're looking for can also walk on water. Who says it has to be a guy? Fight down, Amy. You're all living in the past. This state is ready for a woman governor. Yeah. Well, I'm not ready for a woman governor. All right, all right. Now, listen, everybody. We've been holed up in this room for five hours, and we got exactly four names. Trumbull, which uh, Billingsley like. has been a very savvy representative and from a very important district. Whose brother is doing a very long term in Nevada for embezzlement. And there's Jane Agagenian, who Ms. Scattergood here likes. Only her husband is divorcing her, and his car rental business is getting the fish eye from the eternal revenue. So she's out. Well, your man Pettigrew isn't so lily white either. No, he's a black, which makes him a very interesting character to begin with. We already got four black governors in the country. It's a trend. Only your man Pettigrew can't be controlled. He, he talks, talks to anyone. He's got a vocabulary that make a sailor blush, as the old song goes. Now, now we uh, we can't use Pettigrew. Well, we certainly can't run that guy, Ibby. He lives. I thought you were all for the libbers. Women's lib. No, the state's not ready for a gay gov either. Well, then, now where are we? All right, we're right back where we started. Look, we need a candidate with an image of honesty, vigor. Fairness, liberal. But conservative, law and order. For like police. I said, such a guy don't exist. I said that. Well, you were right. Wait a minute, Drum. What? Wait a minute. What is it everybody's interested in now? Getting two more miles to the gallon. No, no, no. I mean, what is it everyone's demanding? More for their money? Exactly. It's a consumer's revolt all over the country. People are picketing shops that won't be good on their promises, writing letters to their congressmen when they think they've been ripped off. It's the day of the consumer advocate. Ralph Nader don't happen to live in our state. No. Wait. Are you thinking of the guy I'm thinking of? The young lobbyist from upstate, 
The guy who keeps bugging us to write laws about fair trade practices. About... Right on, Wait brother. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Break it off. You mean that pimply face string bean, uh, Steiner, Ralph Steiner? Floyd Steiner. Well, Ralph Floyd. Well, but... what do you think? Well, let's check him out. Yeah. God knows he gets enough attention. The people love him. No, uh, no, no. Never. It'll never work. He's a bachelor. So what? No bachelor has ever been elected governor of this state. That doesn't make any difference. If Steiner checks out... If he'll take direction. If he's clean. But I mean really clean. If he's never been in politics, he could be our boy. (laughs) You're not going to believe this. Well, it better be good. You pulled me away from a caucus that really needs me. I canceled an interview with Jack Anderson's right-hand man. Listen, listen, listen. Two weeks ago in this very same lousy room, we had four names nobody liked. Then we all agreed on one guy we could live with. If he checked out clean, right? (laughs) Well, I've had my boys run a check on this guy, Steiner, that makes the FBI look like Orphan Annie. And what did you find out? Ask me. All right. Politics? Leans in our direction. Campaign for no one, no one. Voted in every election since he was like 21. How old is he? 28. Oh. Look, Floyd Steiner is an orphan. Folks lived in South Dakota. Both died when he was a kid. He was an A student in school, worked his way through two years of college in some little jerk water school in Nebraska, worked on a farm, helped organize something called the Future Farmers of America chapter, then served as a substitute den mother for the Cub Scout came to this state, passed the state board, started teaching physical education upstate in some little jerkwater town. I don't know which. doesn't matter. What does matter is Steiner helped save a guy whose house was on fire, got written up in some little backwoods country weekly, got a trip down here to the capital, got interested in politics. Then he began lobbying for consumer protection laws. You know the rest. Okay, okay. Now, now what about his private life? Clean as a whistle. Drives a 56 Chevy, don't owe a dime, rents a room right here in the capital, don't ever have any lady visitors or anyone else, eats in a cafeteria, and upstate the kids love him. Any uh, love life? I'm coming to that. There's a teacher in that school where he's the coach, uh, but it's all out in the open. Movies, walks in the park, ice cream, you know. <laughs> He's unreal. Unreal. Listen, he's a breath of fresh air. He's so innocent and earnest, he's going to make every politician look like bubonic plague. He's fresh, keen-minded, got real talent. But, but, will he run for governor? Why don't we ask him? He's been waiting outside for 15 minutes. The search for an antiseptic candidate for governor has narrowed down to one possibility. Floyd Steiner, a candidate with nothing to live down, a young man with impeccable credentials, A young man about to meet the party's kingmakers. Come on in, Mr. Steiner. Come in. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Trump. Mr. Steiner, I uh, have the pleasure now to present Miss Amy Scattergood, representative of our state's 16th district. Hello, Steiner. Uh, How do you do, Miss Scattergood? And C. Bancroft Billingsley, the well-known realtor and one of the major driving forces in our party. Well, I'm glad to know you, Steiner. Oh, I take it you already know Senator Drum here? Uh, no. Only from his voting record. <clears throat> oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I got you there, Ralph. Uh, well, uh, look, I'll come to the point. Ralph. <laughs> Can I call you Ralph? Uh, my name is Floyd. Floyd. <laughs> Floyd, of course. I keep calling you Ralph because you remind me of Ralph Nader. Whom I admire very much, by the way. <laughs> well, anyway, look, Ralph, I, uh... I think you know as well as I do that there's a crisis of confidence in the party. All right, the scandals, the mysterious goings-on everywhere. Spending and taxes. What this state needs is a governor that people can trust. Somebody who'll gain bipartisan support. A courageous man who's not afraid to take radical steps to remedy our problems. But, but, But a man who's firm on law and order, no nonsense kind of guy. And most of all, a candidate who hasn't got a closet full of skeletons. Well, I agree that the party needs such a man. Now, uh, just how how can I help you? Steiner, how would you like to be governor? Me? Governor? The thought never occurred to you? Governor? Why, no. I never thought about it for an instant. 
Hey, I'm just a small town school coach. With good old fashioned ideas about fair play. Principles. That's what we need. What do you say, Steiner? Well, <laughs> well, if you're serious, I, well, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Boy, I'd have to do a lot of thinking about it. Well, it, it'd mean campaigning all over the state. The school board wouldn't like me to be away that much. Are you kidding, Steiner? Look, the school board would be tickled to death if you ran for governor. You can't lose. Look, you either wind up as governor or you go back to coaching kids in some little jerkwater school and you're the town hero for life. Well, I don't consider Beverly Falls a jerkwater town, Senator. Oh, I don't for a minute mean that Beverly Falls isn't a fine, important community route, but it's just... Floyd! Can't you remember a name, Roscoe? It's almost dinner time, Mr. Steiner. And is it against your principles to have dinner with an unmarried person, a, a female? We could go Dutch. You eat here every night? Every night I'm in the Capitol. Why? Well, it's only two blocks from the legislature building and four blocks from the room I rented. And did you notice? What? No parking meters on the street. Yeah, we did overlook this street, didn't we? Look, Floyd... Politics is a big boy's game. Fair warning, okay? Well, you're in it. And you're certainly not very big. Or a boy. Well, you noticed. Well, you're trying to warn me that a nice guy can't get corrupted, right? Yes. I've learned enough watching the legislature in action. I know what I'd be getting into. You're sort of savoring the idea of being a candidate, aren't you? I, I can't say. I can't say until I get some advice. Oh, from who? My uncle. Uncle? Is he in politics? Oh, no, no. Uh, but I check lots of things with him. He, he's just about the smartest uncle a guy ever had. So when do you see him? Oh, I'll be in touch with him. Hey, say, listen. I'm going to be driving all night if I don't start back now. Don't ever go over 45, you know. Uh, thanks for your company, Miss Scattergood. And... Hey, make it, Amy. All right, Amy. And I'll let you know. Soon. <laughs> sort of hoping to talk to you. You got some big news today, didn't you? Boy, I'll say I did. They've asked me... Well, run for governor, eh? Very flattering, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. I'll have to admit it. Lloyd, I want you to listen to me. You must not run for any office. Being the coach is just right for you. Just right. Well, the only thing is, this state's in a heck of a mess. I mean, nobody really trusts the governor now, and they need a man they can really depend on. I think I might be able to do a good job. At least I'd be honest. Lloyd, it's not for you. You stay right where you are, in Beverly Falls. You really think so? I certainly do. Ah, oh, I... You sound disappointed. You really oughtn't to be. But I had this feeling that, well, maybe this is what I was cut out to be. Governor. You have no room for vanity or pride, Floyd. Believe me. You weren't cut out to be anything more than an athletic coach at a little school. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. That would be a mistake. Oh, it... Just let me do some thinking on my own. I'll talk to you later, Uncle. Good night. God, there's a lousy headache again. Why does he do that to me? Anytime I displease him, I get a headache. Oh, it must be my conscience. <laughs> Hello. Uh, good morning, Floyd. What's good about it? I couldn't sleep a wink with this headache. Sorry about that, my boy. I'm calling to see if you've changed your mind about that foolishness we were talking about last night. No, I haven't. Oh! <laughs> this headache started up again. If you'd listen to reason. No. The more I think about it, the more strongly I feel... There you go, Floyd. Feel, feel. You can't make judgments on what you feel. Use your intelligence, Floyd. What do you think you have in your head? Right now, well, I've got in my head is an awful pain. Goodbye, Uncle. Oh! It's Floyd, what's wrong? Why are you holding your head? Oh, it, it's nothing. It, it's just a headache. I seem to be getting them more and more these days. Now, it's just the pressure. Hey, why don't you have a highball? It, it would relax. Oh, no, thanks. 
Well, a glass of wine, then? No, no, I, I don't touch alcohol. Well, what do you do to take the pressure off? Nothing. Oh, I go for a walk now and then, but... With your lady friend, the teacher? Oh? How do you know about her? Floyd, Roscoe Drum has investigated you. He's really checked you out. He has? Well, you don't suppose we just nominate our governors because they're tall, dark, and handsome. You, you've checked up in my background? Oh, I'll say. Well, I guess you'd have to, like you say. <laughs> you're unreal. What do you mean? Well, I mean, I mean, you're clean. They couldn't find a trace of a bribe or a dishonest deal. Well, you haven't even got a parking ticket. That's right. And you don't drink? Or smoke. Oh, you're fantastic. Hey, Floyd. Do you know that woman? Who? The cashier in the cafeteria. She, she's motioning to you. Hmm? Oh, or... oh, I must have a phone call. Excuse me a minute, Amy. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, hello? Hello, Floyd. Oh, hi, Uncle. I've been concerned about you. Oh, don't be. How's your headache? Miserable. Uh, hell, you know, my boy... It's the sort of life you're leading. You know, I warned you when you first began meddling in consumer affairs, it's not for you. I had to do it, Uncle. Use car dealers advertising cars at a price you couldn't buy. Cheap tricks like that. None of your affair, Floyd. Now, I must insist that you withdraw from any consideration about entering politics. I mean it. I know you mean it. Oh, my head. It's the pressure you're under. Now, go on back to Beverly Falls. Uncle, I may be crazy, but I think this state needs me. My golly, I do. And I've gone this far. I'm not going to back down now. Goodbye, Uncle. Sorry, Amy. Not bad news, I hope. No, no, no. In fact, it helped me make a very important decision. Well, sit down. Sit down and tell me. Amy, I'll run. If you think the people want me, I'll run for governor. <laughs> I tell you, pal, my instincts never fail me. You know what this state is doing tonight in this election is voting in a real flesh and blood hero. A breath of fresh air. <laughs> you know, there's no telling what lies in store for Steiner after this U.S. senator. And from there, <laughs> you know what I'm thinking? Just a minute. Oh, a filling sleep. Oh, I never saw anything like it. You know, this may be the largest plurality any candidate's ever gotten in a gubernatorial election. Hey, where's our candidate anyway? Oh, he's gone into the next room to lie down for a few minutes. Got a headache. You know, all the excitement and everything. Amy, go on in and see if he wants to come on out for some pictures. You know, the wire service guys will be here in just a minute. Yeah, okay, I'll do that. Floyd? Hey, Floyd, are you feeling any better? Uh, all right, if I turn the light on? Floyd? Floyd! Hey, hey Roscoe, Billy. Hey, what, what's the matter in there? Anything wrong with Floyd? He isn't there. Well, he's got to be there. Well, you go see for yourself. There's nobody in that room. Miles away from the hot, smoky election headquarters, a taxi glides to a stop, and a figure emerges into the chilly night air. The taxi drives off, and the figure walks to a lonely telephone booth beside a large vacant field where a building has been torn down. People deserve something better than they've been getting. There you go, Floyd. Opinions again. 
judgments. You have somehow forgotten it's not for you to decide what the citizens of the state deserve. Do you think they deserve a governor with a fabricated past? A completely false history? No, I... I guess not. You had such a simple assignment to become a physical education instructor in a small town school. But you broke the cardinal rule. You elaborated, you improvised, you became emotionally involved. And all you were assigned to do was observe and report. Observe and report. But Beverly Falls, population 900, chief industry, logging. I was cut out for something more than that. Not enough of a challenge, eh? Well, now, after restructuring, you'll be given another assignment. Restructuring? Certainly. You are too valuable to be just scrapped. Well, I should hope so. I do wish this headache would go away. Oh, my error. There. Better? Oh, oh thank you, Uncle. Bye. Thank you. Stay right in that phone booth. I'll have you picked up. I will. You know, Uncle, I still think I'd have been a good governor. They thought I was the perfect man for the job. Mm, well, you were cut out to be perfect. Honest, vigorous, fair, law-abiding. But really, Floyd, you know that the Federation doesn't want to meddle in these sub-civilizations. We only study them. I'd hate to have to explain to my superiors why I permitted a Sigma-10 robot to become the governor of the state. All animation ceases in the figure in the lonely phone booth. The jawline sets, the lips relax. The finely tuned mechanism silently shuts down. All that is left of Governor-elect Floyd Steiner is the fading gleam of lifelike fluid in the plastic eyes, dwindling now to a barely perceptible spark. Which raises the question, does the Federation know that a Sigma-10 robot can dream? And if it dreams, can it dream of glory? The Perfect Man featured John Amendola as Floyd Steiner with Douglas Young as Roscoe Drum, Jack Spencer as C. Bancroft Billingsley, and Pat French as Amy Scattergood. Uncle was also played by Doug Young, script inspired by Fred Sanchez. Now this is Jim French inviting you to join me next time for another tale of suspense on Crisis. West Radio Network presents Crisis. All right. All right. I know what you're after. You want to try me in your newspapers. You want to convict me on the 11 o'clock news. Well, my attorney advises me to make no comment whatsoever. But I'm going to ignore that advice. So turn on your little tape recorders and cameras, ladies and gentlemen of the press. If you want something sensational, Harrison Archer won't disappoint you. If the name and voice of Harrison Archer seem vaguely familiar to you, let me clear up the doubt. Harrison Archer has appeared in almost 50 movies. Countless TV dramas, theatrical productions without number, but always as a supporting player. If you saw him, you'd know you'd seen him somewhere before, but you wouldn't know his name. 
Such is the frustration of the also-ran. Fame and stardom have eluded him. And yet tonight, here is this same Harrison Archer, surrounded by reporters, aglow in the dazzle of TV lights, the center of attention. What he did to attain this prominence is the matter before us tonight, in a weird tale of suspense for which I will prepare you with this single reminder. In things theatrical, nothing is what it seems. Our illusion begins in one minute. All right. As you all know, I've been appearing in Irving Coleman's production of Hope of the World. I hope some of you have seen it. It's a marvelous political satire, and we've gone beyond 600 performances with no end in sight. Anyway, the star of the play, of course, is Alexander Gray. His leading lady is the lovely Joanna Wells, and I play a, a supporting role. But I play it very well, superbly, to be candid about it. But it is a supporting role. You probably heard the old saying, There are no small parts, only small actors. <laughs> well, don't you believe it. There are small parts. But I've been content to wait for the right opportunity to come along. For 600 performances, I've understudied Alex Gray. And for 600 shows, he's never once been ill. And then the other day, he broke the news I'd been waiting to hear. I overheard him arguing with Coleman in his dressing I don't want to talk about it now, Irving. We've got to talk about it now. My contract says two years. The two years are up. But we're doing great business. And I'm bored stiff. This television offer is exciting. It's a challenge. TV could kill you, Alex. And so could another year saying the same lines in this theater. If you want more money... I do want more money, but that's not the point. The point is, Irving, I've given you your two years. And now you'll just have to find another lead. What a break. Alexander the Great was leaving, and who would be more of a natural to step into his part than yours truly, Harrison Archer? Which is why I got an appointment with Irving Coleman the very next day. Yes, Harrison, it's true. Alex is leaving the show. Well, Mr. Coleman, I want you to know that I'm, uh, I'm ready. Ready? I know the part backward and forward. Every single movement and gesture and expression. Wait, are you asking to play the lead? Well, who else could do it? My dear boy, I understand your ambition. But when I replace Alexander Gray, it will have to be with another name. Give me two weeks in the role and you'll have a new star on your marquee. Oh, I'm sorry, Harrison. Harrison Archer. People know Harrison Archer. You've had a lot of experience over the years, yes. But, Archer, you know as well as I do, you're not a star. The lead in Hope of the World has to be a name, a star. Now, really, I haven't the time to argue with you anymore. But... If you'd just give me the chance... I'm sorry, my boy. I like you right where you are. But have you thought of this angle? Imagine me co-starring with Joanna, my own wife in real life. Harrison, will you please... Think of Lunt and Fontaine. Oh, you have a colossal nerve to compare yourself with Alfred and Lynn. The only reason I've kept you in the company was to humor Alex. <laughs> to humor Alex... What the devil did he mean by that? He obviously hadn't intended to let that slip, and he almost threw me out of his office. To humor Alex. Alexander Gray hardly knew I was alive. What could it matter to Alexander the Great whether I was in the play or not? I went home earlier than I'd intended. Usually I make the rounds of the agencies on Mondays to scare up an occasional TV commercial, leaving Joanna to herself for a few hours. But after the bout with Coleman, I... Uh, well, I needed Joanna. I needed to talk to her. As I walked from the bus to the apartment, I noticed a dove gray Bentley drophead coupe parked in front of the apartment house. The elegant car bore the license tag AG. Even without it, of course, I knew it instantly. It belonged to Alexander Gray. At first I thought, why, he's come to see me and offer me his role in the play. But then I thought, no. No, there's some other reason he's here. And so I just waited, waited outside the building, standing near a fire escape stairway so I could watch the door to our apartment without being seen. After nearly an hour, the door finally opened, and out stepped Alexander Gray. 
He stopped, turned back toward Joanna, and they kissed. A long, lingering kiss. Alex Gray and my wife. And then, of course, it all began to make sense. Of course, Gray would want to keep me playing my miserable little role. Of course, he would want to keep Joanna. This way, he was safe. He and Joanna could keep on meeting, and their love nest would be secure. Perhaps Joanna had insisted on my keeping on in the play as a condition for their affair. It took every shred of self-control and every grain of talent as an actor to walk into my own apartment and not betray the hatred I was feeling. Who's there? Whom did you expect? Oh, it's you, darling. You're early. Yes. Any luck today? Luck? <laughs> yes, I had some luck. All of it bad. Oh. Joanna, I'd be to see Mr. Coleman. What about? I told him I wanted to play Alex Gray's part when he leaves the show. When he leaves? But don't tell me you haven't heard. Heard what? Alex's two-year contract with Coleman is up and he's going to do television. Television? He's leaving? Don't look so distressed, Joanna. Coleman doesn't plan on any other changes. We'll be working still. But when will Alex be leaving, do you know? No. Well, I wonder who'll get the part. Tell me honestly, Joanna. Don't you think I could play the role of your lover as well as Alex does? What? In the play, my dear. Oh, well, I guess. Yes, of course. You'll be perfect. Well, we could make those love scenes even more realistic, couldn't we? <laughs> yes. Yes, that's right. We could. Well, Coleman won't consider me for the part. Not at all. No. In fact, he said a curious thing. He said the only reason he kept me in the cast was to humor Alex. What do you suppose he meant by that? Ah, that struck home. Joanna's eyes flickered and she looked away. Suddenly, I felt... Trapped in a web of deceit, I had to get out, get some air, think. It was obvious now that Alex Gray was leaving. Unless, somehow, I could manage to step into his part, at least for one performance, and prove my genius at duplicating the role, my contract wouldn't be renewed. What could I do, betrayed on every hand? I was walking farther and farther from the parts of the city I was familiar with, and suddenly I found myself standing in front of a strange little shop. The window hadn't been cleaned in years. Through the smudges I saw costumes, suits of armor, shelves filled with... Well, they had to be masks, but at first glance, through the dirty window, they looked like human heads, lined up side by side. There was no name, no sign on the window or door. But for some reason, I felt compelled to go in. So I did. Inside, the odor of dust and mildew was mixed with faint traces of chemicals I couldn't recognize. Not a breath of air stirred. Hello! Anybody here? Pardon, pardon me, I was in back. What can I do for you? The man who appeared out of the shadows was a repelling creature with a misshapen head, too long and tapering. His sloping shoulders were covered with a coarse black cassock, and he couldn't be more than five feet tall. But his face, the color of a wax candle with red-rimmed eyes, a long, thin nose, and lips that were puffy and red. He was so grotesque, I had to avert my eyes. Is there something you need? What? Uh, oh, well, I was just walking past, and I... I thought I'd stop in. I, I saw the uh, masks on the shelves there. Yes. You make them yourself? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, for what purpose? For what purpose? Uh, well, yes, Halloween, uh, costume parties. I make my masks for anyone who requires an illusion. Well, they're remarkable. Remarkable. Here, let me, let me show you one close up so you may examine it. Here. There. It, it even feels like skin. How do you do it? A secret process. Here, would you like to try it on? Well, I don't know. Who's it supposed to be? This mask is just a man I used to know. Here, slip it on. I'll show you something. Well, all right. Over the chin first, like this? Yes, fine. 
This won't be a perfect fit, of course, but you'll get the idea. Here, now look in the mirror. Good heavens. <laughs> now smile. Go ahead. The, the mask smiles with me. Exactly. And it frowns. Yes. It registers every expression, just as if it were my own face. The illusion. It's fantastic. Fantastic. May I make one for you? For me? Yeah. Well, I don't have any use for a mask. Or have I? Hmm. I'll have to think about that. Give me one of your cards. I don't have cards. The name is Lazarus. Well, then, I'll write down your name and address. You can remember me. You can find my shop again if you need me. People always do. And that was when the whole plot suddenly took shape in my imagination. Lazarus had provided me with a perfect modus operandi, as they say. With his help and my own skill as an actor, I was about to kill two birds with one stone. Consider me for the lead in the play, and then when I found out Alex Gray was seeing my wife, my whole world collapsed around me. All I could think of was self-pity. But then, another emotion swept everything else away. Revenge. Somehow, I would have revenge on these trusted people who had hurt me so much. I made certain arrangements, the first of which was my reason for another visit to Lazarus the Mask Maker. Come to the point, please. I'm very busy. I, uh, I have to know if I can trust you to be discreet. In my line of work, it's discretion or I'm finished. Yeah, very well. I'll, I'll have to trust you. Lazarus, take a look at these photos. Mm -hmm. They're all of the same man. Mm -hmm. Can you make a mask that exactly duplicates his face? Of course. Good. I need it by no later than next Monday. Very well. Um, how much will it be? Two hundred dollars. Two hundred. Yes, well... All right. I'll be back Monday. Not so fast, please. I have to know who's going to wear this mask. Why do you have to know that? I have to measure the features of the face so the mask will fit perfectly. Oh, I see. Can you produce the person who will wear the mask? I'm the person. Very well. Have a seat and I shall proceed with the measuring. Lazarus painstakingly measured the distance between my eyes, the length, width, and depth of my nose, ears, cheekbones, and forehead. When he was finished, he walked me to the door of his shop. I'm sure my mask will suit your purpose admirably. And uh, you'll forget about ever making the mask? My amnesia is included in the price tag. Now it was time for me to set up the rest of my little plot. I paid a visit to the property room at the theater, then to Alexander Gray's dressing room. After that, home to my dear and faithful wife. Uh, Joanna, since we don't have any performances on Monday, what do you say we go for a trip somewhere? Maybe upstate? Just the two of us? Oh? Well, that sounds fun, only... Yes? Well, you see, I promised a girlfriend I'd go and help her pick out some furniture... She's furnishing a new apartment. Oh, anyone I know? I don't think so, dear. Well, that's a disappointment. But maybe uh, I'll just use the time to check out a few more agencies. Yes, dear, why don't you do that? The lying cat. I could see right through her alibi. But it made me all the more determined to go through with my plan. Of course, I knew where she'd be Monday. With Alexander the Great. And for once... That's exactly where I wanted her to be. At last, Monday arrived, and I gave Joanna plenty of time. Time to call Alex Gray and tell him I was gone for the day so he could come over. And then I put the rest of my scenario into action. Coleman's luxurious suite was across town. I went into a clothing store, pretending to be shopping for a suit, and slipped into a dressing room where I changed out of my own clothes and slipped into a hideous pair of Alexander Gray's lemon-colored slacks, a black turtleneck sweater and a leather jacket, even a pair of Gucci loafers, all purloined from his dressing room at the theater. And then I put on the mask Lazarus had made for me. 
It was incredible to look at myself in the mirror and see the face of Alex Gray looking back. And now Alexander Gray emerged from the store. <laughs> the illusion was perfect. The slight swagger, the purposeful stride, the left hand in the trouser pocket, exactly as Gray had done it a thousand times. And then the imperious flagging down of a taxi cab. The driver's double take assured me the impersonation was going to be a snap. Hey, you're Alexander Gray. Why, that's right. It's a real honor, Mr. Gray. I've seen you a lot on TV, but I ain't seen you in the play that you're in now. Well, you better hurry. I'm leaving the play shortly. Yeah? Going to make a movie. No kidding. Hey, you wouldn't happen to have any pasteboards on you, would you? Tickets to your play? Three tickets? Sorry. I sat back in the cab and gloated. Lazarus's workmanship and my acting skill would be triumphant, no doubt about it. But now, now, the real test. I took the elevator to the 34th floor. As the door slid open, I checked for the final time. Yes, the little nickel-plated derringer from Alexander Gray's makeup kit was snug in the pocket of my slacks. If I managed everything as well as I had up to this moment, there would certainly be no doubt about how Irving Coleman was killed and by whom he was killed. I rang the doorbell. After a long wait, Coleman's servant, Tracy, opened the door. Oh, good morning, Mr. Gray. Good morning, Tracy. I have to see Mr. Coleman. Yes, sir. I, would you make yourself comfortable in the study and I'll tell Mr. Coleman you're here. I'm sure he'll be with you directly. So, I'd fooled Tracy, too. This was going to be easy. But just ahead now was my greatest performance. At last, in came Irving Coleman. Alex, my boy. How are you? How am I? How can you ask me that after what you've done? What? I've come here to settle things with you, Irving. But everything's settled. You double-crossing liar. What are you talking about? And keep your voice down, for heaven's sake. Now get this and get it straight, Coleman. I'm leaving the play, and nothing you can do is going to change that. Alex, I... You're going to get it now, Coleman. You've had this coming for a long time. Alex. Alex, sir. I ran out of Coleman's apartment and down two flights of stairs, then took an elevator to the lobby. I kept running out to the sidewalk. People were staring now. Witnesses, just as I hoped. Witnesses who would later testify that they had seen Alexander Gray running from the apartment building moments after Tracy had heard the threats and the gunshot. An airtight case against Alexander Gray. Again, I hailed a cab which took me to the theater. There, I exchanged Gray's clothes for my own, wiped the Derringer clean of my prints, and buried it in one of Gray's trunks. I was just turning to go when... Harrison, Harrison, aren't you in the wrong dressing room, old man? Gray, why... What are you doing here? Well, shouldn't I be asking that of you? Oh, I thought you'd be... I thought you'd be with my wife, as you usually are on Mondays. What's this nonsense? I know about you and Joanna. Oh, uh, what do you know? I know it's been going on behind my back. You do? Well, it was all going to come out tonight anyway. Irving is going to have a little celebration for you and Joanna. Irving? You mean Coleman? Yes, after I convinced him that you're the natural replacement for me in the play, he wanted me? to... Me? You convinced Coleman. Well, it was Joanna's idea, actually. She had me over to your place last Monday while you were out. And I tell you, Archer, Joanna is absolutely your greatest fan. She hoped you wouldn't find out I was leaving the cast until I could convince Coleman to put you in the leading role. Wanted the whole thing to be a great surprise for you. <laughs> when I agreed to it, she was so grateful, she threw arms around me and kissed me as I was leaving. Darn fine girl, that wife of yours. And now you'll be co-starring with her. Could be the start of big things for both of you, old boy. What had I done? Coleman was dead. Dead before he could give me the lead in the play. And in minutes, the police would arrest Alexander Gray for his murder. Only, it didn't work out that way. When the police arrived, they took me. They took me to Lazarus' mask shop. Yes. Yes, he's the one who bought the Alexander Gray mask. You can't prove that. I think I can. You see, Mr. Archer, I know exactly where you've been today. Inspector, permit me. Go ahead, Mr. Lazarus. You changed clothes in the Seville men's shop on East 42nd, and then you took a taxi. 
Hey, you wouldn't happen to have any pasteboards on you, would you? It was a mask. It was you. And then you went to Coleman's apartment, where you had to wait for some time for Tracy to answer the door. And when he did... Won't you make yourself comfortable in the study? Uh, and I'll tell Mr. Coleman you're here. No, no. You couldn't have been him, too. And then when you began your finest performance, Mr. Archer, I gave my finest performance as Irving Coleman. Alex, my boy, how are you? Uh, but you're supposed to be dead. I mean, Coleman is supposed to be dead. Yeah. I shot him. Yes, you did. With Alex Gray's blank cartridge pistol. Mr. Coleman is still very much alive. And that's my statement. You have it all, do you? Where? Where? Where do they go? Where are the reporters? Let's try to keep it quiet, Mr. Archer. Where are the reporters? All gone, Mr. Archer. All gone. Now let's quiet down. The other patients are trying to sleep. I warn you at the beginning, I call this whole thing an illusion. Now it's for you to decide how much of the illusion was real and how much was playing inside Harrison Archer's head. I'll be back in a minute with the names of tonight's players and a scene from next week's program. Masks. Featured Howard Hall as Harrison Archer, Joan Norton as Joanna Archer, John B. Hughes as Irving Coleman, and Robert O. Smith as Lazarus and everybody else. Our engineer was Carney Barton, script and production by yours truly, Jim French and Pat French. The program was recorded at Audio Recording Incorporated. Be with us next week for another crisis. <laughs> West Radio Network presents Crisis. My dear Edna, I am writing this in my room at the Cortland Hotel to assure you that I'm still alive, still in possession of my senses and still completely fascinated with my experiences here in New York City. New York City. How the very name of it thrills me. Your telephone message was waiting for me when I came in just now. Sister dear, you really mustn't waste your money on long-distance phone calls. I know you are troubled that I've asked you to mail me the money from my savings account, but I want to put your fears to rest. I am perfectly safe. I know exactly what I'm doing and in no danger whatsoever. I shall explain my need for this money in another letter very soon. In the meantime, please humor your older sister and dispatch the $12,000 immediately, care of this hotel. I am feeling well, the weather is ideal, and I shall be back with you in Colorado within two weeks, I promise you. Try not to worry and give my regards to Mr. Barton at the bank. All my love, Grace. It never makes the headlines on page one, but it is a tragic fact that New York City claims thousands of crime victims every year. Victims not of violence, but of greed. Grace Phillips, like so many other hopefuls, has come to New York from a small community far away, come to see the sights to do the town. Her plan was to spend three weeks of her summer vacation doing the museums and galleries to enrich her elementary school students back in her tiny Colorado town. She'd been a teacher for nearly 30 years, but the closest she'd ever been to the art and historical treasures of New York were the textbooks that told about them. But now, in her 50th year, Grace was fulfilling an ambition she'd carefully nourished throughout her career. Every day that first week in New York, she spent at the Guggenheim or the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the American Museum of Natural History. But that left the evenings. And that's where Grace was to have her encounter. 
I'll be back in a minute as Crisis tonight offers a suspenseful tale of artful deception titled The Pigeon. My dear sister Edna, it all began on my first Friday in New York. I spent the day completely absorbed in the Metropolitan's pre-Columbian section, taking notes and gathering literature. And when they closed, I had to find some place to eat dinner. Cab driver mentioned a small cafe not far from my hotel, a lovely little place called Henry's. The colors were all dark reds and blues, and the carpets must have been three inches thick. But it was snug and, well, sort of intimate. I didn't have to ask about the prices. Everything in New York City is ridiculous, but, well, it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I gave the major d a five-dollar bill to find me a quiet little corner all by myself where I could sit and watch the other guests. After about ten minutes, he beckoned to me and showed me a table in a dark corner. Will this be satisfactory, madame? Oh, yes, fine. You're dining alone? Yes, I'm alone. Oh, very good, madame. Bon appetit. Well, I wish you could have seen the menu. Veal cordon bleu, oysters Rockefeller, rack of lamb. And all I really wanted was just a few vegetables, maybe a salad. And then suddenly, the maitre d' was back again, standing beside my chair. Excuse me, madame. Yes? I'm terribly sorry. Well, what is it? I'm afraid there's, there's been a, a mistake. My mistake. I'm not the regular man. The regular maitre d' is sick, and I'm taking his place. Well, I'm sorry he's sick, but what seems to be the trouble? I... I can't let you have this table. What? I didn't realize it, but the table is reserved for another party. Oh, well, if that's all that's bothering you, find me another one. I don't care. I'm so sorry. Here, here, here. Just a minute. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Atwood. It was my mistake. But the lady will be moved to another the table. The lady I... will stay right where she's sitting. Well, I don't mind at all, really. Well, I do. This isn't my table. I just usually eat here. I don't have an option on it. I told her, Mr. Atwood. Really, really, it's all right. Just find me something else. I won't hear of it. But you see, Mr. Atwood, we don't have another single anywhere tonight. <laughs> well, Hugo, you've really put us both in the spot, haven't you? I'm terribly sorry. Oh, for heaven's sake. Look, I'll just leave. That'll settle the whole thing. My dear lady, were you alone? What? Here at the table. Were you going to eat alone? Well, yes. Yes, I was. And so was I. <laughs> Not by choice, but... Uh, well, by habit. Would it be too presumptuous of me to suggest that we share this little table? Well, I... Well, I suppose that would be one way to solve it. Wonderful. Hugo, get a chair and another place setting. Oh, yes, sir. Right away. And I'm terribly, terribly sorry, sir. Well, they brought another chair and he sat down facing me. His name was Kent Atwood. He was tall, over six feet. He had a shock of white hair and a tanned, rugged face. His build was, well, I suppose you'd say, he was the tennis type. Gradually, the maitre d' assembled a place setting for him and brought a new candle centerpiece for the table. Poor maitre d' was still apologizing when Mr. Atwood quietly slipped in some money. It must have been a big bill. Hugo nearly melted when he saw it. Finally, we gave our orders, and Mr. Atwood sat back in his chair. He smiled at me. A kind sort of smile. So, you're from Colorado. Oh, marvelous country. Yes, it is. And it's Miss Phillips? That's right. Well, what brings you to New York? The museums. I teach sixth grade. Oh. Uh -huh. I receive credit for seeing the exhibits. But I've made the trip credit or no. You're having a good time of it, then? Marvelous. Oh, where have you been? The Metropolitan Museum. Oh, yes, yes. And? Well, that's all I've done. I, but this is only my first week. Oh, I see. And how long do you plan to stay, then? I have three weeks. Well, no doubt you'll be seeing the uh, Guggenheim and the Museum of Natural History. Oh, and there's, uh, there's one a lot of people miss. The Cloisters. Have you ever heard of it? No. Mm. Medieval art. Fabulous place. It's at Fort Tryon Park. Do you know where that is? No. Well, I'll get you some directions. Mr. Atwood, you're probably much too busy to bother with an itinerant school marm from the back country. Well, by heaven... I hope I never get that busy. You, um, you apparently eat here regularly. Oh, it becomes a habit. 
Well, actually, it's a very good restaurant. And I take it you're a very good customer. <laughs> well, they try to make me feel at home. Sometimes they go a little too far, this, this table business tonight. Well, I, I do feel like an intruder. My dear Miss Phillips, you are not intruding. In fact, this is the nicest surprise I've had all day. We ordered wine, toasted my health. And by the time our dinners arrived, I found out that he was 60 years old, a widower, and a Wall Street investment counselor. Well, how do you rate Henry's food? Compared to the Addison Lodge? Where's that? In Denver? Addison. That's the town I come from. Oh. And I'll have you know the Addison Lodge is the best place to eat in the whole town. But they'd have to go some to equal this. Oh, that's good. Well, now, what do you have on for tonight? For tonight? Oh, the museums are closed. Oh, I, uh... Well, I thought I'd go back to my room and watch television. Maybe read a little. Oh, and I, I took pages of notes on the exhibits. I have to get them in order. Uh, pardon me, but uh, it sounds a little dreary. Does it? Yes, I guess it does. It's that. If I'd known I was going to have the pleasure, I'd have gotten some tickets. There must be one play that doesn't shout four-letter words at you all night long. Well, you're a playgoer. Well, no, not anymore. Not since Jan passed away. Oh, I take a client every now and then. Not often. I should think being right here in the heart of it all that Miss you... Miss Phillips... I'm 60 years old. I hail from a culture, a, a time, a sense of behavior that these young tigers know nothing about. Look, you're a lot more familiar with today's literature than I am. I'm completely alienated from the popular culture of today. I don't want to read it or see it. I, I don't go for their shock value, their... Well, their... Telling it like it is. Yes. Why must the, the author and playwrights and, and movie people have to dwell on the rotten parts of human nature? Isn't there enough of that in real life? Well, I'll, I'll climb down off my soapbox. Oh, I agree with everything you say. You know what we are, Miss Phillips? We're a couple of anachronisms. Have you ever ridden a handsome cab through Central Park on a warm summer evening? <laughs> Good gracious, come on, no. Come on. Oh, well, I... Look, I, I... look, look, we anachronisms have to stick together. <laughs> my heavens, Kent, you certainly have let me ramble on. I've, I've practically showed you my old snapshot oh, album. Oh, I've loved hearing it, Grace, about your sister Edna, your childhood, your teaching. Beautiful. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Must I? Not if you don't want to. Well, it's not quite as happy a life as yours. Well, born in Missouri, father a farmer. Mother died when I was eight. Managed to get through the university. Dabbled in real estate. Got lucky. Got busy. Got married. Yes, yes, that too. Luckier there than I. Yes, yes, I was lucky. Jan was everything to me. Well, we don't have to talk about it. Tell me about your... No, head. no, I, I want to tell you about it strange. You're the first person I've really wanted to talk to since 1969. That's when Jan passed away. Oh, well, what do you know? Right back where we started from. Yes. It's been a beautiful evening, Grace. For me, too. Well, I'll get us a cab and, and take you to your hotel. Oh, you really don't have to bother. I know I don't have to. I want to. That's how our first evening ended. He drove me to the hotel, saw me to my door, offered his hand, looked at me for a moment with those blue, blue eyes, and then he turned and was gone. I must admit, I sat alone in my room for almost half an hour, thinking about him, wondering whether I'd ever see him again. And then, finally, I decided Kent Atwood was nothing but a pleasant accident, nothing more. I undressed and went to bed. But it was long past 2 a.m. before I slept. The next day, I had intended going back to the Metropolitan Museum. But I couldn't focus my mind on ancient art. I stood in front of my hotel trying to decide what to do. And suddenly it was all very simple. I would go to the cloisters. And where was it? 
Fort Tryon Park. Kent had forgotten to tell me how to get there, but I found it was only a short taxi ride. Walking to the main entrance, the sun was in my eyes, and I didn't see him until he stepped quickly out of the shady entranceway. My heart literally skipped a beat. It was Kent. Grace. Kent. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. But how did you know I'd be coming here? Well, I called your hotel room. There was no answer. I, I just had a hunch. Well... Grace, don't go to museums today. What? Come with me. Where? I don't know where. Anywhere. I have my car. Let's drive. Let's just drive. Kent Atwood led me to an expensive black car at the edge of the park. And we drove in silence for several minutes. He looked upset. He clenched his hands on the wheel again and again. I tried to make small talk, but he only nodded or shook his head and forced a smile at times. Finally, we were out of Manhattan, and he pulled up and parked in a quiet residential street. Where are we, Kent? Westchester County. Oh? Mm, the Hudson River is about a quarter mile over that way. You had some special reason for bringing me here. Yes, I guess I had. This is where I live. Which? Was that a Nets house there? Yes. My. But I'm not going to do it now. I was going to drive right up the drive and take you inside. But I'm not going to do that. I don't believe I understand, Kent. I know. I, uh, I hardly understand myself. Grace, I discovered last night that uh, I'm a lonely man. A terribly lonely man. My wife's death sort of closed all the windows in my life. I... I just went through the motions of living. Did you have children? No, no. That's it, you see. I I was an only child. I'm absolutely alone in the world. I had no one to share with, no one to spend anything on, and... And... Yes? Well, no one to leave it to. And that is a problem I'm going to have to solve very soon. Oh, can't you... As trim and tanned as you are? Grace, I'm dying. Your what? Cancer. It's all through me. Totally inoperable. Oh, Kent. You've, uh, you've heard the commercials that say, uh, don't ignore the warning signs. Well, I ignored them. I knew what I was doing. The only reason I went to a doctor was for some painkillers. and He confirmed what I already knew. But why, Kent? When I first began to suspect what I had, I, I thought, ah, soon all my troubles will be over. Soon I'll be with Jan again. But it still leaves the problem of my estate. You see, Grace, I have no heirs, none at all. And I'm worth something in excess of 15 million, closer to 16, I suppose. I've, I've never known anyone who had that much money. Last night. Last night I realized that I had bumped into someone who deserved to inherit a fortune. Someone with breeding, with mature judgment, with a humble, kind, well, decency about her. With old-fashioned values. Oh, I could endow schools and museums and set up a trust fund and all that, and, and maybe I will. But I want most of what's left after the taxes are paid to, to go to someone who's making a, a quiet decent, legitimate contribution to the world. You are that person. You don't even know me. That's true. I don't know you. But I haven't much more time, Grace. Grace, I want you to marry me. Marry you? Yes, tonight. Today, a as soon as you can. Well, I, I, then I, I it'll just... be all yours, Grace. And it won't be poured into the sewer or thrown around by some bunch of irresponsible young... Kent, listen to me. Hmm? People don't get married to save a fortune. They marry for... for love. I'm flattered that you pitied my spinsterhood. And I'm sorry for your loneliness. But to rush into marriage with... All right, all right. How much time do you need? A week? Take a week. I'll still be up and around. Take two weeks. Only say you'll do it, Grace. Then, everything that's mine will be yours. At 
as improbable as it may seem, Kent and I continued talking about his plan, his proposal, if you can call it that, as we drove all over Westchester County. He inaugurated his holdings, described his personal philosophies, and for my part, I suppose I opened up secret parts of my very conventional life that nobody, perhaps even you, Edna, ever knew. When it grew dark, he drove me back to my hotel. And I knew he expected some kind of answer. Well, Grace? Kim, give me one week. One week? All right. I promise you I'll give you my answer by this time next week. Despite my feelings for Kent, I spent the next few days checking up on him. And what I learned satisfied me completely. I was convinced the proposition was safe. And for my part, I was prepared to go to him with my agreement. You're making me a very happy man, Grace. But you really know so little about me. If we join our resources, how do you know I... Perfectly simple, my dear. You merely transfer your savings into my account at Chase Manhattan Bank. Oh? Well, they're a fairly reputable institution. Oh, and of course, you're entitled to see my bank book. Of course, I have accounts in several different banks. In fact, to tell you what, when you have your savings here in New York to prove to me what you have, I'll match it with cash from my account. How's that? Well, it's really not necessary. Oh, but it is. For all you know, I'm nothing but a, a con man. Well, all right, Kent. But all I have to my name is $12,000. Twelve? All right. I'll bring an equal amount with me as soon as your money arrives. Well, that, of course, was why I asked you to send me my money. And I'm sure you've been wondering what happened after I received it. When Kent telephoned the night the money arrived, he suggested dining out at Henry's, where we met. But I had a slight headache, so I asked him if he would just come here, up to my room in the hotel. At about 8 o'clock, he arrived. I'm beginning to feel sheepish about this formality, Grace. Well, you shouldn't. It's for our mutual satisfaction. Hmm, well, yes, you're right, of course. You received the money? Right here in this envelope. Oh, that's pretty risky, carrying cash around. Nobody knows I have it. Well, here's 12000 from my account. Shall I count it? It's in hundreds. Oh, good heavens, Kent. Don't make me feel any worse than I already do. I I'll, I'll take your word for it, dear. You sure? Of course. Unless you want to count mine. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. Well, here it is, anyway. Fine, fine, fine. I've seen enough. Now, what would you want to do? Oh, I'll just take your money, put it with mine, and put it in the night deposit slot at the bank. It's right on my way. <sighs> hmm, that's funny. Hello? Well, yes, he's right here. It's for you. For me? Uh, hello? Yes? Yes, this is Kent. Uh, Kent, I'm going to freshen up. I'll be right back. Oh, yes, fine. Fine, Grace. Now, who is this, anyway? The call was from the New York Police Bunko Squad. I told him all about Kent Atwood, how I'd spent several days checking up on him, and I found out the car he drove was rented under another name, the house he said was his belonged to someone else. They even tied him in with Hugo, the head waiter at Henry's. So when Kent took the call, I stepped out of the room with all my money, and his. The uh, Chase Manhattan Bank tells me they don't have any accounts under the uh, name of Kent Atwood. I asked them. Told them I wanted to make a deposit in his account. But since there is no such account, well, I have no choice but to put it in my own. So please deposit the enclosed cashier's check for $24,000 to my account at the bank. Will you, Edna? And say hello to Mr. Barton. And tell him I'm having such a wonderful time in New York. Your loving sister, Grace. Yes, when in New York City, beware the unscrupulous con artist. The most trustworthy types sometimes turn out to be something else. <laughs> yes, something else indeed. I'll be back with a preview of our next crisis radio drama in one minute. 
Tonight, Crisis presented Pat French, Paul Herlinger, and John Anandola in The Pigeon. With sound by Jeff Thompson and engineering by Carney Barton. Crisis is produced at Audio Recording Incorporated and is written and directed by Jim French, who now invites you back for next week's program and wishes you good evening. Sooner or later, when you least expect it, there comes a point of no return, a dead end from which there seems no escape. A moment in time. A moment of crisis. We're on Lover's Lane. Big city style. Romantic illumination by neon serenaded by buses and honky-tonks, perfumed by refuse cans stacked at the curb. Not a very pretty picture. But to Ross and Barbara, it doesn't matter, nor does the cold wind sweeping in from the ocean blowing the city's grit into their eyes. For this is their Camelot, their Garden of Eden. In their eyes is hope, belief that somewhere within their grasp is the raw material of tomorrow. But the trick is, don't put your faith in the wrong hands. In just a moment, on Crisis, a tale of the bizarre called Ask Me Any Question. Now, meet Ross the parking lot jockey, and Barbara, the movie cashier, and ask me any question. Are you sure you're warm enough? Yes, I'm fine, really. Oh, geez, it drives me crazy. What? Eight hours a day I'm parking other people's cars, El, El Dorado's, T-Birds, and I don't even have the dough to buy a junker. Oh, yeah, but someday. Yes, yeah, someday. When someday? I don't know. I wish they didn't have to be at work at midnight. Yeah, so do I. At least they keep warm. They got a little electric heater in the box office. Yeah, that's more than they got at the lot. Summer, winter, all the same to Kirkwood. Hey, you want to go in there? What? The fun zone arcade? What's you doing there? Oh, they got shooting gallery, games, you know, little moving machines and stuff. Well, I, I guess you wouldn't be too interested in them. What does it cost? Never mind. This I can afford. Hey, give me some change. Yeah, sure. There you go. Ah, thanks. Okay, what do we do first? You come in here a lot? Not a lot. I've been in here for a long time now. Since, yeah, since I met you. I'm a good influence, see? Hey, hey, look. Hey, they got a new gimmick. What's it supposed to be? That's one of them fortune tellers. That's not a real person in the glass case, is it? Nah, it's a dummy made up to look like a gypsy. But I've never seen this kind before. What does it say? Ask me any question, hear the gypsy answer. Hey, that's me. Well, how does it work? Well, let's see. I uh, insert 25 cents for three answers. Speak into microphone, press button for answer. Hmm. Looks like a telephone booth. Hey, what are you going to ask? I don't know. I don't know. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Here it goes. Greetings, my friends. Learn your fortune. Ask me any question. Hey, this cat. We're going to move around in there. What do you have to ask you? What do you have to do? Uh, speak into the microphone. Press button for answer. Okay, here it goes. <clears throat> uh, this here's my girl. What's her name? <laughs> All right, push your button. Yeah. You know the answer yourself. You big deal. Ah, jeez, what a ripoff. Well, I've got two more questions to go. Uh, let's see. Uh, hey, hey, I know. Am I ever going to get a raise? The answer to your question is yes. Hey, hey, way to go, Gypsy old kid. Ross, ask it if, ask it if we're going to ever get married. Are you kidding? You want me to ask that? Yeah. Oh, well, okay, why not? Uh, hey, 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 Gypsy. 
Uh, about Barbara and me. Uh, we ever going to get married? You will have the desire of your heart. Well, what do you know about that? I'll bet those are the only three answers it knows. It's a recording. Yeah, yeah, but did you hear what she said about my race? She said yes. It didn't know my name. Yeah, but hey, remember what she said? You know the answer yourself. Now, how would a machine know that I knew the answer myself? That's weird. Put another quarter in and test it. Yeah, okay. Greetings, my friend. Learn your fortune. Ask me any questions. Oh, no. I'm just going to give you a little test, Gypsy. I'm just going to push your button and hear you answer something I didn't even ask. There. Hey, hey, come on. And push it again. Nothing. Oh, it probably won't play the recording till you speak into the mic. Okay, I got one more chance. Let's see. Hey, hey, I got a beauty. Hey, Gypsy, are you, uh, can you really tell fortune? Why don't you find out for yourself? Why don't you find out for yourself? What kind of answer is that? I'm getting cold, honey. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I gotta figure this out. Greetings, my friend. Learn your fortune. Ask me any question. All right. Here's a question. I can't. Can, can you tell me how to get more dough so Barbara and me can get married? Use great care, and the results will be favorable. <laughs> Come on, Ross. Okay, 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 I'll buy that. I've got to be very careful the way I ask Kirkwood for a raise. Now I've got another one. Yeah, you're going to dig on this one, Barbara. Uh, are Barbara and me going to have lots of kids? <laughs> you must let time take care of all things. <laughs> hey, oh, hey, she's got a sense of humor. Hey, give me your coat, honey. I'm really cold. Oh, okay. I can't wait to open. I'm going to be at work for you soon. Oh, okay, okay, okay. i got one more question coming. Yeah, but come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Let's see. Uh, I've got to make this one count. Uh, when, when am I going to die? Yeah, well, come on. Don't ask that. I, I wouldn't want to know. Come on, Gypsy. Answer. Push a button. I'm pushing, I'm pushing. What do you think I'm doing? It don't do no good. Maybe you didn't hear me. When am I going to die? Hey, it turned itself off. Oh, come on, Ross. Walk me back to the theater, huh? Ah, this lousy gypsy cheated me. That gypsy is a gem. Hey, Ross, forget it. Honey, come on. Here comes the guy. Hey, hey, you. What do you think you're doing? It's no good. Gypsy owes me an answer. I only got two answers for my quarter. Well, look, pounding on it ain't going to help none. Look, I'll give you a dime. Here. I don't want the dime. I want my answer. Come on, come on. Well, you bug off, fella. Here's your dime. Now get lost. I don't want your lousy dime. I want my answer. Hey, what's the matter? He nuts or something. I can't get your answer. The thing's probably busted. When, when are you going to get it fixed? Oh, I don't know. Why? Well, he asked it a stupid question, that's all. Come on, Ross. Yeah, well, it must have been some question. You know, I'll bet you blew its fuse. The city, 8 a.m., nine blocks away from the Fun Zone Arcade. Through the teeming wet sidewalks of early morning weaves Ross to the window of the box office where Barbara sells tickets to the all-night movie. Hey, honey. Hi. Ross, what are you doing here? i still got a half hour before I'm off. I know. Hey, I had to come over and tell you. Remember last night that the gypsy fortune teller? Well, it happened. It really happened. What? I got the raise, just like she said. That's wonderful. Wonderful? <laughs> it's weird. Change, please. Okay. There you go. Hey, you were the kid that tried to jimmy up the gypsy fortune telling machine last night. I didn't try to jimmy it up. It didn't answer my third question. Hey, is it working this morning? Yeah, yeah, it's working. But you listen to me. If you have any more trouble with this thing, you come to see me, you understand? You don't beat on the machine. You come ask for Seely. That's me, Seely. Okay, Mr. Seely. Okay, now, so, so take your quarters and enjoy. <sighs> ah. Okay. Greetings, my friend. 
Learn your fortune. Ask me any question. Gypsy, you, you were right about the ring. I got the ring. Just like that. Now, now, I got three more questions. Number one, can, can you tell me how to get a lot of money fast? You can have anything you wish if you use your ability. And anything I wish? If I use my ability? What ability? Uh, a uh, uh, gypsy. Uh, you mean I, I got to use my hand? I, I got to be smart? Is that it? The answer to your question is no. No? That don't make sense. I, anything I wish. If I use my abilities. But I don't have to use my head. Well, that only leaves one thing. A, a gypsy. You mean I ought I, I just take what I want? You mean I, I could get away with heisting Kirkwood's gold? Is that it? Use great care, and the results will be favorable. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that's what you meant. Hey, I, I've got to ask you something else. Greetings, my friend. Learn your yeah, yeah, greetings. It, it, hey, it's question. still me again. Now, now listen. I could get my hands on a couple hundred bucks if I slip in the park and money into my pocket instead of putting it, putting it into Kirkwood's little office safe on the lot. Today. But Kirkwood comes around at different times of day to check his wants. I've got to keep him away long enough to get some dough. Some real dough. How do I do it? You know the answer yourself. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Sure. Hey, I really want to thank you, Gypsy. And, uh, well, and I'm sorry about last night. Only, only I asked you a question, and you never gave me an answer. I'll try it again. Just for kick. No big thing. Just for kick now, okay? When will I die? Uh, when will I die? Nothing! Hey, Mr. Seeley. Yeah? Same thing as last night. You mean you pound on the case? No, all right, all right. Now listen to me. I'm going to give you back 15 cents, and then I don't want to see you around here no more. <laughs> Girlie, you were looking for someone? Yes. Would you remember last night about the same time I was in Remember? Here. You better believe it. You're looking for your boyfriend? Well, I run him out of here around 10 o'clock this morning. You ran him out of here? Yeah. He busted the gypsy fortune teller again. What is it with that kid anyway? I give him his money back and I told him not to come back. You see him, you tell him I mean it, okay? 10 o'clock. Are you sure? I mean, he should have been at work by 10. Well, he was right here feeding quarters into the gypsy. Oh, no. You know, let me tell you something. A good-looking chick like you could do a lot better than that little nothing. Oh, he's just confused. It's your gypsy fortune telling machine. He's... <laughs> yes, I know, baby, I know. I've seen a lot of weirdos like him. They get a couple of right answers, and they think they're talking to God. Yes. That's why I got the gadget in the place. You see, people have to have something to believe in. Some people believe that for a handful of quarters, they can get help with their problems, find out the future. <laughs> but I'd like to see their faces if I ever opened up the case and showed them what's inside. <laughs> just a bunch of electrical wiring. <laughs> That's what I wish Ross would do. I wish he'd just realize it's just a dumb piece of machinery. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you tell your boyfriend not to come around here no more, okay? Ah, but you, you can come back any time early. Ross? 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 Hey, Ross, where have you been? I waited for you. You didn't show up. It's almost time for me to go to work. Where have you been? Walking. Just walking around. What's the matter? Didn't the race come through? It isn't that. It's nothing. Did you have dinner? No. Tell me what's wrong. Please. I... I can't. Yes, you can. Look, leave me alone, will you? All right, if that's what you want. Wait, wait. Barbara, come here. Listen, 
Don't don't say a word about this to anyone. I won't. I I, I chickened out on something. What? Well, I was gonna I was gonna fix it so we could get married right away. What do you mean? Well, it was the gypsy's idea. See, see when Kirkwood stops into the parking lot around June. The gypsy's June and... idea? What are you talking about? Oh, let me about? finish, will you? See, see, when Kirkwood stops into the lot around noon to check the receipts, that means he probably won't be back until after I'm off ship. So I could take the dough we collect oh, from then on. You're and... kidding. No. Steal Kirkwood's money? I... Now, wait a minute. Don't get all excited. Kirkwood had to have you arrested. Did you ever think of that? That's what I mean. I've been thinking about it. So I, I chickened out. I almost had a hundred bucks in my pocket when it was quitting time. I could have walked right off the lot with all that dough. I stuck it in the safe. Oh, for a minute, I thought... But don't you see, Barbara? I don't have enough guts. I don't care about that. I care that you used your head. I want to get married, too, but not on stolen money. Come on, Ross. Walk me up to the theater. It's almost midnight. Give me some change. Okay, here you go. Oh, no. Listen, Mr. Trouble, I told you last time, you ain't coming in here no more. Now, beat it. Oh, look, I'm sorry. I promise it won't cause any trouble. Come on, just give me four quarters. Please. Is, is the gypsy working okay? Yeah, yeah, it's working fine. And I want to keep it that way. Now, bug off. You hear me? Take off. No. I got to ask her one thing. Come back here. Let go of me. Mister? Hey, hey, mister. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, no. He hit his head right on the cement. Blood running out of his ear. <sighs> Nobody saw us. Maybe, maybe I can. Try to drag him around the back. Of the booth. There. Now. Quarters. Ah. This will be plenty. Oh, please, please, please help me. You got me into trouble with Mr. Selig. You told me to steal from Mr. Crookworth. What's the matter with you? Don't you like me? Here. Here. Greetings, my friend. Learn your fortune. Ask oh, for you any say that question. every time, but you don't answer every question. You know the answer yourself. That's no kind of an answer. Look, I'm in trouble. I gotta get some money and get away. What do I do? Use great care, and the result will be faithful. You mean, can you go ahead and take Kirkwood's money? The answer to your question is yes. But I need the money now, tonight. Ah, oh, I gotta put in another quarter. Greetings, my friend. Oh, look, will you knock that off? You know me, it's Ross. It's me. Oh, I need money tonight. You know what happened with Mr. Seelick? Wait, he's got money. Stacks of dough in his little change book. Why not? The answer to your question is no. No? Oh, I see how it is. You work for Seelick. Yeah, yeah, you're sticking up for him. Well, what do you think about that? You know the answer yourself. There, you used to give me good answers. Straight answers. Now, please. All right, all right. I've got one big question to answer tonight. You never answered before. You've got to answer it now. Will you answer it now if I ask you? The answer to your question is yes. Okay, okay. Oh, well, you need more money, don't you? Okay, here you are. Greetings, my friend. Oh, do you have Your to say it, fortune. even though it's still me? Ask me any question. Okay, okay, okay. I'm going to ask you this one very important question now. I remember, you said you'd answer it. Okay? Okay, here it is. Friend, friend will I die? Come on, you promised. When will I die? Tell me. You know. It's the one thing you won't tell me. I've got to give you one more chance. 
when will I die? Tell me! Tell me! Tell me! I'm gonna get to you, Gypsy! I'm gonna tear your heart out! Wires! Wires and machinery! You're just a machine! You're just a machine! I'm gonna... I'm gonna kill you with my bare hands! Been. Okay. I read about you getting back to work. Yeah, you seen that thing in the papers, huh? Well, I'm better off than the kid. Did you know he was nuts when you was going with him? He wasn't nuts. Huh? <laughs> Not much. Come in here, knock me down, left me for dead, then winds up smashing the gypsy electrocuting himself. But I'm sorry for his folks. It didn't happen. Well, then I'm sorry for you. Hey, what are you doing back here? Oh, I've been coming here a lot. Before he got out of the hospital. Yeah. Funny. He didn't look like the type. Can I have some change? Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks. Hello, my darling. Greetings, my friend. Learn your fortune. Ask me. Any question? You've been listening to Ask Me Any Question, tonight's tale of terror on Crisis. Our players were Gordon Thorne as Ross, Veronica as Barbara, Douglas Young as Selig, and Pat French as the Gypsy Fortune Teller. Ask Me Any Question was an original concept by Fred Sanchez, written and produced by yours truly, Jim French. is distributed by the Nostalgia Broadcasting Corporation, Post Office Box 10914, St. Petersburg, Florida. The Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. Only young children and trained dogs have any real cause to play dead, I suppose, although there's nothing playful about death. We can assume their motives at least are quite innocent. But what about the adult who plays dead? There's something strange and ominous in that. For as adults, we come to respect death. It will come to us all soon enough, so why provoke it? Why tempt it? But there are those who are unimpressed and unintimidated by the aspect of life's final mystery. Such are the men we shall meet in tonight's story. Two men who realize that while death cannot be cheated... It can be fooled. It's a macabre tale, best told with a hint of humor. Gallows humor, that is. I'll return in a minute with a baffling tale of suspense as Crisis presents Jeffrey David Bohm's gothic drama titled The Man Who Never Slept. near the end of the last century. We are in a cold and confining stone prison cell occupied by two men. One of them nervously prepares to leave while the other man watches, thankful that he is to be left behind. What time is it? Well, they took my watch, but 
As a guess, I'd say it's right on 7 o'clock. They're right on time. They always are. I'm afraid it's time, sir. Quite all right. I've been up for hours. Well, old fellow, good luck in the next world. And good luck to you in this one. I'm only sorry our friendship was so short-lived. Perhaps we'll meet again. Perhaps. I would say it's a certainty. Yes, I suppose so, but you'll have to be patient. Oh, I have all the time in the world. Shall we go, Warden? So this is what it's like. I've often wondered. At least a dozen men have made this gallows walk on my account. And now I am one of them. How is it that I now find myself in this unlikely situation? Or you might well ask. And I'll tell you. It all has to do with that young gentleman with whom I have just exchanged such pleasant farewells. His name is Marion Thigpen. A curious name. But then Mr. Thigpen is a curious sort of fellow. Indeed, curious is a far too charitable description. For the man is a fiend. Perhaps the greatest villain I've ever known. The year was 1889. Marion Thigpen was a second-year medical student at the Ann Arbor Doctors' College and, from what I understand, a most promising student at that. He shared a small room near the campus with one Reginald Greenleaf Allworthy, Reggie to his friends, a lad notably lacking in good sense, as you shall shortly discover. It was on a warm August night that the villainy buried deep inside Marion Thigpen's heart first began to surface. Reggie! Are you awake? Hmm? Listen carefully to me, Reggie. Are you listening? Hmm. Good. I think you'll be very interested in what I have to say. I was assigned a cadaver in school today, Reggie, that, with all due respect, resembles you in a most uncanny way. It occurred to me that you had recently taken out a $10,000 life insurance policy. Now, if you were to make me the beneficiary of the policy... And if that cadaver were found in your bed tomorrow morning, well, dear Reggie, need I go on? We both would realize a very handsome profit of $5,000 on the arrangement. Well, Reggie sat bolt upright in his bed. He was failing in his classes anyway, and perhaps this was just a thing to avoid the embarrassment and dishonor of being expelled. Certainly his family would think so. And besides, a young man in his prime can have quite a time of it on $5,000. That very night, as Reggie waited outside in a horse-drawn cart borrowed from a local merchant, Marion broke into the school morgue where the cadavers were kept. There we go. Nice and easy. There they were, laid out on the cold cement floor like so many baby whales washed up on shore. There were twenty cadavers in all, each one covered by a heavy gray sheet. Even the strongest and most callous of men might have stopped and reconsidered at this point, but not Marion. He hesitated not a bit, but began immediately to pull away each sheet one by one. No. No. No, not you either. Reggie... Where are you, Reggie, old boy? Ah, the last one. You might know. Then, as if he were the devil himself carting off the damned, Marion lifted the cadaver up and threw him across his shoulder. Up we go. <clears throat> In less than a moment, man and corpse were safely outside. Reggie, back the wagon over. Come on, back it up. Hold it. Hold it right there. Come on, fellow. In you... Gone. Shove off, Richie. The sun's almost up. That morning, a bell in the campus tower sounded the death knell. Several members of Reggie's fraternity sported black armbands for a day or so, and a moment of silence was observed during lunch. Attendance at the chapel services was disappointing. And Marion would have it no other way. The less attention, the better. Uh, later that day, 
An insurance inspector arrived to check the body, and being young and inexperienced and not much inclined to his sordid job, positive identification was made almost immediately, and the check for $10,000 arrived in the mail the following week. The split was made, and the two men parted company far happier and more prosperous than when they had first met. Uh, Marion disappeared totally, but Reggie turned up several months later in New York City, at the Rat's Tail Tavern, to be exact. The notorious Rat's Tail Tavern, gathering place for the worst thieves and cutthroats Hell's Kitchen had to offer. It's true, I tell you. I beat the blood-sucking insurance company. They buried a cadaver. Well enough, but it wasn't me. Because here I am, right? <laughs> One of the customers in the tavern was a tough named Patrick Donovan. Now, he'd been listening to Reggie's bragging talk and sidled up to him and took his arm. Your story fascinates me, laddie. But it's too noisy in here to do much talking. Tell you what, there's a nice little restaurant down the street away. Why don't we put a bit of food in our stomachs? And the treat's on me. But it wasn't food that Donovan planned to put in Reggie's stomach. No, it was his fist. Tell me his name. <coughs> the name of that genius friend of yours. <coughs> or I'll leave you dead in this alleyway. Marion. Marion Thigpen. And where can I find this Marion Thigpen? Tell me, quick. Baltimore. Baltimore, eh? Thanks, laddie. Thanks a lot. Oh, one more thing. I'll take whatever you got left of that $5,000. It wasn't much, only $600, but Donovan took it. There was a train leaving for Baltimore the next day, and Donovan took that, too. He held a small pad in his hand and wrote the same name several times. Marion Thigpen. Marion Thigpen. Curious name, he thought. Shouldn't have any trouble rem remembering a name like that. Shouldn't have trouble finding a man with a name like that, either. Donovan arrived in Baltimore and checked into the Alexander Hotel. He had a light lunch and then began asking questions. As expected, Marion Thigpen proved to be anything but difficult to find. As a matter of fact, he was staying in the Regency Hotel directly across the street. And Donovan located a comfortable bench in the small park next to the hotel and began his vigil. Uh, several hours later, Marion appeared from the hotel lobby dressed in the height of fashion. Frock coat, high hat, cloak, and cane. Heads turned as he made his way down the boulevard. Donovan mashed his cigar into the ground and followed. He followed Marion to the home of Judge Leon Toomey, where Marion called on the judge's charming niece, Rebecca Lynn Toomey. He followed them to a restaurant, and he followed them to the opera. He followed them all night, in fact, and in no way tried to hide the fact that he was doing so. He made quite a show of it, actually, taking every opportunity of catching Marion's eye. Finally, Marion could tolerate it no more. Will you excuse me, please? Marion rose from his chair, crossed the crowded cafe, and took a seat at Donovan's table. Listen here. I don't know who you are but I have a pretty good idea of what you want, and I will not allow you to harass me this way. You must have made a mistake, laddie. Please, don't insult me. You've made yourself perfectly obvious all evening. Who employed you? Veronica? Marie? I'm afraid I never had the pleasure. Look here, then. If you haven't been sent to find me by one of my wives, then One who? of your wives. My, my, you have been a naughty boy. Who are you... I've brought you a message. A message? From whom? From a dead man. I... I don't understand. I've brought you a message from Reggie Allworthy. Reggie Allworthy? Here's where I'm staying. Be there at one o'clock this morning. Donovan returned to his room to await his visitor. One o'clock came, but Marion Thigpen did not. Two o'clock, three o'clock, and still he did not show. And then... You 
disappoint me, Mr. Thigpen. Huh? Don't move. I've got a pistol pointed right at your heart. Turn up the lamp a little, would you? There. That's better. Now drop your gun. Look what you've done. You've assassinated my pillow. Did you really think I'd be lying there in bed waiting for you to kill me? I had hoped you would be, yes. Sit down, won't you? Tell me, have you ever heard the motto, We Never Sleep? It has a familiar ring. Does it now? It's the motto of the Pinkerton's National Detective Agency. You're a Pinkerton? Quite correct. Patrick Donovan is the name. I'm currently working for the Fidelity Mutual Company. I investigate insurance frauds. Uh, I'm beginning to understand. I suppose you've already arrested Reggie Allworthy. On the contrary. He convinced me to let him go. He did? How? With a little information... And $600. I found them both very convincing. Uh, then it's blackmail you have in mind. Well, you can just forget it. I don't no, have it. No, no, not so fast. Now I'm not a blackmailer. Lucky for you, I'm not. Two wives. You almost make it too tempting to refuse. But no, blackmailing's not my style. Mr. Donovan, you try my patience. Just what is it you want from me? I'm very sorry that I'm trying your patience, laddie, but inasmuch as I've got this pistol leveled at your heart, I think you'll just have to put up with me for a bit longer. Oh, very well. But if you kindly come to the point... The point is that three years ago, my wife, Ida, took out a life insurance policy on me in the sum of $10,000, making herself the beneficiary. Now, here's where you come in. You're going to find a cadaver, just like you did for Mr. Allworthy, and you're going to fake my death, just like you did for Mr. Allworthy, and you're going to help me collect the $10,000, just like you did for Mr. Allworthy. And in return, I'm to gain my freedom. Is that right? There's a bright boy. I'll need some time to come up with a plan. Well, it's now 4 o'clock in the morning. I'll give you until 12 noon. Meet me in the restaurant downstairs. And don't get any funny ideas about leaving town. I'll have my eye on you. Marion had gotten no sleep that night, and he certainly wasn't going to get any now. He returned to his hotel room and began to think. Well, well, right on the button this time. You have a plan? Yes, I believe so. Good. I'm all ears, as the saying goes. Marion's plan was quite simple, really. A cadaver would be obtained from a doctor friend of his for a small fee, a Marion generously offering to pay for it himself out of his own pocket. That problem solved, he only had to come up with a cause of death, as something convincing enough in its circumstances, yet violent enough to obscure the cadaver's true identity. Run, run over by a freight train? It would certainly do the trick. But why would I be run over by a freight train? You're going to commit suicide. Suicide, ah. Mm. I've checked your policy. There's a two-year waiting period on suicide claims, and you said your wife took out the policy when? Three years ago. Three years, that's right. So we wouldn't have any trouble on that score. Now, I know a stretch of track where the bushes hide the engineer's view. By the time he sees the body on the track, it will be too late. Yes, I see. Of course, a suicide note in your own hand will be found by the side of the tracks. And as to your wife, you said she is named as the beneficiary? Well, that's good. It will arouse less suspicion. We must inform her of the plan, however. We will need her to identify the body. Also, instruct her to turn the $10,000 over to me for delivery to you. Why can't she bring it to me herself? Oh, come now, Mr. Donovan. You're a detective. You should know better than that. What if she's followed? Oh, you're right. I wasn't thinking. That's all right. I'll do the thinking. Now, here's the map. Meet me the day after tomorrow at exactly three o'clock in the afternoon. And don't be late. Remember, we have a train to catch. You're late. The train is almost here. Did you bring the note? Right here in my pocket. Where's the cadaver? Behind these bushes. Give me a hand. Where? I don't see it. Here, behind this bush. Where? Mm. Right there, you fool. 
Millions saw no reason in throwing good money after that. Why pay for a cadaver to impersonate Donovan when Donovan himself could so easily play the role? He took the note from Donovan's pocket and dragged the body to the railroad tracks and not a moment too soon. Mrs. Ida Donovan soon arrived to identify the body. Marion put her up in the Regency Hotel where he visited her daily until the insurance check arrived and was turned over to him. And thereafter, his visits were less frequent, and each time Ida would ask, Where's my husband? When will I see him? Oh, she was a figure to be pitied. Marion could keep the truth from her no longer. Madam, I have distressing news. It appears that we're both the victims of a monstrous hoax. I thought that I was assisting a man in avoiding the merciless vengeance of his creditors. But I now discover that I have unwittingly aided your husband in a scheme to run off with another woman. You will never see him again, I'm afraid. He has taken a boat to Brazil where I'm sure he will live in splendor on his insurance money. I am very sorry. Poor Mrs. Donovan fell to the floor and began to sob uncontrollably. There was no consoling her. Her grief was too great. That evening, she took her life. As for Marion Thigpen, he quietly slipped away and was not heard of until nearly one year later. While shopping in Woolworths for a new pair of spats, he came face to face with Veronica, his first wife. Now, you are probably wondering how I have come by all this information and what part I play in this sordid tale. Well, the answer to the first part is simple. I have spent the last few days in the same prison cell with Mr. Thigpen as a man condemned to hanging. As the dead have nothing to fear from the living, so too do the living have nothing to fear from the dead. Therefore, Marion saw no reason why he should not unburden his soul to me on the eve of my execution. I don't think the morning will ever come. It'll come soon enough. Talk to me, would you? I'm certain to go crazy. Talk. About what? I don't care. Talk about yourself. You want to hear about me? Yes, I do. All right. I guess it can't hurt. Not now, anyway. But I warn you, it will make your hair stand on end. Go ahead. Tell me. You see... You see, I'm in here on a bigamy conviction. But if they found out the things I'm really guilty of, they'd have to hang me ten times over. And then he told me the story I've just told you. But what about me? What is my story? What is my crime? Why do I now stand on these gallows while that monster thig pen watches from his cell window? Why is this hood being placed over my head and not his? Why is this rope being slipped around my neck and not his? And why am I to be hung in this lonely brick courtyard and not he? Help you up. You all right, Mr. Pauly? I'm fine. Didn't feel a thing. My compliments to your executioner. The rope broke perfectly. You Pinkerton sure have some mighty strange methods. Well, methods don't mean much, Warden, unless they also get results. Well, whatever you say. Now, is there anything else we can do for you? Yes, I'm I'm anxious to get back to my hotel and take a hot bath. Might I borrow your coach? Oh, of course. I'll have it brought around for you right away. Thank you so much. Now do you understand? My name is Amos Pauley. I'm a Pinkerton agent. Like Patrick Donovan, you say? No, not quite. Donovan was an agent, but a bad agent. And an idiot into the bargain. He got no less than he deserved. But still, when a fellow agent is murdered, something must be done. It's a crime that cannot go unpunished. The agency cannot be embarrassed in this way. It took me only one week to link Donovan's so-called suicide to Marion Thigpen. And it took me one solid year to track down Thigpen himself. When I learned he was serving time for the ridiculous crime of bigamy, I had myself put into the same prison cell with him. An agent's job is half completed when he knows his suspect is guilty. And now I know that Marion Thigpen is guilty. And Marion Thigpen thinks... That I am dead. In three months, he'll be released from prison and I will be there watching him. 
I will follow him wherever he goes and see whatever he does. And eventually he will slip and make a mistake and I will be there. Then I've got him. I will not fail in this endeavor. I cannot fail. I am a Pinkerton agent and I never sleep. Man Who Never Slept was written by Jeffrey David Bohm. I'll return in a moment with the names of tonight's players and a word about next week's crisis. The Man Who Never Slept featured Michael Morgan Dunn as Amos, Ross Perry as Marion Thigpen, Griff Cadnier as Reggie, and John Gilbert as Donovan. It was written by Jeffrey David Bohm and directed and produced by Jim French at Audio Recording Incorporated in Seattle. Sooner or later, when you least expect it, there comes a point of no return, a dead end from which there seems no escape, a moment in time, a moment of crisis. How many millions of workaday lives begin each day with that most unwelcome intruder, the alarm clock? This particular clock, ringing at the bedside of Fred and Betty Folger, is especially unwelcome. For one thing, the Folgers had had a hard night the night before at a party. For another, it's Sunday morning, the one morning they both can sleep in. But there is a more profound reason to dread the beginning of this day, as Fred and Betty are soon to discover. Join us in a few moments as crisis turns the commonplace into the mystified. In the strange and suspenseful tale we're about to unfold, a story titled Habitat. We'll begin in one minute. up. 7.30. Come on. What time is it? It's 7.30. What? Are you out of your mind? It's Sunday. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's Sunday. Can't be. The alarm went off. Oh, the alarm went off. Oh, boy. You sure must have been out of it last night to set the alarm. I didn't set the alarm. Well, I sure didn't set it. My head. Oh, mine, too. Look, you must have said it in your sleep. Now, would you let me go back to sleep? 7.30 on a Sunday morning, and we didn't even get to bed till 3. Maybe there was something we had to do this morning. Uh, Are you kidding? At 7.30 on a Sunday morning, when when I've only had four hours of sleep? Okay, okay. Don't raise your voice. Please. My head's going to explode. Yours is going to explode. Hey, you got any aspirin? Yeah. Uh, you want to? Yeah, yeah. I'll go get a glass of water. Yeah. Oh, my head is pounding like a sledgehammer. Oh, boy. What a way to start a day. <laughs> want some more coffee? Just a touch. That, that, that's enough, that's enough. What are you going to do today? Uh, I don't know. Probably watch the ball game. Maybe get a little workout. Might take the bike out. If this fog ever lifts. Yeah. Can I see part of the paper? Yeah, sure. Well, it's 9 o'clock in Santa Monica. 
time for your regular Sunday phone call from Mama. That's right. <laughs> it is time, isn't it? Yeah, 11 o'clock every Sunday we hear from her. You could set your watch by it. You know, I can just hear her out there in her little retirement apartment in California, watching the clock, just counting the minutes, till she could bring her weekly message of cheer to her dear daughter, who's slaving her youth away in Chicago for her slob of a son-in-law. Fred, will you <laughs> cut it out? Ah, what did I tell you? Hello? Hello, Elizabeth, darling. How are you? Oh, fine, Mama. Uh, Fred and I were just talking about you. Tell me, dear. Are you still having that awful weather back there? Oh, it's not so bad. We haven't been outdoors yet. It's, it's just kind of foggy, that's all. Feel sorry for us because we don't live out there in God's country. Shh. It's already 70 degrees here today. That's wonderful, Mama. Is there anything I can send you? Why, well, I, I can't think of a thing. You're still working, I suppose. Yes, uh, yes, I'm still working. Here it comes. You poor dear thing. You're burning the candle at both ends. I'm so afraid you'll lower your resistance or get mugged working in that terrible city. Please don't worry about me, Mama. I like working, and I'm not in any danger. You know, if you need money, dear, it I... isn't that really, Mama. I have a good education, and I enjoy getting out and using it, that's all. You don't have to explain anything to her. Shh. What, Mama? Well, dear, say hello to Fred for me. I hope I'll see you this summer. I hope so, too, Mama. I'd better hang up now. Talk to you next week. All right, Mama. Thanks for calling. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Well, she, uh... Ask you to come out and live with her in the eternal sunshine of Senile City? No. I wish you'd take that chip off your shoulder. Look, she doesn't approve of me, and that's mm. that. She never did, she never will. I can live with that. You were going on about it at the party last night. Oh, I was? That's funny. You know, I uh, remember very little about that party. Very interesting people. Where did we meet them? At the convention last year in Miami. He's in uh, imported woolens, he says. Well, frankly, I met so many people in Miami, I couldn't tell you who he was or which company he's with. But you must have made quite an impression on him. To get us invited to his place, I mean. Yeah, well, he sure pours a heck of a drink. I'll say that. Way coast. Man, what a game. <laughs> hey, any more beer, honey? Nope. That's the last of the six pack. Now, yeah, that was a fresh one. Count the empties. You had six. One in each quarter and two at halftime. Ah, uh, okay, okay. You know, with all the beer and cigarettes, this place is getting to smell like Clancy's Tavern. Man's home is his castle. Yeah, but I'm darned if I'm going to be a barmaid all weekend. Now, what does that mean? I mean, what do I do while you're in your wide world of sports? <laughs> I hustle you your beer and snacks and empty your ashtray. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forget. You've uh, got too good an education to waste it on being a housewife. Yeah. Don't be smart. What's for dinner? You want it straight. Leftovers. Remember the roast we had Thursday night? If we don't finish it up tonight, I'll have to throw it out. Oh, boy. Sundays, Sundays. How I love Sundays. Well, uh, you gonna watch the late movie? I don't know. Not tonight. I'm kind of bushed, and tomorrow's another day. Yeah. Gee, you know, all this sitting around doing nothing uh, uh, really makes me sleepy. Mm, ah. That's right. You know, we haven't poked our nose out of the house all day. Is it still foggy out? Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I can't see a thing. Well, I'm off to bed. I'll be right along. Oh, don't forget to set the clock. Okay, Fred. Open at him. 7.30. Uh, 
yesterday morning. Now, how would I know? I know I had to open a new can of coffee because we didn't have enough left in the old can to make a pot of coffee. So? Well, look. Here's the only one I can find, and it's full and still sealed. So what? Will you open it, please, and make the coffee? I must be losing my mind. I could swear I had to open this very same can of coffee yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Fred! All right. This is absolutely crazy. Fred, come here. What? Fred, just come in here in the kitchen. Oh, all right. Okay. Now, well, what's the matter? Now, why are you holding the door to the refrigerator open? What are you trying to do? Air condition the house? Look. What? Look at what? What do you see on the bottom shelf? A six-pack of beer. Hey, I thought you said I drank the last six-pack yesterday during the game. You did? and tell me what is it doing in the refrigerator. That's what I'd like to know. First, the coffee can I opened yesterday is all sealed up this morning, and now the beer. Maybe we've been visited by a burglar in reverse. Look, i got to get shaved. Fred? What? Fred, look at the paper out there on the screen porch. What about it? Well, look at it. All right, I'll go out and get the paper. Here you are. It, it looks hey. like Sunday's paper. Yesterday's paper. Ah, yes. That kid must have had some left over and slipped us an old one. Son of a gun. No, it's fresh. It doesn't feel like a day-old newspaper. Now, how do you suppose a day-old newspaper feels? I don't know. I, I'm just... Uh, what are you doing now? Turning on the radio. Where's our nutty wake-up DJ this morning? I don't know. Hey, that, that sounds like a church broadcast. You know, it sounds like, like Sunday all over again. That's what I was just going to say. I have the strangest feeling. This doesn't feel like Monday. It, it feels like Sunday all over again. <laughs> I've never seen the fog so thick. Can't even see across the street. I don't know how either one of us is going to get to work. Well, uh, hurry up. I'll, uh, I'll drive you to the bus stop. Fred, uh, turn on the radio again. Huh? Hey, are you sure that's the station we always listen to? Yes, positive. Well, they've sure gone religious. I better find us a time signal or something. Forecast for Chicago, Evanston, Gary, and Hammond. Partly sunny this morning, becoming cloudy and cooler this afternoon and evening. A chance of snow tonight and Monday. Today's high near 40, Monday 30 to 35. Tonight's low 20 to 25. Did you hear what he said? He said something about tonight and Monday. I know, I know, I heard it. I heard it, guys, reading yesterday's weather forecast, that's all. This is Monday. We get yesterday's paper... Now we get yesterday's weather on the radio. Look, will you stop making something spooky out of this? Well, what is it then? The newspaper boy just left the leftover Sunday paper and the radio guy's reading yesterday's weather. But it isn't yesterday's weather. It doesn't even mention the fog. So? Look, we're both going to be late. Do me a favor. Call up someone. Call the operator and ask her. Ask her what? Ask her what day this is. Look, are you kidding? She'll think I'm nuts or that I've been on a drunk for a week. Call. They don't know who you are. You call. All right, I will. Directory 
your assistance. May I help you? Yes. Uh, this is a silly thing to ask, I know, but could you could you please tell me what day this is? Well, yes, ma'am. It's November 10th. November 10th? That's, uh, that's Sunday. That's correct, ma'am. This is Sunday. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Well, what? She said, this is Sunday. Look, you just can't make me believe that suddenly we live two identical days over again. You can believe it if you want to. But I happen to know that yesterday was Sunday and today's Monday. Now, wait a minute. I'm going next door. The Kendalls think I'm crazy enough anyway, so what can they think if I knock on the door and ask them to tell me what day this is? Hey, wait a minute. Let me get the TV guide. Thank you. Let's see what program will be on now on a Monday morning. All right. I'll turn the set on and uh, you see what ought to be on. Another big Sunday of football thrills right here on Channel 6 beginning at noon with the Baltimore Colts. He said Sunday. All right, now, now let me think, let me think, will you? Now, uh, first of all, I know Sunday was yesterday, right? Right. I mean, there, there's no way we could have mistaken Saturday for Sunday now, was there? No. Uh, the party was for Saturday night. That's right. And yesterday we woke up too early, remember? The alarm went off at 7.30. Yeah, yeah, and I know it was Sunday because your mother called. She always calls on Sunday. I know. Well, you just sit tight, will you? I'll go next door. Come on, door. Open, will you? Ah, the darn thing's stuck. What's the matter? Ah, the, the door to the porch is stuck. I can't get out. Oh, Doc. Is it locked? No, oh, I don't think so, no. no this, this is crazy. It's ridiculous. Well, I haven't got time anymore to monkey with it. I'll, I'll go out the back door. What the devil? What's the matter with you? Nope. I don't like this at all. I don't Fred, understand. can you get out? No, no. Hey, Betty, would you, would you give me something, please? I'm going to break down this door. Oh, no, not our door. Listen, as it stands right now, we are trapped inside our own house. But if you break down the door, we can't lock the house up. We'll both be gone for eight hours, and, and anyone could walk right in. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, Fred, what do we do? I'm scared. Listen, honey, the thing we, we've got to do is not panic. I won't panic. I just want to find out what's going on. Now, uh, now it is possible. I admit it's very unlikely, but it is possible that this whole thing is just a series of coincidences. No, I won't buy that. I, I can see the newspaper boy goofing it, and maybe the radio giving a day-old weather forecast. But not that telephone operator, and not the TV announcer. Uh, if, I, if I could just think of anybody to call, anybody. Hey, wait a minute. Okay. Uh, this will be right. Operator. Uh, operator, uh, this is an emergency. Give me the police. Yes, sir. I can't believe it. They don't answer. There has to be someone we can talk to. Hello? Hello, Elizabeth, oh. darling. How are you? Oh, Mama. Thank God you called. We're having something going on that we can't explain. Tell me, dear. Are you still having that awful weather back there? Oh, listen to me, Mama. I don't want you to worry or anything, but please, would you just tell me what day it is? It's already 70 degrees here today. Mama, I don't care about that. Please, tell me what day it is. Is there anything I can send you? But you asked me that same thing yesterday. Mama, what day is it? Please. You're still working, I suppose. 
You're saying exactly the same words you said yesterday. Come here, come here, come here. Give me that. <laughs> Hello? Listen, Mother, just do me a favor, you will you? You poor, and... dear thing. You're burning the candle at both ends. I'm so afraid you'll lower your resistance or get mugged working in that terrible city. What? You know if you need money, dear. She isn't listening. She thinks you're still on the phone. Well, dear, say hello to Fred for me. I hope I'll see you this summer. Mother, mother, listen to me. This is Fred. I'd better hang up now. Talk to you next week. Mother, mother, mother. <laughs> Driving me crazy. Okay, okay. You, you sit right there, will you? I'm going to get out of this house and find out what in the world's going on. G- give me something. This metal kitchen stool will do fine. What are you doing? I'm going to bust us out of here. I did it. I did it. The front door is open, honey. Be careful in all this fog. Ow. What did I run into? Hi, neighbor. Who's that? Mrs. Kendall? I can't see you. I'm not Mrs. Kendall. Say, I bumped into a a wall. Something invisible. I I couldn't see it. Welcome to the club. You're like I was. You don't know what's happening. What do you mean? Say, what day is it in your place? What day is it? Well, it's Sunday. Sunday. But it should be Monday. Boy, did you luck out. You know what day it is over here? Monday. Monday, 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 Monday. That means washing, washing, washing. Will you please tell me what this is all about? Well, you see, they simulate a typical day in your life. So you'll feel perfectly at home. But you live the same day over and over and over again. We don't know what you're talking about. But can you please come over? Come inside. Oh, I'd love to, believe me. But I can't visit your cage any more than you can visit mine. Cage? Did you say cage? Uh Uh-huh. I don't understand this. Uh, uh, What is that noise I keep hearing? Oh, well, you can't see them. But I'm pretty sure they can see us probably just as well we can't see them. Who? Who are they? The ones that come here to the zoo. Well, wherever Fred and Betty Folger and their home have been transplanted to, they'll be quite comfortable. The curator may not be human, but he's evidently humane. Unfortunately, however, as Fred and Betty retire every evening, they won't be able to say, tomorrow is another day. Our cast included Douglas Young, Betty Callfleisch, and Pat French. Habitat was written for Crisis by yours truly, Jim French. Crisis is distributed by the Nostalgia Broadcasting Corporation, Post Office Box 10914, St. Petersburg, Florida. The Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. There are some people who seem to enjoy playing the doormat who thrive under the domination of others. Such a man is Charles Sidney. In a minute, we meet Charles at the moment of his discontent 
at the emergence of his emancipation in a story we call Concerto for Charlie. I'll have Act One in just a minute. At the piano is Charles Sidney of the Boston Sidneys, son of Peter and Elizabeth Sidney, both deceased. Since that fatal occasion, since his 13th year, Charlie's been in the care and custody of his maiden aunt, Constance Dreyfus of the Boston family. Oh, Charlie isn't playing a concert just now. In fact, he's never played a concert. No, this is just a routine afternoon at the Dreyfus estate, and what Charlie is doing is practicing, preparing for the moment when his loving Aunt Connie will present him to a waiting world at Carnegie Hall. He will never appear at Carnegie Hall. What? What are you talking about, Professor Meisner? I'm saying that your nephew is a very adequate pianist. But a great pianist is more than adequate. Charles has a certain adeptness at the mechanics of the keyboard, which I've been able to give him. But he lacks one important element which nobody can give him. And that is talent. Talent, Miss Dreyfus, he doesn't have. Why, you insult him. Further efforts are useless. Here. Here is your last check. I have kept hoping over the last year that I would see a faint spark of latent ability. Get out. Get out of here this minute. My advice to you is to introduce young Charles to a nice girl and sell the piano. Well. Charles. Charles. Yes, Aunt Connie? Is that something Meisner gave you to play? Why, yes, yes it is. It's his concerto. Give it to me. What? Give it to me. Give me that music. Aunt Connie. I don't want a single stanza from that fraud of a man in this house. Well, what happened? I saw him storming out of here. Oh, Charles, what a fool I've been letting that idiot tamper with your art for all this time. I I'll never forgive myself. Oh, so he found out about me, too. Well, it took him less time than Dr. Morietti. Tomorrow, I'm going to Juilliard and engage a real piano instructor. Oh, Auntie, not another one. Charles, have you forgotten what you mean to me? More than a nephew, Charles, you know that. While Elizabeth and Peter lived, I admired you. I did everything an aunt could do. Then, when your dear mother and father died in that awful wreck, I reshaped my entire life for you, gladly, eagerly. And I promised myself then you would have everything you would need to become the great concert artist I knew you could be. Oh, don't waste it, Charles. Dear Charles, don't disappoint me now. No, Aunt Connie. No, I won't disappoint you. Well, rest now, dear. It's still warm out. Perhaps you'd like a swim. Dinner tonight at eight as usual. And remember, tomorrow we go to Julio. Fine, Aunt Connie. Fine. I'll be out in the terrace. Bravo, maestro. Barbara, I didn't know you were out here. Just enjoying the concert and being neighborly. Mind? No, 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 of course not. Uh, You've been here long? Not long. Just long enough to hear the good professor get his walking papers. Sit down, Charlie. Here, by me. Thank you. Oh, for Pete's sake, don't be so proper. This is me, good old Barbara from across the hedge. I know what's bugging you. I was listening. <laughs> You're a shameless hussy. Mm-hmm. I know. And you like me that way, don't you? Well... Don't you? Well, I like you, all right. But do we have to talk about it? No, you're right. Why talk at all if we can do something about it? Hmm? Oh, Barbara. We ought to be more careful. The help, they can see us. Want to go down by the garage? Please, Barbara. Well, what's the matter? That's where you took me the first time you ever kissed me. I know, but that was ten years ago. We were both just kids. And you were just as scared then as you are right now. Only now you're scared of something different, aren't you? I... I don't know what you mean. Oh, yes, you do. You're scared to stand up to dear Aunt Connie and walk out on her in that Steinway because you're afraid you'd lose everything, right? Well, I... Right. And isn't it so? Look at you, 27 years old. You haven't earned a dime in your whole life. Who buys your wardrobe, your cars, your trips to Europe? Oh, look, lover boy. You don't live 500 feet from someone for half your life without getting to know the score. Uh, but let's, let's walk away from the house. All right. I admit it, but 
The only thing I've got that Aunt Connie didn't buy for me is you. I can't even have you as long as she has it in her head that she's going to make me the world's greatest pianist. And that's what I was trying to tell her in the music room. I know, I heard. But I can't let her down. I'm her only living relative now. I'm the, the son, son she, she never, never had. had. I know. But life isn't too tough, is it, Charlie? You sit there and practice your scale six hours a day, and sooner or later you'll play yourself right into a fortune. The ironic thing to me is you have to wait for her to kick off before you can get your loot as well as hers. Well, I, I wouldn't put it in those words exactly. Well, you told me yourself about that, 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 that what you would call it, your, your folks set up in their will. Uh, the trust fund? Yeah, yeah, where you get the kind of allowance for as long as Connie lives and you're still her ward. Well, that's right, but of, of course this is the way the balance of my inheritance is being invested for me, so that when that day does come, there should be a lot of money left. An awful lot. But a fat lot of good that does you now. Yeah, I know. I'm sick of the piano. I could hack the thing into kindling wood. You know, it seems to me you could lay down the law to her and make her turn you loose. I mean, will or no will, you are 27 years old. Maybe. Maybe I could talk to Mr. Grimshaw, the attorney for the estate. Oh, sure. He'd be about as sympathetic as an iceberg. And remember, he gets a fee for administering the estate. Well, what then? Would you, like I said, stand up to dear Auntie. Move out. If you set up your own apartment somewhere and start paying your own way, wouldn't that break the provision in the will about being under Connie's custody? You... Wow, you know, that's a thought. I gotta hand it to you, Barbara. I think you've got an idea. Oh, I wish you'd have one of your own now and then. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What am I talking about? I can't move out. I haven't got a dime of my own. You mean you never saved any of the money? All I've got is a pocket full of credit cards. Then you got to persuade her to let you go on her own free will. Do you think you can do it? I gotta try. I'll I'll try it tonight at dinner. See you after? Okay. Here, by the garage? Okay. And Charlie, here's for luck. For us. Oh, Barbara. Go on now. Go on. And Charlie, be firm. <laughs> Can I have some more wine? Why, that's your third glass. Wine is meant to be sipped, dear. Now, if you're thirsty... No, all right, I'll reach for it myself. Oh, Charles. No, I, I've had it. Oh, Charles. Oh, Charles, listen. I've taken just about all I can take. Charles. I'm through, Aunt Connie. Tomorrow we'll drive down to Juilliard and hire a new piano teacher. I don't teacher. want a new piano teacher. I don't want to ever play the blasted piano again. I don't want to live here. I don't want to be a pet Pekingese. I want out, and I want my own life to live. And do you hear me? I'm a no-talent fake. Keep your voice down. I here. never wanted any piano lessons. But my folks, they made me take them. Now you take over, you drill me, you control me, and I haven't even got a life of my own. Do you realize that? I'm 27 years old, and I'm a puppet. And I want my own life, and my own money. And I want to live for myself. And did you hear what I said? Yeah. Yes, poor dear Charles, and I do understand. You do? Of course. You're a sensitive soul. It only bears out what I've always contended. You are a great artist, and it's only natural that you're depressed after this afternoon. Depressed? I'm almost out of my mind. I tell you, I've had it with that piano, and this house, and with you. You've got to see Mr. Grimshaw. Grimshaw? Whatever for? To tell him that you want me released from this trust fund, to put on my own, with my own money. Why, I'll do nothing of the kind. Sit down and finish your no. dinner. No, I'm through. And that's that. Dear, dear, dear. Yes, Miss Dreyfus? Graham, I'm afraid Mr. Charles isn't himself tonight. He just went out the other door. Will you see to it that he does not leave the grounds or see anyone? Do you understand? I'll lock the gates immediately, ma'am. Charlie, my boy. Oh, Charlie, my boy. Barbara, is that you? Where are you? Here, here, over by the garage. Well, well, how did it go? Well, I, I told her all right. And? Oh, uh, nothing. Absolutely nothing. She won't let loose. Oh, great. Come on, come on, sit down beside me or they'll see you. You know, 
This is incredible. Hiding from my auntie like a naughty little boy. Charlie, Charlie, explain that trust fund to me. Well, as, as I get it, my parents stipulated that if they both died at the same time... And they did. My inheritance would be placed in this trust fund. And uh, Aunt Connie would act as my trustee for as long as she lives or until she becomes unable to take care of me. Oh, they must have expected you to grow up to be an idiot. No comment. Well, anyway, Connie gets part of the money in payment for taking care of me. Taking care of you? Who says you need taking care of? They did, I guess. Charlie? Hmm? Did it ever occur to you what a good deal it was for Connie? Your parents both dying together? She can hang on to her inheritance and part of yours as long as she lives. Are you trying to tell me something? I'm trying to tell you that Connie has lived pretty high for 14 years. She's put on servants she's never had before, bought a rolls, traveled, spent money. People have murdered for a lot less. Murdered? Connie was the last person to see your parents alive, wasn't she? Yeah, we, uh... Spent the day here. I was to spend a week with her while my parents were in upstate. And wasn't there something about Graham fixing their car before they made the trip? Yeah. Yeah, Dad was going to take the car down to the village for a tune-up. But Connie insisted that Graham could do the work right here. Right here in this garage. Now, what are you getting at? Shh, shh. Someone's been listening. Master Charles. Oh, speak of the devil. It's Graham, Master Charles. Miss Dreyfus has been most concerned. I think you'd better come back to the house now. Oh, uh, good evening, Miss Barbara. Uh, oh, I'll see you later, Barbara. Coming, Mr. Charles? I'm coming. Uh, you heard what we were talking about, did you, Graham? I'll just say this, sir. Miss Barbara has a colorful imagination. And this matter of the accident, it would be very hard to prove. It's been hmm, how long? Fourteen years? Yes, very hard to prove, sir. What can I do for you? Uh, Wilson's Auto Wrecking? That's us. Uh, you've been in the business here in the village for a long time, haven't you? 24 years. Same location. Why? Uh, my name's Charles. Hiya. And, well, this is a long shot, but 14 years ago, there was a bad accident on the Hudson Highway when a car with two people in it went over the cliffs. Mm, 1960 Cadillac Fleetwood. Black. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> Mr. Charles, you think a doctor ever forgets an appendix? You think a dentist ever forgets a mouth? Well, I never forget a wreck. I bought that wreck. Well, then maybe maybe you'd remember the condition of the car. Vividly. It was flat. Well, yes, I'm sure it was flat. What I mean is, can you recall if there was any obvious reason for the car to go over the cliff? Oh, could have been brakes, power steering. Why? Well, the people in it were my parents. Uh -huh. Well, look, if you dismantled the car, you'd have seen if some part had been... Jimmy, wouldn't you? Might have. Come here. You know much about cars? Well, not much. Well, your power steering system is made so it's fail-safe. That means if it loses pressure under normal conditions, it, it gets harder to steer. But it doesn't just let you down, bluey like that. You follow me? But, but the unit I pulled out of that 60 Caddy was different. I couldn't sell it. Had to throw it out. How come? It wouldn't work. Put fluid in, build up pressure... And she'd let the front end wander all over the place. Caused by a, a bleeder hole drilled in the servo body. Well, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds like... The... Like somebody tinkered with the power steering? Yeah, that's what I'd say. Yep, that's what I'd say. Your home. Wherever have you been? I've been to Juilliard, but I had to go all by myself. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry about that, Aunt Connie. I had an, uh, an errand to run in the village this morning. With that Barbara girl? Barbara? Oh, no, no. I was all alone. Well, you were with her last night, weren't you? With Graham? 
Who needs the CIA? Graham has been a loyal and trusted servant for many years, Charles. But I do wish you'd get over seeing that Barbara. I think she's at the root of your dissatisfaction. She has very peculiar ideas. Mm, but I kind of like her. She's, she's my contact with civilization. Well, you soon have something to occupy your mind. I've engaged a new piano teacher, one of the... Oh, no. Very... You went through with it, did you? Oh, you'll see some real progress this time. Charles, if you're going outside, take a sweater with you. Did you talk with the wrecking yard man? And he remembered the car. And he as much told me the steering gear had been tampered with. Charlie, do you know what this means? You're, you're living with a murderess. Murderess? You mean murderer. Graham was... Who do you think put him up to it? Uh, Connie? Well, doesn't it add up? Connie gets your folks out of the way, gets control of their estate. Barbara, what else? Barbara, are you crazy? My mother was Connie's sister. And how much was she worth to Connie dead? I won't even talk about it. Oh, you've grown to enjoy captivity, is that it? The trouble with you, Charlie, is that you never want anything badly enough to do anything about it. I thought I was in love with a man. But you're a puppet. A willing puppet. All right. All right. Now, suppose it was Aunt Connie. What can I do about it now? You know what you can do about it. What are you suggesting? That woman will never let you go. If we're ever going to have anything for ourselves, you know what has to happen. We both know it, don't we? You mean, do her in? Murder? Well... I don't believe it. You're not serious. Well, it, it wouldn't be like that. If she killed your parents, it'd be justice. Didn't you love them, Charlie? Your folks? Well, of course I love well, them. What if you're living in the same house with their murderer? If, if I thought now, if I thought for one minute... Add it up, Charlie. Maybe it's harder for you to see, but I'm on the outside. I can see it. Darling, what she did to them, what she's doing to you. By the way, this afternoon I thought of something horrible. Do you have a will? A will? Uh, yes, Grimshaw insisted on it when I turned 21. Who gets it? Who gets it? All your money, if you die before Connie. Oh. Oh, boy. Uh-huh. Barbara, what can I do? I can't do anything. Walk like... down to the hedge with me. I've got an interesting idea for a little rock. I'm so delighted that you suggested this ride. It's been a long time since we've had a nice drive together. Yes, and Graham seemed to be happy to have the afternoon off. Of course he was. Well, now, where are we going? The beach. Uh, you mind? Oh, mind? I'd love it. Do you remember when you were a little boy how you loved to go to the beach and build sandcastles? Oh, sure, I remember and Dad would take me out under the surf on his shoulders and pretend he was going to dunk me. Oh, please. I'm sorry I met you. And when we got back, Mama would have the picnic lunch all spread out. I thought they were the two handsomest people in the world. Please, Charles, let's not talk about them. Why not? Why not, Aunt Connie? We never talk about them. And I'd like to. They were wonderful people. I only wish I'd been able to know them a little longer. Stop it, Charles. Stop it. Look, we're here. On the cliff road above the ocean, the whole Atlantic Ocean, 200 feet below us. <gasps> Don't drive so close. There's a slope right down to the edge. Tell me again how it happened, Eddie. How Graham fixed my father's car, and then they drove a few miles. I never want that subject discussed again. You don't want to talk about it? All right. Let's change the subject. Let's talk about me. When are you going to give me my freedom? I'm only complying with your parents' wishes, Charles. They recognized that you tended to be a bit unstable. Oh, unstable, am I? That's where you're going to try now, huh? Well, Annie, I've given you every opportunity... There's nothing to... to be ashamed of in having a certain weakness, Charles. We all weakness? have our... Oh, yes. Yes, I've been weak, all right, but not anymore. Charles, the emergency brake. Why did you release the Just emergency brake? stay break? over on your side. No, stay in the car. What are you doing? The car's rolling. Fifteen to control. Hey, we need to get another wrecker up here. The car is wedged in the rocks at the foot of the cliff. Fire's out. We have one fatality confirmed. Identity unknown, but I'm interrogating a witness. Unit 15 out. 
Okay, now, miss, you were saying you were right behind the car. Yes, yes, I saw the whole thing. The, the car never stopped or anything, just dove right off the cliff. Mm-hmm. Speed? Uh, about 40. Weaving, you said? Yes, as if the driver had passed out or, or, or was drunk. Okay, that's about all I'll need. Thank you, ma'am. You're free to go now. Thank you, officer. Well, even simpler than I figured. You know, at the last minute, I almost thought you'd changed your mind. <laughs> changed my mind? <laughs> Hardly. As I told Charles just before it happened, he was weak. Well, I'm not. Barbara, my dear, it was planning and timing and surprise. Just as we planned, when he opened the door, I leaned over and grabbed him to keep him in the car. Then I rolled out my own open door. The element of surprise, my dear. Well, I'm certainly glad it's over. Yes. It would have been only a matter of time before Charles would discover it had been his inheritance we were living on, not mine. That my own fortune ran out long ago. And my share? <laughs> In due time, my dear. In due time. <laughs> As I used to say to Charles, youth is so impatient. And so ends Concerto for Charlie. I'll be back in one minute with the name of tonight's players and a scene from next week's Crisis. Concerto for Charlie featured Jack Morton, Lee Posh, Pat French, Vern Taylor, and Ross Perry, and was written and directed by yours truly, Jim French, who invites you to join us again next week at the same time for Crisis. Sooner or later, when you least expect it, there comes a point of no return, a dead end from which there seems no escape, a moment in time, a moment of crisis. out of Jefferson Davis Parish on Louisiana's U.S. 90. You run through miles of marshland. Spanish moss hangs like beards from the oak and cypress trees that dot the swamps. And here and there, there's a house. When it rains down here, as it's doing today, it's no place for an old woman. But in one of those houses, almost hidden by the dense growth, lives Nora Soper, a widow these 16 summers. She lives simply, happily, and independently. A tiny woman is Nora, and although toughened by her solitary existence, she is vulnerable. But not to the dangers from the wild country around her. She's used to that. Her only danger could come from man. And in just a few moments, Nora will have a visitor, a desperate visitor. And now, tonight's tale of suspense on Crisis, titled, Saturday, It Rained. Thimble, thimble, thimble. Now, if I were a thimble, where would I be? No, not on the window ledge. Thimble, did you fall on the floor? Oh, I hope you didn't. Did you grow little legs and run out the crack under the door? Oh, well, I'll look for it later. I'll just catch up on my diary. Now, where did I leave off? Friday. Worked some on the book, but hands got tired. Have to set me a trap tomorrow if weather improves. Radio says storm is moving in. To bed at 11. 
Well, the storm moved in all right, all right. What was that? Must be Angie. And here I am, not even halfway ready to go nowhere. Angie, is that you? Say, uh, could you help me? Huh? A stranger. Well, what is it you want? I'm stranded out here in the rain. I wonder if you could, uh, let me come in and drive off. My car broke down. Oh, well, for land's sake. I'm sorry to trouble you, ma'am, but I must have walked three miles in this. I never thought I'd even find a house. That all you got on? Just that shirt and trousers? No coat? No, ma'am. Well, can't turn you away in that kind of shape. Come in, come in. Sure is nice of you to do this, ma'am. Where are you coming from? I'm coming from over by Baton Rouge. And where are you bound? I'm bound for Texas. Uh, Beaumont. What did you say is wrong with your car? Oh, I don't know. It must have flooded the engine out. Well, what you going to do? I don't know. Wait for the rain to stop, I guess. <laughs> I don't have no phone. Nearest garage is over by Sulphur. Good seven miles west of here. Well, I don't have no money for no mechanic anyways. You haven't? Huh. Well, don't stand there by the door. Come on over here by the range. You'll dry off quicker. Sure do keep it hot in here. Old people can't take the cold. Yes, and You live in Baton Rouge? Well, I've been staying over near there. What's your name? Um, uh, well, my name's Hampton. Jim Hampton. Jim Hampton. No, I don't know anybody by the name of Hampton. Uh, what's your name? Nora Soper. Mrs. Soper. How do you do? How do you do? You, uh, got a job over by Beaumont? Where? Beaumont. I thought that's where you said you're heading. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my job. Uh, say, where's your husband? What? <laughs> Mr. Soper's been dead 16 going on 17 years. You live alone out here? Well, I've got a mess of chickens down under the house and... No, 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 no. I, I mean no other people. No, that's right. Must get downright lonely. <laughs> no. I've had my fill of crowds. I'm a circus performer. Lived with crowds of people all my life. What'd you do in the circus? Well, my headline act was the slack wire. But I worked them all. The tightrope, trapeze, the pyramid. My husband, Joe, he was in the circus all his life, too. Say, maybe you saw... Say, you husband. don't have no car, do you? No, don't have a car. Mm. Need a car. Bus runs past here twice a day between Lake Charles and Benton. Say, it goes on right to Beaumont. Why, you could catch the bus. No, you couldn't. It's Saturday. Bus don't run Saturdays. Well, if this rain lets up, I'll be okay. What time is it? Eleven o'clock? Well, let's get the weather forecast. We'll see what the weather's going to be. Say, you like something to eat? Yeah, that'd be fun. All right. You listen to the radio and get the weather report. And I'll fry you up some pork and some peas. How'll that be? Just fine, thanks. It's 11 a.m. and time for the latest news headlines from Radio 1560 in Baton Rouge. The administration again denies any wrongdoing in its foreign wheat sales. That hijacked Colombian airliner has landed safely in Argentina. Locally, there's still no trace of convicted murderer Billy Joe Post who escaped from the prison farm at Whitehall last night. The weather continued rain and wind today over most of southern Louisiana. Gale warnings for southerly winds up to 35 miles an hour with just... Well, still lots of rain coming down. I guess you heard. Yes, I heard. You hear about them hijackers? Yes, I heard that, too. <laughs> yeah, how about that? Well, they still ain't caught that poor old boy who escaped from the prison farm. Well, I reckon he's long gone by now. Gee, that looks outstanding. Hope you take your coffee black. That's exactly how I do take it. All right. Now, I'm going 
going to have to go out for a few minutes. You want more coffee? It's there on the stove. Are you going out in this rain? Have to. Where are you going? Have to set out my trap. Your trap? What kind of trap? Possum trap. Where is this um, a possum trap? Hanging under the house. Now, I'll just get my boots on. And... You ain't going nowhere, old woman. What? You ain't going nowhere, I said. Now, you come back on over here. Now, listen here, young fella. This is my house, and I'll do what I you want. Shut up! You got it all figured out, don't you? Well, what kind of business is You this? heard the news about the escapee, and now you put two and two together, and it spells me, right? So you thought you could get out of the house and go on down the road and get help, huh? Right? Now, young fella, I took you in under my roof and I gave you some of my food. I've done the Christian thing, but I ain't having you sass me around. No siree. You can just get back and go on. Mm-mm. Why, how dare you? You get up and get on out of here. Oh, no, now, you got a guest in your house, Mrs. Soper. See, if you hadn't got so smart and put two and two together, why, you'd be seeing the last of me when I finished up this grub. But now I can't go, can I? Let you go holler into the first car that comes by that you know where Billy Joe Post is hiding? Who was it you murdered, Mr. Billy Joe Post? You mean you didn't hear all about it? No, I guess I didn't. Uh, I was famous. Famous. You got a celebrity in your shack, missus. Why do you have to keep it so hot in here? It's how I like it. Hot and sticky wet. Mine's been laundered back in the prison. Who was it you killed? Old man runs a gas station. He had a gun. He was fixing to kill me. It was pure self-defense. <laughs> I told him, I said, uh, you just be cool and nobody get hurt. That's right. But, oh, he was a sly one. One minute he was just sitting there on a tire, and the next minute he's a diving for a gun under where he keeps the cash box. I had to kill him. Or he'd have killed me. And how did that make you feel? What do you mean? Killing a man. You know something? When you realize it's him... When it could have been you, you feel good. Yeah, good. And now what are you going to do? I don't know. You got any ideas? Yes. Yes, I do have an idea. You are going to Vamoose. I'll tell you what. I'll give you a poncho to keep you dry, and I'll give you some cornbread. But I want you out of here. Why you want me out of here? I just... Do this is my house. No, nope, I'm sorry. I can't trust you. Trust me? What can I do to you? I got no car. I got no phone. How could I do ah, anything? Ah, but you said you had a friend who stops by for you, and when I knocked on your door, that's who you thought it'd be. Who, Angie? Why, she might not be down by here for two or three more days. No way, old lady. No way. Can't afford to take chances. Well, then at least let me go out and set my trap. Uh-uh. Please. I said no. Hey, what's this? That's my book. You writing a book? I'm trying to. What's it about? It's... I don't believe it would interest you. Come on, what's it about? It's called The Sawdust Trail. It's about my life in the circus. You're right, it don't interest me. What's this? It's my diary. You need to keep a diary, huh? I bet there's lots of spicy stuff in your diary, eh, Mrs. Soper? Friday. Work some on the book, but hands got tired. Have to set me a trap tomorrow if weather improves. There, you see, I wasn't fooling about the trap. You can see that I truly was planning to set out the trap today, long before you came. So what? Uh... Hey, this door go to John? The... 
Yes. Now, yeah, what about this one? Just my bedroom. Only don't go in there. I haven't made my bed yet. I was going to when you came up. My, you've got good manners, haven't you? Shut up. Hey, where's this other door go to? Well, that's just a storage room. I keep it locked. As I said, I keep it locked. What is in there? What's in there? Oh, the remains of 40 odd years with the circus. Some old posters, some costumes, souvenirs from tank towns we played in. In the circus, you never had more than what you could put into a trunk. You never had much to call your own. I always promised myself that someday when I retired, I'd have myself a room. Just one room, all to myself, where I could keep the things I'd collected in a lifetime of travel. I expect there's the dust and the dried mud of some part of most of the 48 states on those things. That's what's in there, mister. Junk. Nothing but junk. And memories. Man, you really are flipped out over the circus, ain't you? Do you realize that I have played to somewhere around two million people in my lifetime? Yeah, so why ain't you rich? Well, maybe you are rich. Maybe you got it stashed in that room. Oh, yes, my riches are in that room. <laughs> That's right. You don't join the circus to get rich, my boy. You join the circus to get away from the boredom that everybody else has to live with. What? Didn't you ever go to the circus and want to pack up and leave with them when they pulled up stakes? Mm-mm, I've never seen a circus in my life. What? you never been to the circus? Why, what were you doing when the circus came to town? I don't know. Who cares? You've never seen the Grand Parade? Never seen the aerialists way up in the top of the tent, leaping out to catch the trapeze and then swinging out to somersault into a leg lock? I don't know what you're talking about. And could care less. That's right. There were wild animal acts and some of the most fantastic things in the sideshow. And all of us had to have at least two special things. Hey, will you knock it off? Write it in your book. Don't lay your jive on me. Listen to me, young man. I want to make a deal with you. I want you out of my house. But I understand your predicament. So I will help. I'll go out and kill a chicken. They're laying hens, but I'll fry one up and wrap it in wax paper and give you some cornbread. And you can take a poncho to keep dry. Hey, you got any beer in this place? Listen to me. You want to get away from the bayou before evening because there are alligators. They've been known to come right up on the road when they are hungry, take a man and tear him to bits. Hey, where do you keep your booze? You got any beer, wine? There's, there's a bottle of wine in the lower cupboard. That's fine. You can take the bottle with you. You don't catch on, do you? I ain't going nowhere. But you can't stay here. But I need a wheels. Hey. When's this dame coming to see you? Angie? Yeah. I don't have any idea. You thought she was coming this morning? Oh, she comes when she can. Might be any time. Yeah? Well, there's my ride, right? What do you have in mind? Very simple. When Angie comes to get you, I just take Angie's car. But Angie may not be here today at all, or tomorrow, or even Monday. That don't matter. I'm staying put until I can drive out of here. Cops will be looking for a guy on foot. Besides, like you said, there are alligators out there. No, I like it here real good. Only you keep the place a stinking hot. Good supper, old lady. I guess your old man didn't starve to death. 
Hey, what did he die of? He was killed in South America, working for the circus. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to open up the back door and let in some air. No. It's hard in a furnace in this place. I've never seen a wood stove before. They sure put out heat. Please, don't cool the place down. You are really weird. Well, it's still blowing and raining. Looks like it'll never stop. Say, I've been thinking. When I'm sleeping, I don't want you loose to try any funny stuff. You don't have much to fear from an old lady half your size. Well, I don't know. You got any rope? Rope? Yeah. What do you want with rope? What do you think? Oh, please. I cooked you a good dinner. I've done everything you ask. Don't tie me up, please. I'm going to tie you in that rocking chair there in the front room. The rocker? Sure, I don't see no other place for me to sleep but in your bed. So you get the rocking chair. Now, where is some rope? I, uh, I don't have any. Oh, now, don't give me that. Hey. You know all that circus junk? You say you got stashed in that room? Well, you must have some rope in there. Well, now you mention it. There just might be some rope in there. Okay, give me the key. Well, all right. <laughs> you had it in your apron pocket all the time. That's so I won't lose it. All right. It's unlocked now. I don't suppose you'd trust me to find you the rope. How'd you guess? Hey, you keep that door open. I can't see much. You have got some weird stuff in here. So you never saw a circus. Well, I always wasn't one of your big ones. Just a small time outfit. Like I said, we all had to have two specialties. Mine were the high wire, like I told you, and snakes. <coughs> Somehow, even though my husband was killed trying to trap one, I just couldn't give up my pet when I retired. So I brought him here. You know, as long as you keep them warm and well fed, they're really quite harmless. But when you deprive them of fresh hot food, like the possum I wanted to trap, well, a 30-foot anaconda, like a picture in there, will encircle your body and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. Well... I just don't know what a 94-pound woman can do, Mr. Billy Joe Post. Oh, dear. What a sound. Well, now, where was I? Saturday. Saturday, it rained. Saturday, it rained. It was written and produced for Crisis by yours truly, Jim French, and featured Lee Posh and Ted Darms.
Best Radio Network presents Crisis. In her 200-year history, America has been many things to many people. To Lincoln, a land in need of healing. To the immigrant, a refuge where lives could start anew. To the poet, Sandberg, a land of constantly surprising beauty. But to writer Martin Geyer, America had lost its beauty. The last thing I remember was sitting on a bus stop bench, waiting for the bus, and this young man, well, I, I thought he was all alone, but he must have had his pals with him, he came up to me. Uh, I wasn't sure he was talking to me. Hey, mister, got a dollar? Uh, excuse me? I said, you got a dollar? He stood over me, grinning. He looked defiant. Hey, man, you deaf? No, I'm not deaf. I'm ignoring you. Let's see your wallet. I knew then, of course, that I was going to be robbed. I had learned, living in the city, that if you're going to be robbed, the best thing to do is give up your money without a struggle. For this way, you're less likely to be hurt. So I started to rise to reach my wallet, which I carry in my hip pocket. When... Hey, hey, what are you doing? I'm getting you my wallet. I keep it right here. Oh. behind, and I saw the street coming up for me, and the last thing I thought was, I'm getting out of here. I don't know where, but I'm getting out of here. An ugly beginning to a story? Yes. But this is not the whole story. Rather, it's the beginning of one man's odyssey to a place as far removed from the perils of the city as, well, as far as heaven is from hell. We'll return in a moment for the first act of tonight's crisis tale. I was saying. The last thing I remember was falling toward the street when they hit me on the back of my head. And then the lights went out. Then the first thing I remember after that was opening my eyes very slowly and carefully and, and seeing the tops of trees flashing along against a bright blue sky and feeling and hearing the sound of a car. I was in a car. They were taking me somewhere. It wasn't enough to rob me and hit me. Now they were kidnapping me. I, I struggled to sit up. Well, hello there. How do you feel? Well, where where are you taking me? Hey, take it easy. What do you want from me? You've got my money. What more do you think I've got? No, no, you're mixed up. I'm the fellow that saw you staggering along the road, stopped to pick you up, you know, back outside the city. Remember? No, I, I guess you don't. Yeah. Now, let me, let me have a look at you. Yeah. Now, you're not the one... In the jacket by the bus stop. <laughs> I don't know who you mean, but you know, I picked you up back just outside the city. You mumbled something about being sick of living there, and then you went to sleep. So I just drove along all night long. You picked me up? Mm-hmm. Uh, how's your head feel? It's, uh... Huh. That's, that's funny. It, it aches, but not as badly as I expected. Say, there's a, a bandage on the back of my neck. Don't tell me you don't remember getting bandaged. No. I don't remember any of what you're telling me. Walking along a road, getting in this truck, anything. Well, you do remember your name. <laughs> yes, I remember that all right. Martin Geyer. Well, pleased to meet you, Martin. I'm Mac. Mac. That's right. Well, I guess I owe you a thousand thanks. Ah, that's okay. You know, I was glad to have the company. I make this run every night. Well, I... I couldn't have been much company, sleeping all the night through. Uh, where are we, anyway? Well, we're almost at the end of the run. A little town called Pleasantville. Ever been there? Pleasantville? Huh. No? Uh, it seems like I've heard of it somewhere. Well, it's, it's a lot different from the life in the city. Well, then that's for me. I've had it. Mm. 
At the time, I didn't even give a thought to the responsibilities I was leaving behind. All I wanted was to get away, get out. As the truck turned off the highway and down a secondary road, I, I suddenly began to feel free and excited, like a kid playing hooky for the first time. Well, this is about as far as I go. Pleasantville's just around that bend in the road. You think you can make it? Yeah, I think I can. Well, let me thank you for your kindness, Mac. Uh, can I offer you a... Oh, I forgot I haven't got a farthing. Not even a credit card or a driver's license or a thing. That's okay. Glad I saw you. You go on into Pleasantville. Uh, but look, I, I don't... Hey, anyone wants to know where you came from, you just tell them that you rode in here with Mac. I got out and watched as the car moved away. No money. No identification. What was I going to do in a strange town without knowing a soul? A man my age? It was crazy. Still... I had this feeling of adventure about it. And I thought, well, maybe I can write something about this. Peddle an article on it. Yes. Sure. I started walking around the bend in the road. And there it was. Pleasantville. The main street, as I assumed it was, widened a little and headed off toward a grove of trees and a hillside in the distance. On either side of the street, there were stores and buildings, and most of them old. Up near where I was at this end of the town, big shade trees with gnarled trunks nearly touched together in arches over the street. Sidewalks began, and I stood for a minute and drank it all in. Why, it could have come off the cover of a Saturday evening post. Close by was City Hall, or, or maybe the courthouse. Anyway, it was a fine old structure with... Doric columns and a green front lawn. Right next to it, a hardware store. And across the street, a five and dime, a ladies' millinery shop, and a shoe repair place. And then on my side of the street, a bookshop, a cleaner's, and a pet store. Across the street, a little hotel, a cafe, a jeweler's, and a bakery. There wasn't much doing. A few kids on bicycles went past, a couple cars, older models pickup truck or two. So, this was Pleasantville. Well, they got the name right. It looked pleasant, not exciting or relaxing or stylish or any of those other adjectives they like to use in ads for new shopping centers these days. Just pleasant. One thing, though, I suddenly began to realize I was thirsty. Yes, and hungry. I guess it was natural. I hadn't eaten a thing or had a sip of water even since last night. And realizing that, I was suddenly hungry as a wolf. And wouldn't you know, at that precise instant, I began to detect the unmistakable aroma of roast beef. It came down the street like an invisible tidal wave, and it engulfed me and made my mouth water. And I had instant memories of my mother proudly carrying a big, brown, steamy roast of beef into our dining room from the kitchen and seeing whole roasted potatoes and carrots and sprigs of parsley tucked in all around it. Eh, it's funny what a smell can do to your memory. Where was that coming from? Julia, lunchtime. Then I knew. There was an old, a fine old house set back from the street, trees all around it. And a woman had come out on the veranda and was calling lunch. <laughs> lunch? Was it noon already? I checked my wrist. A pale strip of skin showed where my watch used to be. <laughs> they got that, too. Julia, lunch! I realized I was standing there, staring. I figured I'd walk on past the house. The woman saw me and smiled and nodded. There's a forgotten nice city for you, smiling at a stranger. In this city, you'd be asking for trouble if you even stopped. Uh, uh, beg pardon? Julia, lunch is on the table. Oh, I expect she's got a customer. Did you notice as you went by the bookshop? Uh, no. No, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't. You see, I, I don't... Well, you know, girls, they get talking and forget everything. I 
suppose I'm the same way. Ah, you see, it was a lovely day. She surely had me mistaken for someone she knew. Yet she seemed so, well, familiar. Oh, I'm always doing that. Forgetting someone I've met, and then they think I'm rude for not recognizing them. I must have known her from somewhere. Say, you wouldn't mind just walking back to the bookshop, would you? Why? Uh, no. Well, she probably couldn't hear me. Uh, sure, yeah, I- I'll be glad to. Oh, never mind, never mind. Here she comes. I turned around and saw a young woman coming down the sidewalk from the bookstore. She wore a trimly tailored brown suit with a frilly blouse and horn-rimmed glasses. Her hair was chestnut, and she wore it long. I'd have known the two were mother and daughter. I'm sorry, Mama. I was all wrapped up in a big discussion with Mr. Laycock about Sinclair Lewis. Oh, hello. Hello. I almost had to send word to you by this nice man. You work in that bookstore back there? Yes. Do you like books? Well, uh, some books, yes. I love them. They're like friends. Oh, uh... Oh, look, I, I'm delaying your lunch. Oh, well, nice to see you. Yes, uh, uh, nice to see you, too. Oh, I just noticed you hurt yourself. Oh, it's all right. You better get in and eat. Have you had your lunch? Uh, what? She means you. Have you had lunch? Well, uh, no. Well, come on. He hasn't, Mama. Oh, no, I, I couldn't. I... Oh, good. I'll set another place. A writer... My, we're honored. What have you written, Mr. Geyer? Oh, uh, articles mostly, for magazines. I have had a couple of short stories published. That's wonderful. Oh, nothing very great, really. More roast beef? Oh, no, thanks. Oh, but uh, mm, it was delicious. I don't know when I've enjoyed a meal so much. Uh, My mother used to fix it just that way. And when I came walking down the street and smelled your roast beef cooking, uh, I'll have to admit I nearly passed out from hunger. Well, I shouldn't wonder after that terrible experience in the city. Well, anyway, now you're here in Pleasantville. Yes, but for how long? I I don't know. My money is gone. I Oh, don't let that worry you. Well, I'll have to find something to do here. Julia, what about the bookstore? Of course, how perfect. You could work with me at the shop. Yes, imagine... A writer, a real writer working in the bookshop. What, with Mr. Lewis coming at all? That's right. You'll have so much in common. Oh, of course, you may already know him. Uh, Who's that? Mr. Lewis, Sinclair Lewis. Oh, oh, yes, yes, I'm a great fan of his. I was having a kind of discussion with Mr. Laycock about him. I said I thought Main Street was much more true to life than Elmer Gantry, and he said I was sheltered, or I'd know there was as much truth in Elmer Gantry as there was in Main Street. Uh, just, Just a minute. Did you say... I thought I understood your mother to say that Mr. Lewis is coming. I did, and he is, next week. Sinclair Lewis? Yes, isn't it exciting? He's going to autograph copies of his books all day long in our shop. Uh, Mrs. Wynn, uh, Julia, you surely mean someone other than Sinclair Lewis. Uh, Sinclair Lewis is dead. Uh, He's been dead, oh, a good 25 years. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's correct. (laughs) Have some more roast beef, won't you, Mr. Geyer? Of course, it was just a misunderstanding. People in a small, out-of-the-way town. But it didn't seem to faze Mrs. Wynne or her daughter, Julia, when I tried to make them believe that Sinclair Lewis, whom they were expecting to show up for an autograph party in the bookshop, had been dead more than a quarter of a century. And we spoke no more of it, and I expressed an interest in seeing more of Pleasantville. So while Julia went back to her books, Mrs. Wynne escorted me to her friend, Mr. Scott, who owned a drugstore. Well, now, let me take a look under that bandage now, Mr. Geyer. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you can do without it now. Oh? It's healing okay, is it? Huh? Yeah, good as new. Well, can I get you anything today, Mrs. Wynn? No, no, I think I'll just visit the frock shop and then go on back home. Oh, I don't know how to thank you, Mrs. Wynn. Well, you're more than welcome. Uh, perhaps the local bank could help me get some funds transferred from my account in the city. Well, if it would make you happier... And if you're hungry again about supper time, it's chowder and cheese sandwiches. Good day, Mr. Scott. Mrs. Wynn? Mr. Guy? Uh, chowder and cheese sandwiches? That's right. About 6.30. Yeah. A marvelous woman. Uh, is her husband... Uh, uh, Mr. Wynn? I don't know him. I don't believe he lives in Pleasantville. Oh? 
I, I see. Well, say, this is a nice drugstore you have here, Mr. Scott. Uh, sort of the way I remember them. Yep. Say, do you uh, care for cherry phosphate? A what? Did you say cherry phosphate? Or lime phosphate. You care for them? I haven't had a phosphated... Why, not since I was a kid in knee breeches. Well, we make a pretty good phosphate here in Pleasantville. It was too much for coincidence. Too many clues. Too many little hints to ignore. There was something strange about Pleasantville. Before I made any more plans, I determined to find out what it was. I set off on a walk through town. As I walked, I made notes. Up the side streets, peering in windows, watching people, feeling the calm, unhurried atmosphere of a small American town. It was seeping into my bones, and I walked slower. Somewhere, a magnolia was in bloom. And on another street, I swear I smelled honeysuckle and orange blossom. But I kept making notes, and the town defied me to unravel its secret. I knew what I was looking for, though, and I covered every inch of every street in Pleasantville before I finally came back to the street where I started, Main Street. And that reminded me of Sinclair Lewis, which reminded me of Julia in the bookshop. I went back there just at dusk, and went in the door. All right, Mr. Geyer. There's some time to help me close up. Julie, can you, uh, can you take a minute to, to talk to me? Why, sure. I've just been for a walk all over town, and I've taken some notes, Julie, on things I don't understand. Just like a writer. Well, tell me what you don't understand. Well, for openers, uh, how about leveling with me about Sinclair Lewis? Surely you knew he couldn't possibly be here to autograph his books. But he will be here. What makes you think so? Well, he told me so when he was here last time. He told you so? Yes. Julia, somewhere in this lovely little shop, you must have a, a world almanac or an encyclopedia. Now, either one would show you that Sinclair Lewis died back in you know, either 1951 or, or 1952. I don't remember which. What else don't you understand, Mr. Geyer? All right. This town doesn't have a real estate office, does it? Why, no, I guess it has. Or a doctor's office. Here, here, let me look at my list. Or a hospital. Or a clinic. Or an undertaker. You really did make a list, didn't you? And there's no fire station here? Or even a police station? Now, what happens if you get sick? Or your house catches fire? Or you need a policeman? And, and Mr. Scott makes cherry phosphates? And your mother reminds me of, of my mother. And this whole town is part of another time, another age. It's where America must have gone to. This bookshop. Where do you keep the cheap, violent, bloodthirsty trash they print nowadays? Eh? And where's the erotica? Where are the porno novels? We don't have things like that. No. No, I didn't think you would. But tell me then, Julie. Tell me. Where are the churches? There is not a single church in Pleasantville. Why don't we walk on home? Come on, Mr. Geyer. Well, aren't you going to lock up? No, you see... No? Don't tell me. There are no locks in Pleasantville. Now you're starting to understand. Come on, let's walk. Isn't it a lovely evening? Yes. Yes, it is a lovely evening. You'll learn to love it here, the same as we all learned. We all lived in the city, Mr. Geyer, for a while. Then we were able to come back here. I see. I, I mean, I think I see. Julie, who is Mac? Did Mac bring you here? Yes. Did he bring your mother here, too? Yes, we both came at the same time. Why? Was it an accident? Car crash? It doesn't really matter now. And your father? He'll be here one of these days. Ah. Ah! 
now you know. Now I know, of course. <clears throat> when that kid hit me, that's what did it. He killed me. But I'm not dead at all. No, none of us are. Then this is... Heaven? Not yet. We all have a final destination. But until then, we live in Pleasantville. Of course. And we don't need firemen or policemen or undertakers or hospitals. And we trade deeds, not money. But the churches. Where are the churches? Only back on Earth. Only back in the city, where there's division and bigotry and persecution. All of that was man's way. But here in Pleasantville, there's only one way. Now. Now I know. Oh, look, here we are. We're home. Aren't you coming in for supper? Well, I, I don't know. Julie, I, I, I don't know. I feel suddenly a, a, as if I'm slipping back. But you can't. Oh, I, I don't want to go. Huh. Julie, help me. Mr. Geyer, don't go back. I, I don't want to leave. I, I don't want to leave, Julie. Julie! Uh, Julie. Julia. By golly, he's breathing. What's that he say? Julia. Hey, fella. You're going to be okay. Don't let me go. Can you hear me? You're going to live. You don't know how lucky you are. too brief a time, Martin Geyer rediscovered the things he had loved and lost. But even in the dismay of finding he had been called back to life in the city, he now has the assurance that somewhere for him again will be a visit to Pleasantville. I'll be back in a minute with the names of our players and a word about next week's program. Pleasantville. Featured Paul Herlinger as Martin Geyer with Leslie Ann Dugan, Pat French, Tony Karloff, Sam Graziano, and Jay Green. Sound by Jeff Thompson. Engineering by Carney Barton. Crisis is recorded at Audio Recording Incorporated. This is your writer-director, Jim French, inviting you to be with us next week for Crisis. Radio Network presents Crisis. Well, it's ten o'clock. Maybe it's over. Maybe. You know, I was thinking someone could jolly well write this up, you know. Make a mystery on out of it. I, you could. Ah, uh, I write the news, not murder mysteries. There's plenty enough to keep me busy just rewriting the war dispatches. Three senseless killings. Bang, bang, bang. Yes, and by three of the country's most honorable citizens. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. And all between nine and ten o'clock. Fantastic. It's more than that, Denny. It's diabolical. I don't think the Yard has ever faced anything like it. Isom? Sir? Well, it's got me beat. Who's this? Uh, my nephew, sir. Dennis Cochran. He's a news writer for the BBC. Denny, may I present Inspector Burroughs? Now, what the devil is he doing here? Uh, look, I'm terribly sorry. Are you on some official business, sir? Uh, no, sir. He's just off duty, Inspector. Stop by for just a moment. I see. I'm terribly sorry, Inspector. I was just leaving. Uh, good night, Uncle Aubrey. Inspector. Good night, Denny. You needn't worry about the lad, Inspector. I'm not worried about him. I'm worried about this. Number four. Number four. Captain John MacDonald, RAF, taken into custody after confessing to choking of Andrew Marble, a theater usher at Harmon Theater, High Street, just past 2100 hours, 7th of August, 1941. An usher? An usher. A total stranger. Is he dead? Well, thank God, no. Barely alive. He was 72 years old. And who is this MacDonald? An air ace. RFC, Victoria Cross. Spitfire pilot. What in heaven's name is going on, sir? I saw we've got something unspeakably evil on our hands. Monday night, Marion Hastings, a member of parliament, beats his chauffeur to death. Confesses. No apparent motive. 
Tuesday night, Colonel Trowbridge shoots two British sailors in the Charing Cross station. Last night, this uh, Adrian Kendall tries to kill a fellow doctor at Victoria Memorial Hospital. Again, no motive. And now tonight. Yes. And the way it's going, there'll be another one tomorrow night, and the next night, and the next, until we can anticipate them and stop it. They've got to be linked. Well, of course they're linked. Four respectable men, officers, director of a hospital, an MP, all go berserk and... Look here, Isom. I'm relieving you of all other duty. I can't spare many men, but take those you need and find the pattern before London loses her mind. <laughs> London CID, the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Metropolitan Police, is better known as Scotland Yard. Its exploits in crime detection are legendary. But one of the most challenging mysteries ever handled by Scotland Yard is also one of its least known cases. Muffled by wartime secrecy and suppressed for more than 30 years afterward, it ranks in the forefront among dramas of suspense in the annals of police work. And it enshrines as a legend in itself the dogged determination of one policeman who refused to give up, even in the face of mounting frustration and bafflement. It took the stubbornness of Homicide Sergeant Aubrey Isom of the London Metropolitan Police to unravel the case known in the files as number 88915. Tonight, we turn back the calendar to August 1941 as Crisis presents Clockwork. And now, Act One of Clockwork. Now see here, Inspector Burrows. As chairman for the London Newspaper Alliance, we are perfectly willing to keep mom on war secrets. But how much longer do you expect us to withhold these killings? I'm sorry, Lord Honesty, I don't know. When will you know? I can't say, my lord. But it mustn't get into print for the sake of morale. You have a lower opinion of London's morale than I have. If we could take the Brits, we could take four senseless murders, I should think. It's the circumstances of the cases, my lord. Well, are you making any headway? I'm sure we shall be. Who have you got on it? How many men? Well, actually, one of my best men. One? Four restless assaults by men who were utterly respectable. Three dead men. Four. Four? The usher, Andrew Marble. When did he die? Late last night. He never regained consciousness. See here, Burroughs. Doesn't it strike you there's a pattern to all this? It's no coincidence. All the attacks were utterly unprovoked. All done by respectable men, not thugs. If you ask me, this is the work of some organization. It's planned. It's a conspiracy. Could be subversives. This has gone beyond coincidence. We have a better chance of solving it in secrecy, my lord. Well, very well. But I warn you, Inspector, one more of these and the Sentinel will blow it onto the front page. And so on the rest of the papers. I beg you not to, sir. In the public interest. Public interest? Don't you think it's in the public interest to be informed there's a, a curse creeping over England's finest men? Good day, sir. Good day, Lord Hardesty. Main Grove. Yes, Mr. Burrows. Get me Sergeant Isom. Sergeant Isom is interrogating a suspect, sir. I don't think he wants to be disturbed. No. Oh. All right. Have him see me directly he's through. Yes, sir. Captain MacDonald, please, once more. What more can I tell you? I, I confess. Just go back over the evening. All right. I, I got the bus up from the fighter base in Sussex. Uh, Red Cross had got me a ticket to the show at the Harmon. Um, yes, I got off at Slow Street, walked up Knightsbridge looking for a taxi... I couldn't get one. Finally, I, I took a bus at Hyde Park and rode to Piccadilly Circus. I, I was there early. Um, finally, the doors opened and I, I went in. I sat down. I saw the show. I was just leaving the theater when... Yes? Well, I tell you, Sergeant, the man I choked was no usher. Who do you think he was? I, I don't know. I, I can't remember. You remember choking the man? No. What's the next thing you remember? Well, people all around me pulling me back from this... Uh, this pitiful old white-haired man lying on the floor of the lobby. Had you ever seen the man before? No. 
Did he say anything to provoke you, to make you want to kill him? No, I, I don't remember. Look, I've confessed. I've told you the whole bloody story three times. Think, Captain. I want to know every single thing that led up to the assault. And I've told you. That's, that's all a blank. All right. That will be all for now. Captain MacDonald is ready to return to his cell. My God, Sergeant, I, I didn't want to kill him. Not, not an old man. I, I didn't mean to do it. I, I don't even know why I did it. Come on, come on. Sergeant Isom, you're to see Inspector Burroughs right away. Oh, yes, indeed. Come. He wanted to see me, Inspector. Yes. None other than Peter Lord Hardesty called on me this morning to demand we solve the clockwork killings or he'll run the whole damn thing in his papers. Clockwork killings? Yes. Fetching name, isn't it? His idea. Get him a thousand new readers at least. Oh, I hope we can keep it out of the papers, sir. Well, that's what I'm trying to do. But I can't hold him off much longer. How did you do with Captain MacDonald? Well, not very well, I'm afraid. I don't have much experience with a case where we have a confessed killer but no motive, let alone three others just like it. Have you talked with the rest of them? Hastings, Colonel Trowbridge, Kent Hill. Yes, sir. I did them in the order of the uh, case's chronology. I thought that way I might sense some kind of continuity. Well, did you? Pardon me, did I what, sir? Sense some kind of continuity? Uh, no, sir. Come on, Uncle Aubrey, what's been going on? I shouldn't talk about it, Denny. I know that's right. I just thought maybe I could help. Can you have a sandwich with me? I'm so keen to know the latest. Uh, I brought my lunch. Your Aunt Amelia puts up my lunch. I'll eat with you, though. Good. Oh, can you wait just a moment? I'll only be a second. I want to see if I can get a bit of tobacco. Hello, Denny boy. Mr. Tufts, meet my uncle, Aubrey Isom. Pleased to meet you, Miss Isom. My pleasure. Do you have any Players Navy cut? I wish I did. Could sell them and retire. Nothing till Wednesday. I'll be out of the habit by then. Only some pipe tobacco. Ever roll your own? <laughs> Not me. I couldn't get the hang of it. Well, that's all I came for. I'll see you later, Mr. Tufts. Cheerio. Pleasure meeting you, Mr. Isom. Uh, Isom. Uh, right. Uh, come again. <laughs> How about the park? Fine with me. Uncle? Yes, what? Candidly, what do you think? I don't know what to think. But surely you must have a theory. Not even that, Denny. Don't you think it's a conspiracy? Conspiracy? Well? You mean, don't I think that a member of Parliament and an army colonel, a surgeon and an RAF pilot all decided to kill perfectly innocent people in two cases, people who are perfect strangers to them? You make it sound like a silly idea. It is silly. There was no conspiracy. So far as we know, there was no connection between any of the four suspects. No connection between them, no motive for the attacks... Each man insists he has no memory of the actual assault. It's crazy. But there has to be some connection. I know that. Look, I, I can't take time to eat with you. I'm going back to the yard. But, Uncle... Well, stop round tonight when you're through. We'll talk then. Seven o'clock, Isom. Sir? I said it's seven o'clock. Yes, sir. Well? Sir? Are you making any headway? I don't know yet, Inspector Burroughs. Well, what are all those papers on your desk? These? Well, they're charts, you see. I've plotted the movements of our four assailants for the eight hours immediately prior to the killings. Good. What have you come up with? Not much, I'm afraid. You see here on Mr. Hastings' case, beginning at two in the afternoon. Eh? What about two in the afternoon? He was at his club having lunch. Hmm. No question about that part. Three good witnesses... He stayed there until just before three. Then his chauffeur drove him to an address on Fleet Street. See, just here. Now, what did he do on Fleet Street? Mr. Hastings has an interest in the journal, I believe. He stopped off to see the publisher. 
Not a very suspicious trail so far, is it? No, sir, it isn't. Well, then from the journal, he decided to walk a bit, he said. He did little casual shopping, and what with one thing and another, it was close to six when he rang up for his car. Where did he go? To his flat in Whitesley. There he changed for dinner, spent a quarter of an hour on the phone with Mrs. Hastings, who was at the family home in Leeds, when he had Fuller, his driver, take him to Casim's for dinner. He dined with his nephew and three other fellows from his nephew's regiment. They parted around nine o'clock. Fuller drove Mr. Hastings back to his flat, arriving just about 9.30. Yes? Well, then, what about the killing? Why did Hastings beat his poor chauffeur to death? We don't know yet. Now, what did Hastings have to say? What was his alibi? Nothing. He doesn't remember a thing from 9.30 on until he saw Fuller lying at his feet dead. In the garage. That's right. Brained with a spanner. Um, tire iron, actually. The boot of the car was open, and Mr. Hastings said he found himself with a tire iron in his hand. Well, what does this give us? Well, actually, not much all by itself. But as I developed charts for the other three killings, I hoped to find some incident that would be common to all four cases. You know, such as... Well, I don't know exactly. What about Colonel Trowbridge? Oh, Trowbridge is right over here. Now, it happens Colonel Trowbridge had been inspecting anti-aircraft emplacements all afternoon with a driver from the Home Guard and a sergeant from Billingsgate Barracks. All day? Right up to evening mess, which they took at a mobile canteen down by Limehouse. And? But when they were through eating, it was dark out. Trowbridge sat in the lorry, making up his reports of the day's activities. Then he dismissed the driver, and around nine o'clock, he was at Charing Cross Station. A few minutes later, according to reliable witnesses, Colonel Trowbridge whipped out his Wembley Vickers and fired at two sailors from the HMS Reliant, killing one and seriously wounding the other, who died that night. And what does Trowbridge say for himself? The last thing he remembers is hearing Big Ben strike the hour. Well, there must have been plenty of witnesses to that one. Oh, there were, sir. They all say the same thing. They saw Colonel Trowbridge pull out his gun as if he were looking for someone, and when he spotted the sailors, he opened fire. Incredible. Now, in the case of Wednesday's assault at Victoria Hospital, where the victim survived, Sir Adrian Kemphill attacked the victim, Dr. Colin McNair, with a scalpel. He suffered several facial lacerations, but he'll recover. And he gave us precious little to go on. It seems the two of them were completing an operation and were scrubbing up afterward, just listening to the radio. Dr. McNair had got into his clothes first when all of a sudden Dr. Kemphill looked at him strangely, as Dr. McNair remembered, rushed out of the room and came back a moment later brandishing a scalpel and went right at him. But what did he say? Kemphill must have said something. McNair says not. He said Kemphill just cursed at him and attacked him. No provocation whatsoever. No, that's not right. There had to be provocation of some kind in each case. Oh, but what about the poor old Usher that pilot killed? What did he do to provoke his own murder? We don't know. The pilot had been in London a few hours, hadn't much time, just a pass and a ticket to a show. Just about nine o'clock, the show let out, and he was leaving the lobby when he suddenly saw the old Usher and went blank. But he did say something I thought rather curious, sir. Yes? Yeah. Captain McDonald said... Now, well, where is it? Here. The man I choked was no usher. How's that? Quote. The man I choked was no usher. What the devil? Now, I've checked on Mr. Marble very thoroughly. He was a quiet, common, ordinary sort of person. Never been in any kind of row. No reason at all for McDonald to say he was no usher. Well, who the devil did he think Marble was? He doesn't know who he thought he was. But whoever he thought the old man really was, he felt justified in killing him with his bare hands. Madness. Exactly, sir. Sheer madness. I'm looking on that principle, sir, that the four attackers were out of their minds at the time of each incident. And all within minutes of the same time each night? Why? I don't know that. And yet, I know that's a key to this whole thing. But we'll get at it, sir, I think. Uncle? Oh, Denny. Is 
Is it all right? Uh, I think the inspector's gone home. Come on, and close the door. Have you got anything yet tonight? I mean, another clockwork killing? I'm holding my breath. It's just 9.45. If it keeps the pattern, we ought to be hearing about it just now. Hmm. Well, and how's the war going? Well, you can hear for yourself. Jerry's coming over again. I... They must have found out we've a few buildings still standing. Uh, what are you doing? Making charts? Oh, just a very routine procedure. Oh, let me see. May I? Hmm. Uh, what's all this? Uh, a list of names? Friends of the killers. Why? To see if somewhere there's one person they all knew. Oh, uh, I see. But there isn't. Not so far, anyway. Then what's this list? Personal habits. Hmm. Well, they all smoke and drink. The sinful lot. Some of them wager. Some of them don't. One or two of them are, uh, <clears throat> indiscreet. Look here, Denny. You are my nephew and all that, but, but I shouldn't I be... know one thing that they all have in common. Eh? Oh, you've no doubt seen it yourself. What? What are you talking about? Oh, well, the people they killed, the victims. Well, what about them? Well, aren't they all men in uniform of some kind? Uniform? Well, the MP Hastings killed his chauffeur. The colonel killed two sailors. The pilot killed a nasher. Uh-huh. You've forgotten Dr. McNair. McNair? The intended victim of our third suspect, Sir Adrian Campbell. He's a civilian. Oh, to be sure. Well, it's just a notion. I don't know what it would prove anyway, even if all the victims were in uniform. Half of England's in some kind of uniform these days. Uncle... Would you humor me on something? Check on this Dr. McNair, would you? Check on him? Check on what? Uh, can't you verify if he was wearing a uniform Wednesday night? Oh, I could. Then, would you? <sighs> Where's that number? Uh, he, he's still in hospital? Right there at Victoria. Uh, here it is. Victoria Hospital. This is Sergeant Isom of the Metropolitan Police. I'm inquiring about Dr. McNair. Well, that's good news. I, I don't suppose you could tell me what Dr. McNair was wearing Wednesday when the assault took place. No, I didn't think so. No, nothing important. What? Yes, yes, I'll wait. She's gone to fetch the charwoman who found him. It seems to me he'd have to be in some kind of a uniform to conform to the pattern. You can't assume a pattern with only four incidents, Denny. There was absolutely no connection among the victims. None of them could have been acquainted with any of the others. Now the parallel, when we find it, will be with... Uh, hello? Yes, this is Sergeant Isom at Scotland Yard. Who is this, please? Mrs. Carrick. Very good. Mrs. Carrick... Can you tell me what Dr. McNair was wearing at the time he was attacked night before last? You're quite sure? No, thanks very much. Thank you. Good night. How could we have missed that? Uh, what are you looking for, Uncle? Wait. Ah. Well, this is embarrassing. What is it? Plain as the nose on my face. What? Dr. McNair acts as chief surgeon for the Salvation Army. When he got out of his operating gown, he changed into the uniform of an officer in the Salvation Army and got attacked. Homicide, Sergeant Isom. Yes, go on. Yes, I see. When was this, sir? I see. Just wait where you are, sir. We'll be there directly. Cracky. Cracky, it's number five, isn't it? Uncle? Yes. Hello, this is Sergeant Isom. Connect me with Inspector Burroughs at his home, will you? Now wait. Who was it this time, Uncle? Then be quiet. Oh, this is incredible. Five in a row. I can't believe it. Who did it this time? Churchill? Denny. Uh, uh, hello. Inspector... 
I'm terribly sorry to bother you. We've just had another. Yes, sir. The suspect himself just telephoned, and seeing that you already know him, I felt sure you'd want to join me at his home. It's that publisher, Lord Hardesty. He says he thinks he's just killed his air raid warden. I presume this is the weapon, my lord. I, uh, I assume so. You assume so? I told you, Inspector, my mind is a complete blank about it. But you admit shooting the man. Well, I, I must have shot him. But I don't know why. You don't know why you shot him? Well, it, it must have been exactly the same way we're s- with Sir Adrian and Hastings. Poor devils. Why? Why? Would you like to call your barrister? No. <sighs> No, no, I I know the law, Inspector. Before I bought the Sentinel, I was in practice myself. Yes, I I know the law. But I don't know myself. <clears throat> Inspector. Oh, yes. Lord Hardesty, this is Sergeant Isom. I placed him in charge of these... Uh... Clockwork killings. That's the name I gave them myself. Yes, my lord. Rather a good name for them, too, I should think. I wonder if you could give me a bit of information now. What, uh, whatever I can, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Well, first, could you tell me what you did today since about noon? Since noon? Isom, that won't be necessary. Lord Hardesty's part in this has already been established. I know that, Inspector. But neither he nor we seem to know why he shot the man. Well, at, at, at noon, I, I was having lunch with my editor-in-chief at Pearson. And that lasted until, uh, well, I should say one or one fifteen. I see. And then what, sir? Well, I, I went back to my office. Y- yes, I, I went back and worked on an editorial for Sunday's edition. Saw half a dozen people. Well, I took a tour through the plant, listened to a hundred or so gripes from the pressmen. A very ordinary kind of day. Four o'clock had my tea in my office with my daughter. She's an ambulance driver, you know. Oh, that's very nice. Came home about six, and my wife and I dined quietly, alone. You had no callers this evening? None, until poor Jenkins. The air raid warden? Yes. Why did he call on you? I I don't know. Perhaps the light was showing. I might not have had my blackout curtains properly drawn. Now, tell me everything you can remember about the shooting. That's just it. My mind's a blank. Well, let's see. You telephoned Scotland Yard at precisely 9.52 p.m. tonight. So the shooting took place sometime before that. Do you remember when? No. What about 9.30? Do you remember doing anything at 9.30? No. 9.15? 9.15. Hmm, 9.15. Well, I... I'd just finished listening into the news. Ah, good. Do you remember anything in the news, especially? Well, it was all bad as usual. Any particular dispatch that affected you? No. What were you listening to just before the news? Nothing. I only turned on the radio set at nine to get the news. Oh, my wife has a light program on upstairs in her sitting room. But I can't stand their plays. They're dreadful. Hmm. Well, let's see. I didn't notice your butler tonight. No, oh, Friday's his night off. Oh, then when the air raid warden called, who answered the door? I did. Ah, then you do remember answering the door. Yes. Yes, I... I did answer the door. And there he stood, in his uniform. Sir? Somehow I, I knew he'd come. And so I was waiting for him with a gun. Who? Who did you think he was? I, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, merciful heaven. What's gone wrong with me? And now we continue with Clockwork. Good morning, Isom. Oh, good morning, Inspector. You've been up all night. 
Well, I found I couldn't sleep, so... Yes, I dare say. And what are you doing on the blackboard? Well, my my notes overflowed my desk. Now, what's this? These are the things that each case had in common with the rest. You see, first, none of the suspects could explain why they attacked their victims. None of them had any obvious motive at all. And all of the assailants claimed they went blank during the actual assaults. Hmm. They all occurred shortly past 9 p.m. Curious, isn't it, sir? And then there's the matter of the assailants themselves. None were the criminal type, never had any sign of a violent nature, any of them. Yes, yes, we know all that. And in checking their stories, we find that each one of them evidently thought he was attacking some hostile person, an enemy, perhaps. And every single victim wore some kind of uniform. I think that may be most crucial. We had a chauffeur, two sailors, a doctor wearing a Salvation Army costume, an usher, and now an air raid warden with a helmet and armband. Well, not much of a uniform. Ah, but enough to symbolize a uniform in the mind of a disturbed person. Well, then you think Lord Hardesty was out of his head? In a manner of speaking, yes, sir. I think all of them were. We've just got to find out what put him that way. Excuse me, Inspector. Have you seen the morning sentinel? No, not yet, sir. Thank you. Oh, no. Oh, no. What is it? They've broken the story. All the papers will have it now. May I? Hmm. Scandal. Nightly killings revealed. Aristocrats involved. Each night this week, a mysterious killing has taken place in London to the hands of respected, well-known men. Now, good Lord, I some read it to yourself later. Now, this tears it. Have we no progress to report? Well, sir, you know, I'm a great believer in planting seeds. I think the subconscious mind can work out solutions to problems all by itself sometimes, without so much sweat and strain from the conscious mind. It will just plant the right seeds, so to speak. Now, it's my theory that when you've given the subconscious all the facts, those seeds will start to grow. Oh, bother your theories. We're being made to look utter asses, and you stand there droning on about your theories. Sorry, sir. Isom, there must not be another killing. Understand? I do, sir. Oh, yes, I do. Obviously, there's some connection between them. Obviously, there's a pattern. Obviously, there's some purpose. Find it. Find it. Mr. Hastings, pleased to see you. Yes, yes. Oh, oh hello, Isom. Good morning, Mr. Hastings. How have you been? Wretched. I... I can't sleep. Every time I close my eyes, I see Fuller lying there in the garage. Yes, yes, I suppose you would. I said, believe me, I didn't mean to do it. I still don't know why I did it. Yes, sir. Well, that's the reason I'm here, you see. I don't believe you meant to do it either. You, you don't? No. And I don't believe any of the rest of them meant to kill either. The rest of them? Oh, you haven't heard, have you? You killed your chauffeur Monday night, and every night this week there's been another killing like yours. Respectable men suddenly going crackers and waking up to find they've killed an innocent man. You mean, good Lord. We've got an epidemic is what we've got. Now, Mr. Hastings, I want you to think. I want you to tell me every single thing you did, every one you met, every place you went... For the week before last Monday. But I I already told you. I know, but I want to hear it again. All right, I'll I'll try. Oh, I I hate to ask, but would you happen to have a smoke? Just my old pipe. It's all right. I forgot to have my wife bring me my cigarettes. Yes, sir. Now, I want you to make a list for me of every person you saw and talked to, every place you went... Everything you did, hour by hour, dating back to a week before the Monday night in question. Here. I brought you some paper and pencils. Very well. I'll do what I can. But what are you after, Sergeant? What are you looking for? I don't know, Mr. Hastings. I honestly don't know. 
I don't know why you've come out here to the stockade, Sergeant. I confess to what I did. I don't have the slightest idea why I shot those sailors, but I did it. Momentary insanity, I suppose, but I'm guilty and I'll take my punishment like a soldier. I'm here, Colonel, because I think you're innocent. What? Oh, I know you pulled the trigger, but something took control of your mind. Something we don't know anything about. Yes. Now, I've brought this pad of paper and some pencils. I want you to think carefully of everything that happened to you for the week preceding the shooting. Everyone you met... Every place you went, down... That all of us, all who killed without reason, or like myself, tried to kill, did so uh, while utterly insane. And that's what I think too, Sir Adrian. Only I want to find out how five men could all come down with the same insanity on consecutive nights. Oh, I'm afraid there's no mystery to a medical man, Sergeant. I think you'll find that each of us, the Colonel, myself, that pilot, MacDonald... And now, Lord Hardesty, we're all under terrific pressure. And each of us had heard about the previous killings. And subconsciously, we, we realized that here would be a way to surely be relieved of our pressures by being quite literally put away. So when the pressures became unbearable, we banked out, we killed whoever seemed to be handy at the moment. And then the deed done, our mental lapse ended, and there we stood condemned by our own deeds. Yes, sir. Except it couldn't have been that way, now could it? Because if you'll recall, the news didn't break about all this until just this morning. Oh, I say. You're right. You didn't know on Wednesday night that there'd been a killing on Tuesday and Monday. But I must have. If I didn't, then then what made me want to kill Paul McNear? Because you saw him in his uniform. His uniform? Don't you remember, sir? You and he were changing out of your surgical gowns, and Dr. McNair got into his Salvation Army uniform, and that triggered you. Now we have to find out why. Nonsense. His uniform had nothing to do with anything. I think it did. Now, I know you're very busy as a doctor, but you'll be obliging me very much if you'll just take some time to carefully think back and write down every detail of your life. You know every step I took the night of the, the killing? Yes, sir, I know. But there might be just one tiny detail you've overlooked, Captain McDonald. And that might be the one thing that ties everything together. So try going back a full week. Well, I'll have to think. I brought you a pad of paper, sir. Why don't you just jot down everything you can think of? Yes, I might as well, mightn't I? I certainly have all the time in the world to think about it. Yep. No, sir, you haven't. Until we can find what's behind these killings, they're likely to keep right on happening every night, including tonight. I'm sorry, Sergeant. Lord Hardesty is too ill to talk to anyone. It's the shock of the, the incident last night. I know, Mum. That's why we aren't transferring him to jail. But I must speak with him. Well, the doctor left very specific instructions. Nurse, unless we find... What drove Lord Hardesty and all the others to commit these attacks? They'll keep right on happening. Now, I'm sure his lordship would want us to help him in every way he can. Well, I... I'll be very brief. All right, come with me. Your lord? Eh? Uh, who, who is it? It's Sergeant Isom from Scotland Yard, my lord. Uh, Isom? Oh, you... You've come for me, have you? No, sir. I just wanted to ask your help. You see, sir, I believe that all of these unprovoked killings were triggered by something that must have happened to all five of you shortly before. Where the devil have you been all day? <sighs> Collecting these, sir. Now, what is that mess? Notes, sir. And the five men. Details on everything they did leading up to the moment they each blanked out before they killed. These are much more complete than my own notes. Well, it's four o'clock. Five hours until we have another killing on our hands. I know, sir. But maybe we can prevent it. Well, I'll leave you alone. Call me in an hour, whatever you've come up with. 
What did you say, sir? I said... Oh, never mind. Well, wait a minute. Inspector. What is it? Here it is. I found it. This has to be it. Well, what have you got? Look. Look for yourself. I really have to get back, Uncle. I won't, won't be keeping you for long, Denny. And I appreciate you having this walk with me. Uh, the night air clears my head. It is getting chilly. Say, do you have any tobacco? Afraid not. I smoke the ciggies when I can get them. Oh, that's right. We're only a block from that tobacconist, though. Eh? Oh, the other day when we were going to have lunch, I stopped in there, remember? Oh, that's right. Well, lead on, Macduff. I'd like to fill my pipe. I've got a long night ahead of me. Poor Uncle. Now the word's out about the clockwork killings, I expect you're really getting it. Am I ever. It's tough on me, too, you know. I mean, all my chums at the studio know I've got a Scotland Yard detective in the family, and now they're pressing me for inside information. Yes. Well, you can tell them you haven't got any, and that'll be the truth. Uh, there's nothing you can tell me? Lad, there's nothing to tell. Oh, other than a silly theory of mine. Uh, what's the theory? Say, where's that tobacconist? Oh, 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 right here. Well, good afternoon, James. Oh, it's Denny Boy and uh, Mr... Isom. My uncle needs some pipe tobacco, Mr. Tufts. Uh, do you think he could, you could locate his blend? Well, we'll certainly try. What will you have, sir? I don't suppose you've got Squire's mixture. Squire's mixture? Let me, let me take a look. Down all out, I'm afraid. But I'll tell you what. You come back in an hour. I'm expecting a shipment in. Might be something you like just as well. An hour? Wouldn't you be closed by then? It's nearly five o'clock. Yes, we shut up at 5.30, but I'll be here. You just bang on the door and I'll let you in. And we'll see what the barge brought us, eh? Well, that's awfully nice of you. Any uncle of Denny Boy's is a friend of Tops. See you in an hour, but uh, mum's the word, eh? Oh, Mr. Isom, come in. You're sure this is all right? Uh, certainly, you're just getting a jump on tomorrow's trade, that's all. Come on in the back room, I'm just unpacking what came in. Oh, here we are. Like gold it is. Have a smell. Marvelous. What blend is it? Virginia blended with Turkish and Burmese. Burmese? Oh, my, yes. Uh, try a pinch in your pipe. Well, I, I don't want to. Go on. How are you going to tell if it's something you like and you smoke a bit of it? Well, all right. There. Uh, you have a match? Yes, thank you. Uh, now, this is apt to be milder than what you're used to. In fact, it's it's so mild you can inhale it. Uh, quite refreshing. It's quite smooth, isn't it? Oh, smooth is the word. <laughs> Good Lord, I'm a bit dizzy. It'll pass. Here, sit down. Make yourself comfortable, Mr. Isom. Huh. Thank you so much. Yeah, really, a delightful smoke. Just wish I weren't dizzy. Don't worry about that, sir. Believe me, you're going to enjoy this pipe full. More than any you've ever smoked. Yes. I do enjoy this. More than I've ever smoked. Why, it's growing a bit warm in here. Have you noticed? Yes. Stuffy. But loosen my collar. There, now. You're quite comfortable again. Isn't that right, Mr. Isom? Yes. Very comfortable. Thank you, Tufts. Thank you. I think he's quite ready now. Take your post in the front of the shop. Right. I'll sing out if anyone comes. <clears throat> Now, Sergeant Isom, take another deep puff of this marvelous tobacco. That's it. 
Inhale. Deep breath. Mm. Fine. Now, you will hear no other sound but my voice. Only my voice. Second item. You are an Englishman, and your country is at war. My country is at war. Thousands of innocent people are being killed by the Nazis. It's an outrage. You are outraged. I'm outraged. Outraged. Yes, yes, but fate has chosen you, Sergeant, to put an end to this bestial slaughter. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready for anything. Good, good. Now, Sergeant Intelligence has just reported that a suicide squad of stormtroopers has been dropped by parachute onto English soil. Stormtroopers? And they're in hiding here in London this very minute. Yes, you, Sergeant Eisen, are the only person who can recognize them and destroy them. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. Tonight, you will listen for the sound of Big Ben striking nine strokes. 9 p.m. Do you understand? 9 p.m. I understand. That will be the signal for the stormtroopers. They will be in uniform, but they will be wearing any uniforms, any uniforms at all. And when Big Ben strikes nine, they will come out and you will see one of them. When you do, what must you do? Stop them. I must stop them. There is no way to stop them except by killing them, Sergeant. This is wartime. These aliens are here to destroy us. You must destroy them first. Yes. Remember, arm yourself and be ready for Big Ben to strike nine. When it does, you will destroy the first uniformed person you encounter. But until that moment, you will have no memory of this moment. Or of hearing my voice... For the orders I've given. And when you destroy your enemy, Sergeant, you will forget having done so. It will be wiped out of your mind as if it never happened. For we must preserve security. Understood, Sergeant? Understood. Now, what are your orders? I am to arm myself. I am to listen for Big Ben to strike nine. Then I am to kill the first uniformed man I see. And then I shall forget this moment and your voice and your orders. And after I have killed my enemy, I shall forget killing him. Mm, excellent, Sergeant. Now, I shall count to ten. When I reach the number ten, you will be fully awake, fully refreshed, very satisfied and alert. And you will decide not to buy any of the tobacco you've been smoking. It is too sweet. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Well, what do you think, sir? Hmm? Well, I, I like it, but I, I think it's a bit sweet for a steady diet. You know what I mean. Well, then let me mix you something from what I've got in stock. Uh, no, actually. I, I really should be getting back. Oh, well, just as you say, sir. <coughs> Awfully kind of you. Not at all, sir. Uh, this way out, and give my regards to your nephew. I'm really thrilled you're letting me come with you, Uncle. But why are we going to Victoria Memorial Hospital? Oh, just play another one of those theories of mine, Denny. You are inscrutable. Here, you first. Oh, oh, look at the time. Five of nine. Yes. Shouldn't, uh, shouldn't you be back at the yard? I, I mean, what if there's another clockwork murder? Denny, I wish you wouldn't call them that. That's newspaper stuff. Oh, sorry, Uncle. Uh, what are you doing here? Well, it dawned on me that one very important bit in all this was Dr. McNair, the man Sir Adrian Kemble tried to kill Wednesday night. Cracky. That's right. McNair's the only survivor of the whole week of murders. And I haven't really talked to him much. Now, let's see. Excuse me. Yes? 
Uh, we're to see Dr. McNair. Ah, yes, his office is right there. First door on the left. Uh, thank you. Is he up and around already? Uh, so they told me on the phone. Still wrapped up in bandages all over his face, they said, but making his rounds nevertheless. Cracky. Hello. You'd be Dr. McNair, I believe. Uh, my name is Isom. I'm from Scotland Yard. We met, but you'd just been through quite a shock, so I doubt you'd remember. And this is my nephew, Mr. Cochran. Uh, well, uh, yes, yes, I seem to remember you, uh, Mr. Isom. How are you feeling? I, quite well, considering. I must say I admire you, Doctor, continuing on your rounds while you're all bandaged that way. Yes, yes, well, I am rather busy at the moment. Well, we won't keep you long. I just needed to ask you one or two more questions about the attempt Sir Adrian made on your life. I'd really rather forget it, if you don't mind. He, he wasn't himself. What's that, Doctor? I, I can't quite understand you. I said he wasn't himself. You see, when he saw my uniform, for some reason, he'd, he'd track me. Yes, curious. The same uniform you're wearing now. Yes, yes, the same uniform. Now, you really must excuse me. What's that? Get out of here. He would try to kill me. Help! It's nine o'clock. Good Lord, he's got a knife. Grab him, stop him. I'll cut your throat, you murderer. All right, that'll be quite enough, Isom. Stop it. Thank, thank God you killed him. The knife, Isom. Give it to me. What am I doing? The knife. Hand it to me, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Dr. McNair, please remove your bandages. Are you out of your mind? Do as I say, or I'll remove them myself. There, there. That's what you want? Yes, that's much better. Isom, you were right. I was right? You may not remember now, thanks to Dr. McNair's hypnosis, but you asked me to follow you back to the tobacconists at six o'clock this evening. I heard everything and followed you here. I... I really don't remember that. No, I see you don't. But you came to me this afternoon with your theory that since McNair was the only victim of the clockwork killings to survive, this might make him a suspect rather than a victim. And you discovered he used hypnosis on some of his patients. I'm sorry. My memory is hazy. What was that stuff you gave him to smoke, Doctor? Uh, that was a compound of a root found in New Guinea. The natives smoke it to give them the courage to kill their enemies. Good Lord. And do you remember telling me, Isom, you'd discovered each of the five gentlemen who'd struck in the evening had visited their tobacconists the same day? I... I don't know. The last few hours are just a fog. Oh, now, don't make such a tragedy of it, Sergeant. Your memory will return. Let me ask you something, Doctor. Why did you do it? Why? Oh, come, come. You're a Nazi. Indeed. And the clockwork killings, then? The start of an ingenious scheme to undermine the famous English morale. Morale? Random killings every night, perpetrated for no reason by otherwise rational, respectable figures. Figures ever higher and higher in government until eventually... Churchill. Churchill? He is addicted to cigars, you know. Filthy habit. Sign of decadence. That's right, isn't it? Adolf doesn't use the evil weed. Uncle, believe me, I had no idea what was going on at that tobacconist. You? Sir? Isom tells me that you're a news writer for the BBC. Uh, that's right, sir. Well, not one word of this is to get out. Not one single word. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Officially, the clockwork killings simply stopped. of tonight's players and a preview of next week's program after this word. Clockwork was produced at Audio Recording Incorporated in our cast were John Aylward, John Gilbert, Duncan McLean, Douglas Young, Robert O. Smith, Mark Wayne, Debbie Baker, Steve Hilliard, and Al Clark. Engineer, Connie Barton. Now this is your director, Jim French, inviting you to listen next week at this time. For crisis.
Maybe if I keep my head pressed hard enough against this train window, I'll be able to shake some sense into it. Some answers. Like why? Why am I out here in California, where I never wanted to be, with another man's thousand bucks in my pocket, heading for a rendezvous with a guy I've never seen, to do a job I never thought I'd be doing? A job of murder. I guess it goes back to my lousy luck. My losing streak. Yeah, with some guys, it's booze they can't handle. With me, it's gambling. Mr. Nile. <laughs> How nice you come to see me. Yeah, I got your invitation. I see you did. You can let go of him now, Sully. It's going to cost you where this hippo of yours tore my suit. Oh, I'll deduct it from what you owe me, Harry. Yeah, very funny. You can go now, Sully. All right, what do you want, Corio? Well, I want my money, Harry. You'll get it. You'll get it just as soon as I get it. I'm good for it. You know that. No, you're not. Not anymore. Listen, I've been one of your oldest and best customers. Oldest, yes. But Corio's as a rule, Harry, we pay when you win. You pay when you lose. I won't lie to you, Corio. My collections have been lousy lately. I'm still waiting to get paid for a divorce job I did ten months ago, and two runaways still owe me from summer. What are you going to do? Then you shouldn't gamble when you haven't got it to lose. I know it. <laughs> you will know. All right, Corio, lay it on the line. You going to make small talk all night, or do you want to spell out what you have in mind? Not well, to begin with, Nile, I don't like your attitude. You're not a cocksure private dick to me. To me, you're just a deadbeat. Look, I intend... I let you get into me for more than eight grand. You never would have got that far if I hadn't trusted you. But you betrayed me, Nile. And nobody betrays Vito Corio. Nobody. Okay, so where do we go from here? You're going to have Hippo stomp on me? What's that going to get you? Well, I'm a practical man, Harry. I could have you killed. But that wouldn't get me my money. I'll get you the money. I'll pay it back on the on the installment plan, like buying a frigid air. <laughs> Amusing, Harry. You won't be seeing $8,000 all year long. Besides, you might even be drafted. <laughs> They're talking about it. Well... I'll do the best I can. Which won't be good enough. Try me. I've tried you. You're the loser. I had a streak. That's all. Shut up, Harry. From now on, you're doing what I tell you to do. Nobody tells me. Now I'm telling you because I own you. And now I'm telling you what you're going to do. You're going to do a job for me, Harry. A job that's worthy of your uh, uh, talents. And when you've done the job, I erase the debt. I, uh... I don't think I want to work for you. You haven't got any choice. Corio, the only kind of job you'd pay eight grand for is something I won't do. Oh, you'll do it all right. It's a gun job, right? Laid out easy for you. No, Corio. You'll be saving the state of California an electric bill. California? Hey, I like it here in Chicago. The target is a very bad man, Harry. I won't kill for you. If you know him, you might even enjoy the job. I won't kill for you. Yes, you will, Harry. We'll argue and you'll shoot off your mouth at me, but it'll end up that you'll be taking the Santa Fe for Los Angeles tonight. But when you get to L.A., you'll find him and do it, just like I'm telling you. Because if you don't, now that you know I'm ordering a man's death, I'll have you killed. How's that going to get you your money back? Oh, I don't expect my money back. I expect to get something for my $8,000, and you're going to get it for me. I want this job done with some finesse. I want it never to get traced back to this organization. It's got to look accidental. You're very good at details, Harry. Hey, you're afraid of this guy. Accidental, remember? Who is he? It's all written out for you, Harry. In this envelope. Come on, take it. Open it. Well, you, you, you mean now? Now. Now read it. Memorize it. Simon Adler? Adler. Business address, Adler Importing Company, 311 West Pico Boulevard, Los Angeles. Residence, 92 Mariposa Canyon Road, Los Angeles. I, I never heard of it. What does he import? Nothing. It's a front. What he really does is he's getting control of the movie industry, the theaters. He's almost as big already as Fox West Coast. He's like an octopus, Harry. You sign up with Adler and you play the pictures he sends you. Pictures he owns. Made with actors he owns. Lousy pictures. But you either play them or some night your movie house burns down. Sounds like a good racket. 
What is it to you? Because Adler's coming east. So? Some detective you, uh... I happen to own 20 theaters in this town. What? Not in my name, but they're mine. I'm not going to bump off some racket here. Adler personally killed three people. A theater manager in Westwood, and a projectionist, and an old lady in a fire he set in Highland Park. He's nothing but a torpedo, Harry. He can't be touched by the law. I think he's too smart. Or maybe he owns someone. But he's going to be stopped. Now, what's his name? Simon Adler. Business address? Pico, uh, uh, Pico Boulevard, uh, 311 West Pico. Home address? 92 Mariposa Canyon Road. Good. Give me that paper. And this is his picture. He's tall and bald. Don't ever forget that face. I don't care how you do it. Only make it look like an accident. Now, here's another envelope. This one you keep. Tickets on the 11 o'clock train tonight. First class accommodations. The hotel you're going to stay in, also first class, with a phone in the room. I want to know how to get in touch with you. Also, a thousand bucks expense money. You, uh, you had this all made up. I was sure you'd go for it. I mean, look at it this way. Your doctor ordered you to go west for your health. (laughs) And I'm the doctor. Yeah, Corio. You're the doctor. The Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. Tonight, a special one-hour presentation of Crisis and a story of suspense and intrigue featuring Phil Harper entitled West for My Health. We continue after this brief message. Two nights ago, I'm Harry Nile, private investigator. Now I'm Harry Nile, paid assassin. Why didn't I go to the police and tell them the whole thing? Because Corio would have had me killed, and there isn't any place to hide from a guy in his organization. We go through a station marked Ontario, and it makes me think of Canada, which makes me think of just getting off one train and onto another and living in Canada for a few years, or Alaska, maybe. But I know it's no good. There's only one way to get Corio off my back, and that's to get Simon Adler off his back. Union Station, Los Angeles. It's December 31st, and I'm sweltering in my overcoat. It's sunny, and people are going around in shirt sleeves and straw hats like the middle of July. I always said anyone who lived out here was crazy. I get my bags, and I tip the red cap by peeling one of the skins off my big bankroll in my pocket. His eyes bulge up like golf balls, and I realize I've given him a 10. You've got to watch that. I don't know how long that grant has to last me or where it's going to have to take me. Taxi, mister? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Red Cap, put these bags in my truck, will you? Yes, sir. Where are you headed? Uh, the Biltmore, uh, Biltmore Hotel. Right. From the back of the yellow 1938 DeSoto, I watched the city jiggle by. Somewhere there's a place called Pico Boulevard, and somewhere along that street there's an office with a man in it. A man I have to kill. I try to keep thinking of it as an execution, thinking about the rotten racket he's in and the people he's killed. No matter how I run it over in my mind when I see myself pulling the trigger on Simon Adler, I see myself taking my place along with Adler, plunging head first into the everlasting torment of hell. In fact, I can almost smell the sulfur. You smell that stuff? <laughs> what? What? That's coming in from Signal Hill, I'll bet you. You hear they just brought in a gusher today. I don't know what you're talking about. Signal Hill's out by the beach. It's an oil field. That smell is from the refinery. Awful, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, who do you like in a bowl game? You ain't got me. Don't you know who to pick? I don't even know what bowl. The Rose Bowl. It's tomorrow. Trojans in Tennessee. I picked USC by 14 points. It's going to be like last year. Last year, USC beat Duke, you know. No, I didn't, but I'll take your word for it. You going to see the game? No. Going to watch the Rose Parade? Over in Pasadena? No. Well, there's always next year. What makes you think I'll be here next year? Well, where would you go? I mean, now. Now that you're here in God's country. My room at the Biltmore looks out over a small park. I stand at the window a long time. Two days on the train in Chicago and Corio seem like a lifetime away, and I feel almost free. Until I undress and take a shower, and I pile Corio's money on my dresser. Oh, well, I think Judas did it for a lot less. And the man I'm going to kill isn't going to be missed or mourned very much. The shower makes me feel better. 
I like the rich feel of the fresh bath mat beneath my toes. And when my feet are dry, I walk out into the room and I almost fall down. The guy's about 25, making absolutely no effort to hide the shoulder holster strapped over his white shirt. He's sitting on my bed with his coat beside him. Have a nice shower, Mr. Nile. Who the hell are you and how'd you get in? I work for Mr. Corio. He phoned me and said you were going to be in town and told me to look you up. Said I should take uh, really good care of you. Yeah, I get it. Just in case I get any funny ideas about running out before I do my job. Well, gee, I wouldn't know, Mr. Nile. Yeah. I just want to wish you uh, success in your work. Better put some clothes on. Don't want to catch cold. Corio wasn't about to miss any angles. He had me pinned down, and now I knew it. Well, all right, no escape. So I figure why prolong the inevitable. On a desk? Yeah, I want to rent a car. Uh, too late? Yeah, yeah, I know it's New Year's Eve. No, I don't want a chauffeured limousine. Is that all you can do? Okay, never mind. Well, I tried. Corio must know I couldn't nail Adler the first night I'm in town. It's going to take study and research. And the, and the time for that is after January the 1st, 1940, which is now only about seven hours away. Again, that the University of Southern California has defeated Tennessee 14 to nothing for their second consecutive victory here in the Rose Bowl. The next day was Tuesday. I've been 10 hours without a drink, five days without a game. At this rate, I could become a monk. I get up and I walk down to the lobby, feeling shaky and sick. And alcohol has nothing to do with it. It's the job I'm going to have to do. It's the second day of the year, 1940, and Los Angeles is going about its business again. The morning is bright, and I decide to walk until I feel better. Then find a car rental agency and get on about my business. Science paper, get your science paper. Well, after walking about two blocks, I decide I'm not going to feel any better walking, so I buy a paper and I turn to the ad section and I find a rent a car agency nearby. In a few minutes, I'm driving a new gray Chevy. And in due time, with the help of a city map, I'm on West Pico Boulevard. Traffic is fast and heavy, and the first time I sail right past number 311. It's an ordinary office building, just like hundreds of others. I go around the block, and I find a place to park. Ordinarily, a killer wouldn't show his face in the same building where his victim works, but I still don't think of myself as a killer. And besides, I have to get some idea of the layout of his office. The building directory lists the Adler Importing Company on the second floor. It's not such an impressive building. The stairway runs up four or five flights with a skylight at the top, fire escape in the rear. Nice to know if you have to make an exit in a hurry. And there, in black lettering, on an opaque glass door, is the Adler Importing Company. That's funny. Ten past ten, and his office is still locked. And then I remember what Corio said. The Importing Company's only a front. Maybe Adler never uses the office. I'm tempted to pick the lock, but then I figure I've already taken enough of a chance being seen. Next stop, 92 Mariposa Canyon Road. Adler's house is set back for the road and screened by trees and shrubbery so that it's impossible to tell if anyone's at home unless you drive down the driveway, which I wasn't about to do. Instead, I used the old burglar's trick. At the nearest payphone, I look up Adler's number, and I ring the house. Hello? Hello, is Mr. Adler there? Who is this call? Well, this is, uh, this is Mr. Sullivan. I had a 10 o'clock appointment with him this morning at his office. Is uh, something wrong? Then you haven't heard? Beg pardon? Uh, heard what? This is Marna Adler, Mr. Sullivan. My father is dead. What did you say? He's dead? The announcement will be in the papers tonight. Look, Miss Adler, I... I'm sure you understand. I can't talk anymore. Goodbye. For a minute, I stand there with the receiver to my ear until my head stops spinning. Adler is dead. He's already dead without my having to bump him off. I'm I'm off the case and I'm off the hook. Corio gets what he wanted and I don't have Adler on my conscience. The Chevy has a radio. And on the way back downtown, I find a station with the new news. B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulletin Watch Time. And here's the noon edition of KMTR News. The body of Los Angeles millionaire Simon Adler was pulled from the ocean off Catalina Island early today after the Adler cruiser exploded off Cherry Point. 
Adler's companion at the time of the explosion has not been located. Cause of the blast is under investigation. The Los Angeles Board of Equalization was charged today. The afternoon Herald Express has the full story. Adler and a business acquaintance had seen the new year in at Adler's Catalina hideaway. When they started back for the mainland, the gas tank blew up. The Coast Guard found Adler's body, but the other guy, someone named McIntyre, is still missing. I could just visualize how this story would read to Corio back in Chicago, and what he'd think I'd done. I stayed in my room for supper to take the call I was sure would come, and I didn't have long to wait. Hello? Harry? Right? Is that you, Corio? Right. Yeah, I was expecting your call. I understand that a mutual friend of ours has had a tragic accident, Harry. Is this true? Oh, you're one of the mourners, are you? You might say that. It was uh, very sudden, wasn't it? I thought you'd be, uh, impressed. Oh, I am, Harry. Well, Happy New Year, Corio. <laughs> Happy New Year, Harry. Oh, and Harry. Yeah. Maybe your luck is changing. Good night. <laughs> I lay back on the bed and for the first time enjoyed the best the Biltmore had to offer. Outside the window, searchlights swayed across the sky for some movie premiere, and I felt free for the first time since I got in hock at Corio's. It was the beginning of a new year, a whole new decade, the 40s. Maybe my luck was changing. KECA, Los Angeles. It's 10 p.m. And a good good evening, everyone. This is your Richfield Report. Funeral services will be held Wednesday at Forest Lawn for Simon Adler, millionaire importer who was killed yesterday when his motorboat exploded as he and Elliot McIntyre were returning from Catalina Island. Investigators studying the mysterious explosion. Forest Lawn is a green oasis at the edge of Los Angeles, convenient to the people who die in Burbank, Glendale, and Pasadena. Why did I attend the funeral? Well, I guess I wanted to verify that Adler was dead and this chapter of my life was closed. I couldn't get into the chapel. The service was for the family only. So I waited outside. And as the mourners filed out of the old stone building, I found myself looking for the girl I'd talked to on the phone. Marna, Adler's daughter. Only one woman in the group fitted my mental picture of her, a slender girl in a dark blue dress, matching jacket and hat. Everyone was crowding around her, consoling her. On the way to the graveside, I kept far back, watching. There was only one other witness who hung back from the mourners. I got the feeling he was watching me, but I figured it was a cemetery employee, and I forgot all about it. When it was all over, the girl in the dark blue was picked up by a driver in a late-model Lincoln Zephyr. Then I got in the Chevy and followed him. Sure enough, we wound up at 92 Mariposa Canyon Road. I sat in the car out of sight of the house, smoking and thinking. An L.A. police car cruised by twice while I was there, and the cops took a long look at me the second time. So I figured I wasn't too welcome in the neighborhood and was just about ready to start the motor and leave when suddenly the door on my side of the car jerked open. It was the driver of the Lincoln. Okay, get out. Okay, wait a minute. Out! Show me your badge and I'll get out. I don't need a badge. Yeah, I suppose you've got a license to carry that uh, gun. You want a badge? You want a license? There's just no satisfying you, is there? Now get out! I'm getting, I'm getting. Hand me your car keys. Here. Catch. Now that wasn't so bright, was it? Pick them up. Careful. <clears throat> okay. I must say, this is a shabby way to treat a businessman. What kind of business? I don't think that's any of your affair. Look, will you put that thing away? Guns make me nervous, especially when they're pointed at me. Then state your business. That was between Mr. Adler and me. What's your name? Uh, Sullivan. And I'm not in the habit of being interrogated by a... What are you, a chauffeur, a bodyguard? I'm whatever the family needs me to be. What are you doing out here? I was preparing to go up to the house and see if I could offer Miss Adler my condolences. Is that why you were at Forest Lawn? Oh, you saw me at the funeral. You weren't at the funeral. It was a private service. You hung around out by the grave, and then you followed us home. Now, what do you want, Mr. Sullivan? Carl? Carl, did I hear you say Mr. Sullivan? She stood at the entrance to the driveway... Only now she wasn't wearing a hat, and her red hair hung down around her shoulders. I didn't want to alarm you, Miss Adler, but this man followed us home from the cemetery and was parked in front of the house. Mr. Sullivan. That's right. I'm Mona Adler. Please forgive Carl. He's on edge. We all are. I understand. Then you remember my phoning yesterday. Of course. 
Carl, put that ugly gun away. Get it out of my sight. I'm sorry, ma'am. That will be all, Carl. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Carl, my uh, car keys. Yeah, here you go. Carl! Never mind, Miss Dan. Just a little game we've been playing. See you around, Carl. I hate ugliness. I bet you do. You knew my father. Not well. If you came to pay your respects, I appreciate it. But I'm not going to be home. Oh? I'm an unconventional person, Mr. Sullivan. I'm going to let my soul start healing. Uh, That sounds like a good idea. My father's death has torn my soul. There's only one place on this earth where it can start to heal. Is that so? Why don't you come with me? You look as if you've known the world too well, Mr. Sullivan. I know it pretty well, yes. Come on. Uh, My car is... Uh, uh... Take mine. It's right up the driveway. Uh, Miss Adler... My name is Marna. Call me that. What's your first name? It's uh, it's Harry. Say, uh, where are we going? We're going to bathe, Harry. Did you say bathe? We're going to bathe our souls together. We're going to cleanse out the ugliness. Please, Harry, you drive. I've been holding back the tears. I think they're going to come. The third act of tonight's special crisis presentation, West for My Health, will follow in a minute after this time out. And now we return to our story, West for My Health. I guide Myra's big car down from the Hollywood Hills and into the streets of Los Angeles while she cries silently at my side. The only thing she tells me is where and when to turn. But eventually, and all too soon, the ride is over. We pull up beside a big white drum-shaped building with a big sign that says Miracle Tabernacle in blue neon. Marna dabs at her face, runs a comb through her long red hair, and climbs out of the car. Come on, Harry. What is this place? You understand. Come on. Give me your hand. She leads me through a big arched entrance, through a tall pair of French doors, and into a big theater auditorium in white trimmed with gold. The place is jammed with people, and sweat rises like steam in the air. There are terribly fat, terribly thin, terribly crippled people in wheelchairs, on crutches and canes, even on stretchers. But the center of interest from the second you walk in is the elevated pulpit downstage center. Spotlights dazzle on a woman in a long white gown, her arms spread like wings, her blonde hair wound around her head in braids, and her voice holding the whole assembly in its spell. Into this auditorium, here and now, and send his healing powers through the air like electricity. Is this what you meant by bathing our souls? Shh, listen to her. My dear one. Who has the faith to know that he or she will be healed? You come here often? Oh, yes, all the time. Haven't you heard her on the radio? Uh, No, I think I missed her. I generally listen to Amos and Andy. Shh. And you'd better bring your faith with you because the Lord is looking down on you this very moment. How much money do you have with you? I don't know. Give, Harry. All right, just a second. Give. I'm getting my wallet out. How about a hundred dollars? A hundred dollars? Oh, the spirit has touched you. You Harry, I love you. I really do, do believe the Lord can heal Don't you. you simply bathe in the Spirit? Oh, God yeah. bless you, my dear. Rise up out of that wheelchair and walk over here to me. Rise up. Come on. Walk. When the performance ends, Sister Grace makes her exit to the wings and Marna grabs my hand and we run out a side door and down a long hallway until we get to a door marked Private. Is this the sacred dressing room? She'll let us in. Sister Grace, it's Marna. It is you, isn't it, dear? I've brought someone new. Welcome, brother. Come in. Oh, my poor child. I know. They told me. But he's in a far better world now. You must believe that. Oh, I do, Sister Grace. A world without pain, without hunger, without worry. Yes, I know. Oh, Sister Grace, this is a friend of my father's, Mr. Sullivan. How good of you to attend, Sister Marna, in her hour of travail. It's, uh, my pleasure, uh, Sister 
Now, will you excuse me for just a moment? I must change out of these ceremonial robes. You understand, Mr. Sullivan? These white robes are designated only for the Lord's work. I'll be back in just a moment. Ah, uh, isn't she inspiring? Yeah, I guess you'd say that, yeah. I'll tell her of your generous gift, Harry. It was worth it, believe me. Worth it? Uh, never mind. I guess anyone can get carried away. I don't think I understand. Well, out in the auditorium, when I gave that hundred, you remember what you did? You kissed me. And you liked that? Yeah, I liked it, yeah. I told you I'm an unconventional person. I do what I feel. Yeah, well, I think that's fine. Uh, very healthy. Anytime you feel like uh, doing what you feel, just feel free. Thank you. Um, say, do you feel like having something to eat? Oh, no. Thanks, but not now. Sister Grace will be back in a minute. Oh, there's someone out in the hall. Do we let him in? Of course, why not? Uh, if you're looking for Sister Grace, she's changing. She'll be right out. I, I must see her. Yeah, well, I... Uh, come in, brother. Yeah, come in, brother. Uh, thank you. That was just a figure of speech about seeing her. Actually, I can't see anything. Oh, well, it's tough. Uh, How did it happen? I was born blind. Uh, come over here and sit down. Uh, there you go. Ah, thank you. You're very kind. You know, I've listened to Sister Grace and the Miracle Tabernacle on the radio for years, but this is the first time I've ever come here. Uh, my name is Sylvester. Hmm. Hi, Sylvester. How do you do? I'm Harry, and this is Marna. Hello. Well, two young people, how lovely and charming. Hey, you ought to see her, Sylvester. She is lovely. Well, in my own way, I do see her. I see the important part of people without eyes. That's beautiful. Now we can have our little chat. Oh, and whom do we have here? Uh, Sister Grace, this is Sylvester. He's listened to your broadcasts for years, and he's here to see you with his heart. I understand. Welcome, Brother Sylvester. Well, it is you, isn't it, Sister Grace? God bless you. Oh, he does, my friend. Indeed, he does. Tell me, what can I do for you? Well, worldly goods have I none, Sister Grace. I understand. We have a wonderful kitchen and dining hall in the basement, Brother Sylvester. We even have a small men's dormitory. Will you partake? God bless you, Sister Grace, but I can't pay you. The Lord pays me handsomely, Brother. Marna, will you guide our friend downstairs... Have him registered and given meal tickets and see that he's assigned a bed. Of course. Come along, brother. Well, thank you. I don't know how to thank you. You see, we don't ask a man's religion here. We only ask what he needs. And then we give him all we can. The only thing we ask is that he be honest with us. Sounds fair enough. But you haven't been quite honest, have you? Is that again? Who are you? What's the matter? Don't you like the color of my money, sister? Please don't smoke in here. No, the color of your money doesn't concern me in the least. But when a man uses an assumed name, he is being dishonest. I ask you again, who are you? What makes you think I'm using an assumed name? If you were in the tabernacle for this afternoon's service, you'd witness that I have certain powers. Oh, you read minds, that it? I read hearts. Oh, okay, hearts. You are not only deceiving Sister Marna. You have entered this tabernacle under false pretenses. But I am willing to forgive all sinners. All you must do is admit your sins. That'd take a long time, Sister Grace. Why don't we just leave it the way it is? I'm Harry Sullivan. You are Harry Nile. Oh, you're very good, Sister Grace. What else? Come on, you must have found out more than that. I'm very disappointed. I had hoped you would volunteer. Okay, I'm a escaped convict. No? All right, I'm Clark Gable. How about Rin Tin Tin? I don't think Marna will be amused. Look, do lady, you... what have you got? A name, Harry Nile. Why is that any more important to you than Harry Sullivan or Harry Smith or Harry Jones? Because or... Harry Nile is hiding. Why are you hiding, Mr. Nile? You know, sister, suddenly I don't feel like it's any of your business. If I'm going to confess anything to anybody, it'll be to Marna. You won't be seeing Marna again, Mr. Nile? What's that supposed to mean? Simply that. When Marna learns of your deceit, she won't care to see you again. And you'll take care of that. I think this interview has gone on long enough. You will be welcome in Miracle Tabernacle when you have repented, Mr. Nile, and not before. Gotcha. And now if you'll tell me how to get downstairs, I'll find Marna and get Marna will of... be taken care of by one of us, Mr. Nile. Your responsibility where she is concerned is ended. Not until she ends it, sister. I 
try not to be superstitious, but somehow the evangelist has gotten to me, and there's a spooky feeling in my head that maybe she knows more than she's saying. I hurry down the hall and find the stairway and head downstairs, looking for Marna. I find the soup kitchen and the dormitory, but she's not there. I run back up and into the main auditorium, but there's only a janitor sweeping out. And then I remember I've got the keys to her car in my pocket. She can't get away without me. I storm out the front through the French doors and then the arches, and then I spot her, sitting in the Lincoln with both hands on the steering wheel, staring straight ahead. It'll run a lot better with these keys. Who are you, Mr. Nile? Sister Grace must have her own telegraph system. Carl checked on you through the car rental agency and phoned the tabernacle. If I could sit down in the car, I'd explain it. Thank you. Okay, I dreamed up the name of Sullivan on the spur of the moment. Actually, it's a name I use a lot, as an alias. An alias? I'm a private investigator, Marna, from Chicago. And I came out here to... Yes? To investigate your father. Investigate him? Why? Oh, it had to do with his company. I can't go into detail. Anyway, it's all over now. When you told me he was dead, that closed the case. Believe me. I told Mr. Sullivan he was dead. Look, I don't blame you for being sore at me. When I phoned, it was just to find out where he was. I didn't expect anyone to... I didn't think I'd ever meet you or or get to know you. What else don't I know about you? Who hired you to spy on my father? You know I can't divulge your client's name. Thanks for being so upright. Look, it doesn't matter now. The case is closed. My client isn't interested anymore. I'm not working for him anymore. Believe me. You don't believe me. Well, why should you? I lied about my name, lied about what I was doing here. Look, I want to tell you everything. I mean everything. Then why don't you? Why don't you do what you feel? I think I will. An hour ago, you kissed Harry Sullivan. Now you kissed Harry Nile. And I meant it. I want you to be honest with me, Harry. All right. Let's drive. You drive. I'll talk. All right. Talk to me. Well, I already told you I'm an investigator, and my client in Chicago wanted some information about your father's business. Did you give him the information? How could I? I got in town New Year's Eve, and the next day your dad had his accident. Look, I'm off the case. There is no more case. Your client's in Chicago. Why was he interested in my father? He was afraid of your father, Martha. Afraid? What kind of business do you think he was in? I don't know. You tell me. Well, it wasn't the import business. You mean you didn't know? Tell me. It was the movie business. He he owned certain pictures, and he controlled a lot of theaters. Why would that have anything to do with a man in Chicago? The man was afraid your father was going to try to take over the Chicago movie business like he was doing in L.A. So we hired you to come out here and stop him? Yeah, more or less. And you'd actually do that? I didn't do it. I didn't do anything. Because you didn't have to. He was already dead. I don't like you anymore, Harry Nile. My client owns a gambling outfit. I had a run of rotten luck, and I wound up owing him a lot more than I could pay. My client isn't a very nice man. It was either come out here and do something very bad or get killed. Kill or be killed? That's about it. Look, Marna, I... You must have done this before, as a private detective. No. It doesn't really matter. I don't think I could ever believe anything you say. From now on. We made the rest of the trip in silence. When we got back to the Adler house on Mariposa Canyon Road, Marna stopped the car outside my Chevy. There were no goodbyes. She just sat there waiting for me to get out. So I did. The lights were coming on as I headed back toward the hotel. Suddenly I hated L.A. Hated Corio. Hated Adler. Hated myself for ever getting suckered into this whole mess. So I turned on the car radio to take my mind off my troubles. We interrupt this broadcast for a local news bulletin from the KMTR newsroom. Los Angeles police have announced a citywide search for a suspect in the death of millionaire Simon Adler, who died in the New Year's Day explosion of his cabin cruiser. It was the first indication that authorities believe foul play may have been connected with a fatality. Now we return you to the music of Larry Clinton, coming to you from the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. Oh no, my mind starts racing. I have to figure out how this news is going to sound to Corio back in Chicago. He's going to figure the police are after me. And that I could lead them back to him. 
It all adds up to one thing. I had to get out of town fast. I fight my way through traffic to the Biltmore, hoping to clear out before Corio gets wind of the investigation. I get up to my room, shove the key in the lock, walk in and snap on the lights, and there he sits. The same punk who called on me after my shower two nights before. Close the door, Nile. How do you get in? Under the door? Hold it right there. I'll take the heater. You won't be needing it anymore. You're about to make a real dumb mistake. Uh Uh-uh. You made the mistake. You were sloppy with the way you handled that alert. Corio, don't stand for sloppiness. I was going to call Corio. The police aren't looking for me. I didn't kill Adler. Then you lied to Corio, and you don't like liars either. Look, friend, there's no way Corio will get involved with Adler's death even if someone did bump him off because they can't connect me with it, don't you see? Hey, it's nothing to me whether you croak the guy or not. I'm just taking my orders from Mr. Corio, same as you, only I didn't screw up. Now pack your bag, Mr. Nile. You're checking out. Corio's henchman climbs in beside me in the Chevy and we start through town. My empty shoulder holster is filling with sweat and I try to drive through a red light hoping some cop will pull us over. But the torpedo knows that trick and he jabs the muzzle of my own automatic into my kidney. So I obey traffic laws to the letter. Mind uh, telling me where we're going? What do you carry? You ain't going to send any postcards. Look, you got to let me make a phone call to Corio. If you don't, you're going to get in trouble with him. I promise you. Hey, it's nice of you to worry about me. But like I said, I'm just following Mr. Corio's orders. Anyway, in a few minutes, all your worries will be over. Isn't that nice? So now I know. Corio has ordered my execution, just like I was afraid he would. So now I figure any chance is worth taking, and I try to come up with something, anything. All of a sudden, something clicks in my mind. I begin to, to recognize where we are. Only a couple of blocks from Sister Grace's miracle tabernacle. Up ahead, the traffic signal changes to stop, and I make my move. I hit the brakes and I open the door all at the same time and my passenger hits the windshield with his head. I gamble he won't risk a shot at me and in five more seconds I'm around the corner on a side street. But I know he'll be coming after me. I reach the next corner and I turn right and I head up to the Miracle Tabernacle. If I ever needed a miracle, it's now. I make it up to the French doors and they're locked. Let me in! Come on, let me in! Down the street, the gray Chevy comes up alongside the building, and I shrink down until I'm lying on the cement. He cruises by, but he's peering up at the tabernacle. Somehow, he doesn't see me. I'm making enough noise to wake the dead, and then I see a silhouette of someone coming to the door. I'm sorry, brother. We're closed till 8 o'clock tonight. Come on, let me in, old man. I'm a poor, repentant sinner. I leave the janitor staring at me, and I head through the darkened auditorium. There's a green exit light over the side door, and that's what I'm looking for. It opens into a hallway that leads to Sister Grace's dressing room. When I get to the door, I don't even bother to knock. What is the meaning of this? Sister Grace, I told you that I'd come back when I when I'd repented, and I have. I'm in the middle of my prayers, Mr. Niles. Then say one for me. There's a guy out there who's going to kill me. I don't understand. I'm asking you to hide me, lady. Hide you? I'll tell you all about it later. Hey, who, who's that? Sister Grace. Is everything all right? Your door was open and I heard voice. Yes, yes, Brother Sylvester. Everything is all right. Is that Brother Harry again? I believe it is. You've got a great ear, Sylvester. All right, if I close the door. Brother Sylvester, Brother Harry seems to be in some kind of trouble. Would you mind leaving us alone for just a moment? Oh, not, at, not at all, Sister Grace. I'm afraid I intruded. I can find my way back to the dormitory. I'm really very capable. I appreciate this. I can pay. I can pay any, anything you ask. What is it you've done, Mr. Nile? It's it's what I haven't done. A very dangerous guy in Chicago has me over a barrel. I owe him a lot of money, so he sent me out here to kill Simon Adler. And if I don't do it or mess it up, he'll have me killed. Then it was you. No, was... it wasn't me. It was either an accident or someone else got him first. But the point is, the police are looking for a suspect now, and Corio's afraid they'll catch me and connect me Corio, with... Corio, the... the man in Chicago? Yeah, 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 that's right. One of his gunmen is driving around looking for me right now. I just jumped out of the car and I ran in here. You're my last hope. I see. Very well, Mr. Nile. You may remain in the dormitory downstairs until it is safe for you. I want to thank you. And I'll make a nice donation. Whatever your heart tells you to do, Mr. Nile. Right now, all I want is for it to keep on beating. The hall is lit by two bare bulbs, and down at the other end is a stairway to the basement. Down in the dormitory, it's even darker. And evidently, there are several guests who have already retired. I pick my way between the cots when all of a sudden, something hits me on the back of the head and I take a nosedive under the bare springs of an iron cot. 
And then I'm on my back with someone pressing something across my windpipe, and I realize what's in his hands is a cane. Sylvester, what are you doing? You want to kill me? That's right, Harry. That's just exactly what I want. Why? Why, Sylvester? Because you tried to kill me, Harry. All right, hold it. And a light bulb goes on in the ceiling and Sylvester leaps away from me. In the doorway is Corio's man, a big purple bruise on his forehead and a gun in each hand. I don't know what you want with him, old man, but move aside. Harry is all mine. And then I get a good look at Sylvester. The dark glasses are gone. He's no more blind than I am. And the straggly beard is half torn off, too. And that's when the puzzle finally falls together. Get up, Mr. Nile. Listen to me. We've got some business to finish. Listen, you know who this guy is, really? What do I care who he is? I'll show you who he is. Get your hands off me. Out. Look at his fake beard. Get away from me. Fake eyebrows. Out. Come on over and have a good look. Who is it? I've seen him before. Sure you have. They ran his picture in all the papers yesterday. It's Simon Adler. It can't be. Tell us how it can be, Mr. Adler. Neither one of you punks is going to walk out of here. Carl will be here any second. Oh, you'll enjoy meeting Carl, buddy boy. You're both in the same business. I wonder which one of you shoots the fastest. All right, hold it, Nile. Well, speak of the devil. And you drop those guns. Are you kidding? <laughs> Carl! Carl! Well, I guess that answers my question. You're a real Ralston straight shooter. Now, what do we do with him? Adler? Well, you can't kill him. He's already officially dead. I even went to your funeral, Adler. You drove me to do it, you punk. I got word Corio was sending you out here to kill me. So you decided to play dead and throw me off. That'll work, too. Right up to a minute ago, when you laid me out with your cane, why'd you do that? I thought you were coming down to get me. I figured you knew who I was. No, you really fooled me. You all did. Especially your grieving daughter. Daughter? <laughs> Mana's not my daughter. Oh. Listen, Niall, what do we do? Do I have to do all your thinking for you? You call up Corio and you tell him you finished me off. Then I'll be free to become someone else, like Sylvester here. Huh? Or do you want to be standing here with a smoking gun when the cops arrive? Huh? Run, run, you idiot. He's giving you a bike. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, my gun, please? Uh, here, take it. Catch. Now, which way out of here? Well, that's luck. He shot Carl with his own gun, not mine. Uh, can I help you get your beard back on, Sylvester? Oh, and here are your dark glasses, and here's your cane. Sorry, but I've got to run. The next day, Thursday, January 4th, 1940. I've got a one-way ticket with connections for a place in Canada where they say the fishing's great. With better than $600 left from Corio's bankroll, I figure I've got a little breathing time. And after that, well, what the heck, maybe I'll join the RCAF. Excuse me, sir. Are you Mr. Harry Sullivan? Huh? Oh, oh, yeah, that's me. You have a phone call, sir. Take it in this booth. Thanks. Uh, yeah, here you go. Here, put these uh, bags on the northbound train to Canada, eh? Can you be down here? Twenty minutes. Hmm? Just make it. Take the uh, four ten southbound to San Diego. I'll be in the lodge car. Oh, Harry, you'd do this even though I deceived you so badly. Marna, honey, as Sister Grace would say, to err is human, to forgive divine. back with the names of tonight's players and a scene from next week's crisis production after this message. West for My Health featured Phil Harper as Harry Nile with Art Kahn, John Walrich, Douglas Young, Veronica, John Amendola, Pat French, Johnny Walker, and Bob Robertson. Music by David Shire, Script and direction by yours truly. This is your producer, Jim French, inviting you to be with us next week at this time. 
when the Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. Dieser Regen macht mich verrückt. Afrika macht mich verrückt. <laughs> February 1943. The rains came to North Africa and turned the dry earth into mud. Mud churned into sticky brown paste by the trucks and tanks of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel's Africa Corps. Mud kneaded like bread dough by the weary feet of thousands of soldiers who, with their armor, were about to be thrown into combat against the United States Army's Second Corps at a narrow place near the village of Kasserine. Kasserine Pass. The endless days of rain, the overhanging threat of death, can produce in any soldier, in any army, in any war, a condition of emotional fatigue, a condition in which dreams can merge with reality. This is what may have happened to Corporal Billy Hausman of the 9th Panzer Group. His story begins on February 19, 1943. But where it ends, I leave up to you. Tonight, Crisis presents a special hour-long dramatization titled Panzer Lead, The Song of the Armor. This is Jim French, and I'll be back in just one minute with Act One. The German Tiger tanks wait beneath their camouflage netting, hidden in a ruined North African town, waiting for the signal that must come, the signal to attack. In a small dispensary set up in a house with windows blown out, a group of German soldiers huddle out of the rain. Soldiers on sick call. What's your trouble, Gitreiter? Hmm? Your trouble? You have the chills? Nine. Nothing as simple as that, I'm afraid. Oh. oh. So, what is it then? Something in my head. I don't know. In your head? I said I don't know. I'm not the doctor. My name is Tyson. Good morning, Tyson. Morgen. And who are you? Hausmann. Billy Hausmann. Now, can't you leave me alone? Well, well, get I said Hausmann. Are you too good to talk to a mere Lanza? Oh, don't be absurd. It doesn't matter to me. Only one grade separates us. I just don't feel like talking. Yeah? Very well. We won't talk. No. Tyson, I'm sorry. I- I'm... Very worried about myself. Tell me about it. I think I'm going mad. You're serious? I'm very serious. Why? Because. Because I have dreams. I can't explain it. Dreams? Everybody has dreams. I have dreams. It's a daytime? Huh. Any time? Any moment? Oh, that does sound bad. What do you dream? Oh, always good dreams. Dreams of home. Dreams of when I was a boy in Steinau. There was a park there. And I used to ride on the swings. And when I would swing up, up, I could see the steeple of the church. Houseman. The brighter Billy Houseman. 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 It's your turn. Hmm? What? Houseman. Ja, ja. Hausmann, Willi, gefreit der Herr Doktor. Ja, 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 I remember you, Hausmann. Sit down, sit down. Dankeschön. Bitte. Oh, what is it today? The same thing? I'm afraid so, sir. You're the one with the... The dreams. Ah, yes, yes, the dreams. I know you told me the last time that you could do nothing for me, but they're coming more and more often now and stronger. Is that so? And I can't help myself. I wish they wouldn't torment me so. Oh, really, really, be calm a moment. I'm sorry, sir. Now tell me about them again. I don't know. I don't know. They are always dreams of your childhood? No. Not just of my childhood. Sometimes, all of a sudden, I... 
I seem to really be back at the training camp. Oh? Yes, and my friends are with me, and I am proud in my new uniform. And all the days are sunny, and there's no war, no killing, and the land is bright, and we are in the great dining hall at Turing. And I have learned all the words to the Panzer League. There's no case. And we're going to bring peace to the world. And order. All right, Martin. All right. That's enough. That's enough. You see, it happens. It happens and I can't control it. You despise me. You think I'm a weakling. No, no, Hausman. No, I don't despise you. I'm a coward. How old are you? Twenty-one. You have been fighting for almost five years? Since 1939? Yes. And suddenly you are a coward? No, Hausman. Then why do I suddenly have these... These... Fantasies? Yeah. Somewhere in our minds, we reach a point of saturation. A point where our minds can no longer tolerate the the torment of, of war. The fears of mortality... Watching our comrades torn to pieces. The noise, the smell. And never being quite safe or quite rested or quite clean. Then you understand. And the mind simply rebels. And it reaches back to a happier time. And somehow projects a past experience into our consciousness. But then, that's insanity. Oh, no, it isn't. Don't you see? This is how our minds keep us from breaking into pieces. But... but it isn't normal. Uh, what is normal? Can you tell me, Hausman? Normal is... Uh, well, normal is... Well, it's... What? Not having fantasies? Or fond memories of a better world we used to live in? But, sir, these are more than fantasies to me. Phantoms of the past? Ghosts? No. Doctor, in these daydreams, I am really living in them. The war, the mud... North Africa, the ruined villages all drop away. And I am a boy living in the old town just as I was. It's real to me. Oh, Willy Hausmann. How lucky you are. Lucky? But you've got to cure me. There's no cure for this, really. Or some of us treat the symptoms with liquor, with fighting, or suicide, but... You are most fortunate. Oh, I'm completely lost, Dr. Lynch. How can I be fortunate when I keep losing reality? Because, Willie, you have found a way to escape. You've been there a long time. What did he say? <laughs> He told me I'm lucky I found a way to escape. <laughs> That's what he said. They don't care about us. Give us an aspirin or a physic. That's all they care. They're nothing but a livestock. No. I like Lynn. He understands me. <laughs> Are you sick? <laughs> According to me, yeah. According to the doctor, <coughs> back to work I go. <coughs> Doing what? Engine repair. Oh. What do you do? Oh, I'm just a foot soldier. <laughs> ah, and I bet you thought the pans would mean riding tanks. Safe behind armored steel. Yeah. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> but someone has to fix them. They break down. <laughs> and someone has to run behind them for the rifle. Yeah. <laughs> But it's all for the good of the cause, eh? Horseman. Look! Is it what I think? It is. Mail! Oh, first mail in nine and a half weeks. I hope I only live long enough to, to read one letter. <coughs> Dear Willie, I am writing to tell you that we are doing well here at home. Look at this. Cut into shreds by the censor. Ah, well, what else does she say? We get a good crop of potatoes and beets out of the garden. Do you remember when you would come home from school to your own garden patch to see if your vegetables had come up yet? Willie? 
Don't you get your shoes muddy? I'm not, Mama. I just have to see if my carrots have come up yet. And they have. Come see. No, no, don't pull them out of the ground, you silly boy. They are too young yet. Mama, I want to talk to you. All right. You talk while I fix supper. Come on. Mama, a man came to school today. He spoke to us about their fear. Oh, he did? And he said we are needed. Who is he? Did? All of us. All the boys. To do that? To serve the fatherland. That's, that's nice, love. I pity, silly. I want to join, Mama. Like them good. You have been in the garden. There will be no mud in my kitchen. Mooty! What is it, Billy? I want to join. Join oh, what? The young folk. The Hitler youth. The young folk? You want to... No, 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 no. I would have a but uniform. Billy, Billy, you are like your carrots in the garden. You are too young yet. <laughs> Much too young. <laughs> I what? Are you all right? No, I'm dying. Does it hurt you to cough like that? <laughs> of course. You think a cough was the fun of it? <laughs> Sent you the letter, your girl. My mother. Oh, too bad. Well, if you can't get a letter from your girl, you may as well get one from your mother. How are things back home? How do I know? Look at it. Yeah, Swiss cheese. The censors protect us from the bad news at home, and they protect them from the bad news from us. <laughs> Some soldiers we are. Look at us. You have TB, and I'm a lunatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you all right? Yeah. Back. Yeah. They can't fly in this weather, so... It would be in the cave. They're just as bad off as we are. <laughs> they ought to let you go home. It's just as bad there. Do you think so? It's the bombings. Yeah. You never hear about it, so. But I suppose if we can bomb England, they can bomb us. It's mad, isn't it? Is it all? The whole fat damn the world is mad. Bombing, shooting, killing. I once made a pact. I swore if I ever met an Englishman, <coughs> I'd yell at him, I won't shoot if you hope. You never <laughs> shot anyone? No, I told you. I repair tank engines. I do my part. I fix the engines so the tanks can do the killing. What oh, mother? Oh, my ears. Lord, I can't take much more. I'm trying to find out tiger tanks. Do you think they're going to come through the pass? How would I know? Wait a minute. Somebody's running this way. It's over like the back. You, what are you doing here? Why aren't you in the caves? I was at the dispensary here, Oberleutnant. And uh, who's this with you? <laughs> Schutter Tyson, a mechanic, sir. Why were you on sick call? What's the matter? Are you sick? Uh, no, sir. Listen, Hausman, I have orders to send out a reconnaissance party. Yes, sir. I need two men. Schutter, what is your name? Tyson. Are you fit for duty? Oh, this cough is nothing, sir. Who's your chief? Sergeant Buckner. I'll tell him you fall in tears. <laughs> Shelly? You have only two miles to go. Who's the master of the pass? One of you will carry the transmitter, the other takes the generator back. We need to know if the Americans are receiving reinforcements. Apparently, General Van Borek has told Rommel that the second corps is getting fresh troops onto the material. See what you can see. Supply will give you the radio set. Now, back quickly. Conceal yourselves. Schnell! Schnell! <laughs> Houseman and Carl Tyson were sent on a scouting mission through the very mouth of Kasserine Pass. 
where in a few hours one of the decisive battles of the North African campaign of World War II would be fought. On the outcome of the battle would be decided the deployment of Field Marshal Rommel's Panzer Divisions. The battle at Kasserine Pass would last four days, from February 19th to the 22nd, 1943. Against the veteran troops of the German army, the U.S. Second Corps pitted fresh and mostly untried soldiers. The Americans would find themselves on the defensive at the start of the battle, and only because after four days of violent combat, Rommel determined that his forces were being stalemated did the resourceful Desert Fox withdraw to direct his panzers against the British Eighth Army, which now was assembling below at the Mareth Line. But for now, on the eve of Rommel's assault on Kasserine Pass, very few troops moved. The rain kept up its steady downpour, and American artillery probed the German positions where the Tiger tanks were hidden awaiting Rommel's order to attack. Hausmann and Tyson struggled with the heavy radio equipment, finally gaining a low hill overlooking the American howitzers. Let's rest here. I don't think we can go any further. Well, there are the Americans. How many cannons? I count 16. No, it can't be that many. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'll report what we can see. Hook up the generator. You know? <coughs> Unless our gunners are very accurate, they could just as easily hit us as when they start the fire. Well, what does it matter how you get killed? By an American shell or one of our own, you're just as dead as a way. Such an optimist. There, there's ready. I hope they're not spotted when I put up the area. Forward, one to lead of one. Forward one to lead of one. Forward one to lead of one. Forward one to lead of one. Ach, nothing. It's not working. Are we sending? Yeah. That's just fine. All this for nothing. I just had a wonderful thought. <coughs> Maybe the transmitter. Catherine has been hit. Knocked out. Let me try it again. Forward one to leader one. Forward one to leader one. Do you hear me, leader one? Give it up. Look. Down below. Eh? A squad of Americans. They're coming in, in our direction. They haven't seen us. But they know we're here. What do we do? There's a low spot. By that hill. Come on. Right here. Keep your head down. <coughs> Try not to cough. Some give in a lunatic lying together in a freezing mud puddle. <laughs> this is the honor and the glory of war. Is there some other kind? <laughs> what was it they said? All things are justified for the sake of the new order. Yes, that was it. <laughs> they painted us a beautiful picture of the future. <laughs> and I believed it. We all believed it. It was easy to believe it in Turkey. In the soft summer. These were only fuzzy-cheeked boys. But we stood like toy soldiers. Oh, and we sang. We sang of the better world we were going to build. Of clean cities and new order. Peace was all the world. And all the country loved us. They waved at us when we rode through the towns. And they trusted us to build a new world. Shut up. For God's sake, can't you stop babbling? You are a lunatic. <coughs> what if we win the war and nobody's left alive to live in the new world? <coughs> Mortars, they found us. Come on, leave the radio. Let's get out of here. Tyson! 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 to come down here alone, even in the daylight. Oh, speak of the devil when you look at that. Right 
there in the alley. He's got a gun. Someone, someone, will, will you please call the police? There, there is a person in that alley, and he, he's got a gun, and he's uh, Tyson! Tyson! Oh, now wait! Now wait! This is a new dream. I don't like this dream. What is this place? Where am I? Toby, I make it into the shop. All units, vicinity of front and A streets, man with a gun. All units, vicinity of front and A streets, man with a gun. Any nearby units, report. Unit 31 at A in Columbia, we're on our way. Unit 31, 10-4. It's crazy, it's in two days. Yeah. Must be the heat. Oh, the drinking water. Oh, who drinks the water? You take the riot gun. You got it. Yeah, there's something going on up ahead. Ease it up. Ease it up. Throw up easy. You want to drive, Keating? No, oh, just go easy. Hey, I see him. Where? In the doorway. Right under the TV sign. See? Hell, a soldier. Well, he's pointing that piece right at this car. Hey, man. Uh, what's the problem? Let, let's not be pointing that gun, fella. Uh, put it down. Uh, we won't hurt you. He's not moving. All right. Cover me. Lay the gun down. You're not in any trouble if you lay the gun down. Oh, jeez, he's in the door. This is Unit 31 to control. Suspect is armed with a rifle and a small automatic weapon. He's gone inside a door 319 Front Street. Request tax squad. Suspect is white male, dressed in some kind of combat uniform. Say again, 31. Suspect is white male in a combat uniform, like a German soldier, World War II, and he's caked with mud. Hausman has been plunged into another time, another place. From a blinding explosion in North Africa to a strange city street, all in the twinkling of an eye. He's had these fantasies before, but never like this. Never has he found himself in such an unfamiliar, terrifying new place. He darted into a doorway and discovered it opened on a flight of stairs. He ran up the stairs and found himself in a dingy hallway with a dark series of closed doors. Frantically, he tries each door. Finally, Willie finds one of them unlocked. And it was into this room, overlooking the city street below, that he took sanctuary. Meanwhile, down on the street, strange black and white vehicles have assembled, and uniformed men by the dozens heavily armed have assumed combat positions among the buildings across the street. It's a few minutes later now, and a middle-aged man in plain clothes arrives in an unmarked car and walks over to one of the men in uniform. Hello, Captain Parks. Hello, Gilbert. Taking over, sir? Yeah. Yeah, fill me in. Well, he's got a rifle, big bore, military issue, and a sidearm that looks like a machine pistol. A machine pistol? That's right. And he's wearing some kind of uniform. I'd say it looks like what the Germans wore in World War II. And he's covered with mud. Well, where is he? He went in that door by the closed-up TV shop. The landlord said it's the stairway. Okay. Now, as soon as we've got the block cleared, we're going in after it. Sir? Yeah? He looked scared. Yeah. Probably do anything. Anyone in this room? That's locked. That's where he is. Fella, let me explain this to you. We don't want to hurt you. You haven't done anything wrong, but we want you to lay down your weapons and open the door. When you do that, we'll talk. We're not going to hurt you. You got that? You want to tell us your name? 
Ich heiße Willi Hausmann. How's that? Uh, my name is Willi Hausmann. Willi Hausmann? Hausmann, ja. Yeah. I'm glad to know you, Willi. I'm Keating. Keating? Yeah, you got it. Now, you all alone in there? Alone? Yeah, I'm alone. I'm all alone. So you want to let us in the door, Willie? Nine. You cannot come in. What do you plan to do, Willie? I don't know. Uh, you hungry? Hungry? Yeah. When's the last time you ate? I ate. Let me see. I didn't eat breakfast because I went to the dispensary instead. And I did eat lunch. What time is it, please? Oh, it's just about uh, 3.30. Now, Willie, why don't you let us in and you can explain why you're carrying those guns? You got a permit to carry those guns? A, a permit? Yeah. Where'd you get the gun? I was issued these guns. They are mine. Uh, Willie, where are you from? I am Gefreiter Willie Hausmann, Neunter Panzer Gruppe Africa Corps. Uh, what is that in English? German? Yeah. <laughs> Just reckon Sie Deutsch? Yeah, yeah. Was wollen Sie? Was wollen Sie haben? Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't talk German. Tyson? What's that? Tyson! Your voice sounds like Tyson. Look, uh, Willie. What is it you want, huh? I don't know. I want to go home. Okay, well, we can pick you up. Wait a minute. Listen, Willie. I want to send a man into your room. The man is unarmed, okay? The man is my boss. He wants to help you, okay? Now, he has no gun. Will you let him in? Yeah. I let him in. Hello, Billy. Uh, my name is Captain Parks. Hauptmann, treten Sie herein, bitte. Thank you. Uh, danke schön. Bitte schön. Uh, let's leave the door open. All right. Uh, all right. You don't need to point the rifle at me, Billy. Thank you. What do you call that piece? My rifle? It's standard issue. Null acht Pünzen. And is that a Schmeiser machine pistol? Yeah, it is my Null acht. Null acht. Oh, oh eight, oh eight millimeter. Yeah. Billy, where do you come from? Will you tell me? Uh, I was born in the town of Steinau. Steinau? Uh, what year? 1922. 1922? How old are you? 21. What year do you think this is? 1943. I see. Billy, how did you get here? I don't know, Doctor. It's the same as all the times before, only now. Now I don't know where I am. Tell me about the times before. The dreams. You know, we talked about them this morning in this dispensary. But, oh no, this is a different place. What place is this, Doctor? This is the United States, Willie, in the year 1975. Yeah, I knew it was America, but uh, is the war over now? It was over a long ago. The world is at peace, then. <laughs> yes. Oh. You see, you see, then it, is, then it was all to a good purpose. All the mud and the dying and, and destruction, all things are justified. What's that? For the new order. Let me see the new order. Stay away from that window. What? Don't get near that window. You'll be shot. But you said the world is at peace. That's, that's right. There, there is no war. But this is fear. I can tell this is fear. In this room, there's fear. You don't need to be afraid. You're just kind of mixed up, Billy. Do you have any papers on you? Papers? You have your passport. Passport? <laughs> I don't need a passport for a dream. You think I don't know this is a dream? I told you about my dreams, Doctor. You are Parks, and, and Tyson is Keating, out there in the hallway. And you, beside Tyson, 
Oberleutnant Berger. I see you. Guilford's the name, buddy. Dr. Lynch, tell me something now, please. I'm not Dr. Lynch. Doctor, why don't I wake up? Wake up, Billy? Yeah, let me go back now. As bad as it is in Casarina, I am more at home there. I want to wake up now, Herr Doctor. Billy. Billy, look at me. Who am I? Oh, Herr Dr. Erich Lind, you understand me. You believe me. You know I have been slipping into these fantasies and living in them. You told me this morning. It's normal. The human mind can stand only so much torment. And then it replaces reality with fantasy and saves our sanity. You told me this morning. This morning? Where? In your dispensary. In what city? What city? In the village of Casarina. In the year 1943? Yes. What did you do after you, you visited the dispensary? Well, I, I walked with Tyson to the mud, and, and we got some mail from home. And then what did you do? Uh, and since the shelling began, oh, the Americans began bombarding the village, and Oberleutnant Berger ordered us to take a radio set and reconnoiter the American artillery position. Yes, yes, and then what happened? And a squad of Americans saw us, and we, we hid from them. And they fired mortar shells on us, and... Uh, Tyson was killed! Tyson, you were killed! You were dead in the mud, blown to pieces! I saw you! Hey, ease it up, Willie. Hold on, Billy, hold on. But you weren't killed, and that must have been a dream. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Tyson. The name is Keating, Willie. Officer Keating. Keating, you and Guilford, go on back downstairs. But, Captain, Go on, I... go on. I'll be fine. Yes, sir. Come on, Gil. Billy, do you have any identification on you? Identification? Yeah. Here, my wallet. Uh, it's soaked with uh, rain. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you mind? Yeah. The, these pictures. Who is this? Oh, that, that's my mother. My family, see? That's my dog. Oh. Mother of mercy. Yeah, Dr. Lynch. Why do you look at me? Billy, through some terrible mistake or, or some miracle, I don't know which, you come into the future. Oh, it's my sickness here, Doctor. I find myself in, in these fantasies, and yet they seem real. But this is real, Billy. You have traveled 32 years into the future. Yeah, the future. The world we were fighting to build. A world of peace. A world of order. And here it is. All built. The Fuhrer was right. Down there, there is peace on the street, yeah? Peace on the street? And plenty to eat for everyone, nicht wahr? Because that's what we were fighting for. Justice and order. Peace and order. Billy, that's what both sides were fighting for. Both sides? Peace, justice, freedom. Yeah, yeah peace, justice, freedom. I must look out at this peaceful future world. Keep away from that window, Billy. Billy! Billy! What, what are they doing? I just wanted well, to... Listen to me, Billy. The world out there is one big armed camp. We have snipers shooting down civilians, mass murderers, devil worshippers, rapists, arsonists, distrust and suspicion. Nine! Nine! We fought to purify the world! And we fought to save freedom and decency. Freedom! Freedom and decency. Good things to fight for, Herr Doctor. Good things to fight for. Yes, we fought for them. We fought each other for them. But that was 32 years ago. No, no, that was today. Only this morning. There's still a war to be won. Where do you think you're going? I'm going back. Come back, husband. They'll cut you down out there. Come back. Let me escort you. You can't escort me there. I have to go. Captain Parks. Husband! Don't go into the streets! Not with your weapon! There's a war to be won! There he is! Husman! Freeze! I'm coming! I'm coming! Stop where you are and drop your gun! I'm coming home! Stop or we'll shoot! You can't stop me now! He's firing! Let him have it!
Well, as we said at the beginning, the strange tale of Billy Houseman had its start on February 19, 1943, in the village of Kasserine in North Africa. But did it end for him a few hours later in a mortar attack? Or did it end 32 years later on a street in the United States? While you ponder that, we'll take this time out, and then I'll be back. Tonight, Crisis presented a special hour-long story titled Panzerlied and featured in our cast Paul Herlinger, Ross Perry, Walter Krauss, Pat French, and as Willie Hausman, Griff Cadnier. Script and production by yours truly, Jim French. Plan to join us next Thursday night, won't you? Until then, thank you for listening, and good night. sleepy this morning, and I... Uh, just... You've got $200,000 in my life, and I need to know how much cash I could raise in that insurance. Uh, well, uh, do you have the policies there with you? Uh, they're in my safe deposit box uh, at the bank. Well, I couldn't tell you exactly right now. They'd be worth uh, considerable as collateral if you wanted to borrow on them, George. Uh, no, no, I don't mean that. Uh, listen, Jim, I need cash immediately. Isn't there some way I, I can... Uh, or cash them in. Well, uh, I'd be ashamed to do that, George. Now, uh, you do have some dividends that are due How you. much? Well, I wouldn't know until I check. I'd be glad to do that tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, I never advise borrowing on life insurance, but uh, if you could use the policies as collateral for a loan, that's probably your best bet if you need a, a lot of money. Uh, no. Uh, George? Uh... Are you in trouble? Uh, uh, no, 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 Jim. I, I'm not in trouble. I, I just, uh, well, I, I have an opportunity to invest in, uh, in something. And uh... <laughs> at half past one in the morning. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I know it's late. Are you sure you're not in some kind of trouble? Nah, nah, nothing like that. Uh, but just forget it, Jim. No, I'd, I'd like to help if I like. Huh? Uh, go on back to sleep. Uh, Uh, George? (laughs) Go on back to sleep. Oh, sure. Let's see. What's his phone number? Got it here in my address book somewhere. There it is. That guy is in some kind of hassle. This is Jim Tatum. Say, could you put George back on the phone for just a minute? George? I thought... I thought you were George calling. No, but he... Oh, you mean he's not there? No. Oh, well, see, he just called me, and I thought... Oh, when? That... Well, just now, just a minute ago, not even that long. He didn't say where he was? 
Oh, well, no, no he, he didn't. Oh. oh I hope I... Uh, uh, is there anything wrong, Helen? George had a phone call around 8 o'clock tonight. Last night. And I was terribly agitated by it, and he just got up and drove out. And I haven't the faintest idea where he went. 8 o'clock? Hmm, it's one thirty now. Why did he call you, Jim? Oh, he, he sounded fine, Helen. I'm sure he's okay. What did he say? Well, he wanted to know how much his insurance is worth in cash. He claimed he wanted to invest in something. What? Well, I told him there was no way I could get the data tonight. I tried to discourage him from borrowing but on he it. Of course, didn't say where he was phoning from. No, I assumed he'd be home at this hour. No. Maybe at his office. He's not there. Jim, George is in some kind of trouble. Or he wouldn't have called you. He would have called me. Oh, Lord. Where is he and what's happened to him? The Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. Who says insurance agents lead dull and uneventful lives? If you're like Jim Tatum, you're an agent who does more than just sell insurance and collect commissions. You get close to your clients and try to be helpful to them. So that when a call comes in the wee hours, you can't just roll over and go back to sleep. You worry. And you act. We'll find out what Jim Tatum does next when we return with the rest of tonight's suspenseful crisis. A yarn entitled, The Risk. convenience and the place to buy your genie is northwest electronics in ballard ray tolbert offers genies fully installed with a one-year parts and labor warranty for as little as 149 dollars northwest electronics will service existing openers too for a no obligation estimate on the right genie for your home for both safety and convenience phone 783-1479 northwest electronics in ballard 783-1479 You'll like the personal service and attention Ray offers, and the competitive pricing, too. Genie Garage Door Openers, available from Northwest Electronics in Ballard. For more information, phone 783-1479. That's 783-1479. Good morning, Mr. Tatum. Hmm? Oh, hi. Good morning, Karen. Any calls? Right here. Okay. I slept in. Big night? Oh, no, 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 not that kind. Well, now that you're a bachelor... I haven't learned how to be a bachelor yet. Gotta learn. Yeah. I'm gonna be on the phone for a bit. Okay. Uh, George Carter, please. Well, Mr. Carter isn't in his office. May I take a message? Uh, yes, tell him to call Jim Tatum. That's T-A-T-U-M. And the number? 831-6601. Thank you. I'll see that he gets the message. Thank you. Goodbye. James Tatum. Jim? George, where are you? I was just calling your office. I'm not at the office, sir. I'm in the emergency room at the county hospital. Uh, could you come pick me up? What happened? Got hit by a car. When? About an hour ago. Well, are you all right? I'm uh, just bruised. You sure? I have x-rayed my arm because it hurts. Just bruised. I'm sorry to get you down here like this. Are you kidding? I've been trying to find you since you called at 1.30 this morning. You have called your wife. No. Well, she's worried sick, man. Let's call her and let her know you're still among the living, and then I'll get you home, and you can have Just, a night. Just uh, drive me to my car, will you, Jim? 
Well, what do you mean? You can't drive now. Sure I can. Listen, let's go home and you clean up and then... Uh, then you tell me about this investment of yours. Investment? Uh, oh, uh, no. Uh, never mind. Too late for it? <laughs> yeah. Just a little. Look, uh, George... I know something is wrong. You wouldn't tell Helen. Well, okay, you don't want her to worry, but tell me. I mean, maybe I can help. Nothing to tell. I I needed some capital in a hurry, a big Alaska deal, hush-hush. And Helen wouldn't approve. Yeah, you know how it is. You're married. Well, I was. Oh? Yeah, my divorce was final a month or so ago. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know. Well, we haven't gotten together in over a year, George. I've tried to get an appointment with you to go over your insurance program, but... I know. I, I've always been so darn busy. Uh, listen, Jim, don't take me home. I, just keep driving around, okay? Okay. Jim, I, I'm going to tell you something. Right now, I don't think there's anyone else I, I, I can tell this to. Well, all right, go ahead. Jim, you, you're right. I'm in trouble. Big trouble. Uh, this accident I had this morning... It wasn't an accident. What do you mean? Well, I walked in front of the car. Deliberately. What do you say? That I was trying to commit suicide. Why? <laughs> no other way. Absolutely no other way. Well, well what is it? Last, last night when I called you, I, I found out that uh, in a matter of days, maybe hours, McCarthy and White are going to discover they're short uh, a lot of money. Oh. Jim, this is the kind of a trap a, a guy gets himself into. There, there was an Alaska deal. I, I heard about it by accident. I had a chance to quadruple my money inside of 60 days. If I could come into a business venture with uh, $50,000... Cash. I was supposed to walk out in 60 days with a profit of $150,000. Hmm. But you didn't have the 50000 to invest, so... Uh, yeah, you stole it from your company. Don't you see? I I wouldn't have kept it. I, I put back every cent. All, all I needed was to borrow the money, borrow it, so I could invest. I see. Well, what happened? Well... What happened was McCarthy and, and White had been holding secret merger talks with another company, and things got to the point where, where they've ordered an audit. Uh-oh. I didn't know anything about the merger or the audit. Until last night, I, I, I got a call at home from McCarthy. Seems, seems he wanted to see me at his office right away. Well, I... I knew what had happened. He decided to take the cash out of the office safe, and he found it was gone. Well, how would he know you took it? Because only three people have the combination. McCarthy, White, and me, the Comptroller. So, uh, what'd you tell McCarthy? I stalled him. I, I told him I removed the cash and put it in the bank for safekeeping. He'd buy that? Well, he was sore because he thought I I should have asked him or White before I did it, but I I think I think he bought it, yeah. And then this morning you figured to get yourself killed so your wife could get the insurance money and be able to pay back uh, McCarthy. Yeah. It wouldn't have worked, you know. Well, the insurance company would have done a little routine check on you and they'd have uncovered the embezzlement. <laughs> You mean they, they wouldn't have paid Helen anything? Hey, it may come as a shock to you, George, but before an insurance company will pay out a $200,000 debt settlement, they make darn sure there's no chance of fraud. I mean, for that kind of money, they'll go to court if they smell a rat. <laughs> uh, then I'm sunk. What'll I do, Jim? This uh, Alaska deal, you think it could still pan out? <laughs> that chance. Huh. Well, that leaves... Uh... That leaves just about one alternative. Jail. No. No, no, I was... Uh, what? Well, I was thinking... You got an idea? No, 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 no. Wait, there's too much risk in it. Well, wait, wait, wait. Give it to me. Now, what I was thinking was... Do you think Helen would stand by you if uh, she knew what you'd done? Well, I think she would. I think she would, yes. How far do you think she'd go to keep you out of prison? <sighs> she'd do anything. I know she would. Mm. 
Mr. McCarthy? This is Helen Carter, George Carter's wife. George is terribly ill. A stroke. He's paralyzed. Y yes, yes, very sudden. L last night. But he, he managed to tell me something. He, he said you'd understand. He scribbled out a phone number and said something about a, a bank. Y yes, yes, it's 831-6601. Do you have it? No, we don't know yet. Yes, yes, we'll keep in touch. No, nothing right now. But he seemed to think that you'd want the number of that bank. 831-6601. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, beautiful. Oh, I feel like such a cheat. Oh, you did beautifully, Helen. Now, let's just hang on a minute and see what happens. You're sure your secretary out there won't pick up the phone? No, no, no. This is a direct line. Uh huh. What did I tell you? <clears throat> uh, Trust Department, Emerson speaking. Now, this is Mr. Emerson, Trust Department. Uh, who did you want to speak to? Why, uh, this is the First Mercantile Savings and Trust Company. I'm the trust officer. Is there something I can do for you? Carter. Oh, Mr. George Carter. Uh, oh, yes, he's one of our clients. And uh, you are uh, who, please? Ah, uh, Mr. McCarthy, yes. Uh, Mr. Carter was here the other day, last week sometime, the day he placed uh, $50,000 in trust for your firm. Well, surely he told you about it. I assumed that as comptroller he was acting upon your orders. Why, the reason he did it was because he feared burglary, Mr. McCarthy. That's why he placed the funds in trust, is that... What? He has... I'm, I'm terribly sorry to hear that. When did that... Well, that is a shock. Such a fine man and so young to have a stroke. The money... Yes, it's in a trust account to be administered by us as your firm directs. Uh, surely you're not withdrawing it already. Oh, I see. An audit. Well, we'll be happy to send you a duplicate of the trust papers. Certainly. Well, nice of you to call. Y yes. Goodbye. Oh, <laughs> trust officer Emerson. Hey, you should have been an actor, Jim. Well, this buys us the time we need anyway, but now comes the tough part. Helen, can you do it? We're committed, aren't we? I have to do it. Okay. Go home, do like I told you, and I'll take care of everything else. restaurant that never closes proudly presents some delicious additions to its menu. The Superbird Sandwich, a grilled combination of turkey, bacon, cheese, and tomato. The Amigo Burger, a juicy hamburger topped with green chili peppers and jack cheese. The Knockwurst Reuben, zesty knockwurst combined with Swiss cheese, sauerkraut, and Denny's special dressing on grilled dry bread. Two terrific new desserts, strawberry shortcake and carrot cake. And a very special Sunday brunch. Eggs Benedict. Not bad for a place that some people still think of as a coffee shop. When you want a good restaurant that's always open, go to Denny's. In Tacoma, there's an always open Denny's restaurant at 10802 Pacific Avenue South. And in Fife, Denny's is located on Interstate 5. Okay, Karen, this is the file on George Carter. Now, here's the death certificate. Now, you clip that to the copy of his policies, and here's the claim pay voucher. Now, be sure you get this processed as soon as you can. The widow has a terrible burden to bear right about now. Sure. You knew them pretty well, didn't you? Yeah, I did. I knew George very well. Times like this, you, you feel grief because you've lost somebody close to you, but you feel kind of proud to know you were able to help keep his plans alive for the future. You're a pretty good guy, Mr. Taven. <laughs> Just doing my job, Karen. Oh, Jim, come in. How's everything? All right. Do you have the insurance check? Well, not yet. Well, how much longer will it take? 
Do you think something's gone wrong? Oh, no. We should have it in a day or so, huh? Then what have you got there? Well, I brought over the list of expenses I incurred on our little deception for the uh, death certificate, the funeral arrangements, uh, pay off to the mortician, plus a few incidentals. How much? It came to exactly $14,821. How much? <laughs> Forgery, bribes, you're talking pretty big money, Helen. That was a darn nice funeral. Well, it'll be worth it just to get this whole thing wrapped up. Well, uh, that won't completely wrap it up. When you and George leave the country, you can't just drive across the border with a dead man's identification. We, we've got to provide you with, I mean, provide George with new ID, social security card, driver's license, credit cards, that sort of... How much will that cost? Well, I think the same gentleman who did our death certificate will handle the other details uh, for uh, another ten. Ten thousand? Well, it's like he explained it to me. You forge a county death certificate, that's one thing, but a social security card, that's a federal wrap. But 10000 on top of almost 15000 So it's costing you 25000 to get $200,000. That's a pretty fair return on your investment, wouldn't you agree? All right, Jim. Let's clear the air. What other little surprises do you have up your sleeve? Now, listen here, Helen. I don't like your tone of voice. It so happens your dear husband would be in the state prison making license plates right now, and you wouldn't have a dime if I hadn't been willing to take the risk. You realize what I've done for you? I've stolen $200,000 for you and George to help you cover up George's theft of $50,000 from his boss. George is legally dead. You're his widow. In a few days, you'll inherit a fortune. All you have to do is... Pay off a crooked doctor, a crooked mortician, a forger... And a crooked insurance man. How big is your cut? You know, by golly, we never did talk about my cut, did we? Well, uh, the figure that comes to mind is uh, is 50. Well, well, well. You want uh, 50,000 on top of 25,000? Oh, hello, George. Hey, you're getting fat. Can't you rig up some kind of little exercise here in the house? You're almost as heavy as I am. <laughs> Yeah, I've been working on it. Well, since I can't stick my nose out of the house... George, he wants almost $75,000 altogether. Fifty for himself, and he says... Yeah, yeah, and almost 25000 to pay out the other people. I heard. That's too much, Jim. That, it's fair. Way too much. Now, you won't feel that way when I bring you that two hundred grand payoff tomorrow or the next day. You just wait and see. Well, I've got to get back to the office now. And, George, really, don't just lie around. You want to be able to enjoy your new life in South America, don't you? Well, honey, we get across into Tijuana and we got it made. I won't be able to believe it. Good old Jim. First thing I'm going to do is buy a bottle of tequila and drink a toast to Jim Tatum, who made it all possible. Look, the line's moving. Yeah. Now, don't be nervous. I'm not nervous. When it started, senor? Good afternoon. May I see your papers, please? Uh, papers? Some identification. Your driver's license, perhaps? Oh, oh sure. Yeah. Uh, here you go. You are James Tatum? That's right. You will come with me, please. Well, what's the matter? I, I, I am James Tatum. Look, here's my uh, social security card, uh, my credit card. Thank uh, you, Mr. Tatum. I appreciate your cooperation. Now come with me, please. Why? To... What do you want? We have been waiting for you, Mr. Tatum. You were wanted by American authorities for fraud and grand theft. And also for questioning in the death of a client of yours, a Mr. George Carter. Do not make trouble, please, Mr. Tatum. <laughs> George put Jim Tatum out of the way and exchanged identities with him, he thought he'd be able to start a new life. What he failed to reckon was that he had traded the life of one criminal for the life of another. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. I'll be back in just a minute with the names of tonight's players and a scene from next week's program. West and 
starting February 1st, you can save 30%. Nobody has a lower fare. Northwest's new excursion fares give you more savings to more cities. You can save 30% round trip compared to normal coach fare on most Northwest flights within the continental U.S. Of course, there are some simple qualifications, including advanced ticketing. So for full details, call a travel agent or Northwest now. You'll save 30% round trip. Save $85 round trip to Chicago. Ask your travel agent or Northwest about qualifications. And now a word about our next crisis radio drama. Did you ever lie on your back outside under the darkening sky, waiting for twilight and the appearance of the first star of the evening? And did you ever see a shooting star and watch it arc across the sky and see it fall just beyond the horizon? You know, when you're a certain age, you believe with all your heart that you could find that star that fell, that you could pinpoint exactly where it landed. It did so fall in the lake. In fact, there it is, shining through the trees. Ma! Daddy! They wouldn't let me go to see it. So I'm just going to go all by myself. Our program next is called Starlight, Star Bright. And it features the proposition that you can't always ignore a child's imagination. Join us Thursday at 7.05. The Risk featured Ray Court as George Carter, Pat French as Helen, Jan Reddick as Karen, and Russ Money as the Mexican border officer with yours truly Jim French as Jim Tatum. West Radio Network presents Crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, Trafford's department store is now closing for the evening. We will open again at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Good night, Merry Christmas, and thank you for shopping at Trafford's. Well, Santa, it's 10 o'clock. Only three more days of ho-ho-hoing. Think you can last it out? Of course I can. Easiest job I ever did have. Well, we're certainly glad you could help us out again this season in the toy department. It isn't every store that has a Santa with his very own white beard. <laughs> well, only reason I ever grew it was because it got to be too darn much trouble to shave every day or so. <laughs> well, you look wonderful with it. Just like Santa Claus. Does Mrs. Jacobson like it? There isn't any Mrs. Jacobson anymore. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, she's been gone 15 years now. My husband passed away not quite six years ago. If I hadn't gotten this job managing the toy department, I don't know what I'd have done. Yes. Well, we certainly didn't have much business this evening. The snow, I suppose. Huh? Call this a snowstorm? Nothing like the kind they used to have back where I came from. Oh, where was that, Mr. Jacobson? Ever hear of Goose Egg, Wyoming? <laughs> Goose Egg? You have to be kidding. No, sir, Goose Egg, Wyoming. Just a few miles this side of old Casper, you know, on, the, on the North Platte River. I'll tell you, we used to get some real winters there. Why, there was uh, one excuse time... Excuse me, Mr. Jacobson. I've got to close out the cash registers while we talk. Oh, well, you go ahead, Mrs. Wells. I, I'll just get on home. Uh, Mr. Jacobson. Yeah? I just thought of something. Would you by any chance be taking the bus home? Uh-huh. Why don't you let me run you home in my car? I was thinking we could stop by my house on the way for a hot drink and and maybe a piece of mince pie. Do you like mince pie? Mince? Nothing I like better. Good. All right, Mrs. Welch, you got yourself a deal. And it, I'll pay you back. I, I'll tell you the story of Macumba and his miracle tonic. Best Christmas story I know. And it all started in Goose Egg. Tonight, Crisis brings you a strange sort of Christmas tale. A story about a very different kind of Christmas spirit, as told by Jake Jacobson, the Santa Claus down at the department store. In just a minute, 
McCumber's Miracle Tonic. Now, Crisis brings you McCumber's Miracle Tonic. Here's your pie, Mr. Jacobson. Oh. How is it? Oh, it... <laughs> This is good by Mrs. Welch. Prime, first rate. Oh, well, I'm glad you like it. Now, I'm going to tell you about McCumber. McCumber? Fellow with a magic tonic. I told you I was going to tell you about him back in the store. Oh, yes, of course. Well, you see, my daddy brought the family out to Wyoming when it was still a territory and set up a little shop repairing wagons. We were just outside Casper. In Goose Egg. In Goose Egg, that's right. Oh, you know about Goose Egg? Oh, no, you mentioned it back at the store. Oh, so I did. But, well, anyway, my daddy come from Norway, and everybody called him a dumb Swede, which, of course, he wasn't. He was Norwegian. But anyway, people made fun of him all the time, and every peddler left on the Oregon Trail made it a point to, to look daddy up, try to sell him whatever it was they had for sale. And poor mama, you know, Mrs. Welch, you look a little bit like my mama did when, you, when she was your age. Do I? Quite a bit. Well, as I was saying, Mama would take pity on every stranger you stopped by the cabin, and that, that even included people everybody knew were just crooks. Well, he had a real bad winter one year, year before I was born. Matter of fact, I think that, I think they said it was. That'd make it uh, 1895 to thereabouts. And they took in this girl. Don't know what her name was. Uh, Sally, I think. Uh, I think they said her name was Sally. Anyway, she was all alone on the trail out of Casper when she saw smoke coming out of our chimney and stopped in to get warm. Sure, I'm grateful to you for letting me come and sit by your fire, Mrs. Jacobson. You're most welcome. I suppose you're wondering what a girl like me is doing alone on the trail. I would never have asked, Sally, but I am a bit troubled. I'm running away. Oh? And who are you running away from? Your folks? I, I, I'm not running away from anyone. I'm, I'm running to catch up with a man, my sweetheart. And where might he be? Well, he'd be almost to the Rockies by now, this time of year. Oh, well, you see, he, he's running too. Oh, from the law? Yes. Oh, only he's innocent. Well, he never hurt no one. Only he couldn't prove it, so he, so he had to run, don't you see? Because no one would believe him. Oh, my dear, it's too dangerous for you to be on the trail alone. And it's almost Christmas. It don't matter. Well, nothing to keep me in Casper no more. And in my place is with Jonah. Well, how do you expect to catch up with Jonah? I don't know. But I have to. I'll keep going day and night. It's getting too, too dark to work anymore. Hello, dear. Hello, Sally. Are you getting warm now? Oh, I'm fine, Mr. Jacobson. Now i got to go. Go? Tonight? It's starting to snow. You can't go out tonight. You stay here with us. I'd, I'd sure like to, but I'll never catch up with Jonah if I don't get going. Sally, the trail is no place for a woman all by herself. Oh, I can make it. Now i got to get a move on. Well, I, I don't know. There's a wind coming up. Mr. Jacobson, I appreciate the way you feel, but my mind's made up. Well, you must let me fix you a good hot supper before you go. And I'll make something for you to eat on the trail when you get hungry. You're awful nice to me. I, I sure wish I could pay you back some way. Oh, nonsense. There's there's no moon out tonight either, Sally. The trail gets terribly dark. Now, now why is old Rex barking like that? Well, maybe someone's coming. Let me see. Oh, yes, there's a wagon out there. A wagon? Probably wants repairs. You go ahead, start the supper, and I'll see what, see what needs to be done. I'll be glad to help you, let me. Quiet down, Rex. Hello? Hello? What can I do for you? Would you be Mr. Jacobson? Yeah, I'm Mr. Jacobson. McCumber's the name. Dr. Horace P. McCumber. Developer of McCumber's Miracle Tonic. Oh, yeah, I see you on the side of your wagon. Uh, they tell me in town you repair things like broken wagon wheels at uh, reasonable rates. Yeah, I do. That I do. Well, my left rear wheel has uh, taken to wobbling. Let me have it. Let me have it. Look at it. Yeah, it's loose all right. 
Uh, can you fix it? Oh, sure. Are you in a hurry? Well, I want to get over the Rockies before the winter storms set in. There's a lot of folks out there who'll be needing to stock up on the Miracle Tonic. Best thing in the world for everything from chill blains to appendicitis. Well, just drive a few minutes around back. There's a place for animals and a shed for the wagon. Then if you haven't had your supper, why don't you come inside? Well, that's how McCumber and Sally met up. Dad, he worked on into the night repairing the wagon wheel. Mama made a good hot supper. Sally, she was smart enough to figure out a way to wangle a ride west in McCumber's wagon. Where do you get your miracle tonic, Mr. McCumber? That's Dr. McCumber. And I'm, I make it myself. What's it made of? Ah, my dear, that's the secret. A combination of beneficial herbs and roots brewed from a recipe entrusted to me on his deathbed by the great chief of the Ojibwe's, a tribal medicine handed down from antiquity. No doubt you are aware that the Ojibwe's enjoy amazingly good health and are known for their remarkable longevity. Why, Chief Eagleheart was believed to have lived to the age of 120 years, my dear, when he finally slipped away to that happy hunting ground. But not before he confided in me the secret of the elixir, which accounted for the tribe's great courage, handsome children, and incredible resistance to all manner of disease. And that is how it is now possible for anyone, man or boy, with the price of a single dollar, to enjoy the self-same miracle tonic today. How many bottles would you like? I may not pass this way again. Uh, well, you see, I haven't got any money to speak of. Oh, I, I see. But, well, I've got to get back on the Oregon Trail. You're all alone, Sally? Yes. At Christmas time. Ah, melancholy time for those of us who travel life's trails alone. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to catch up with my sweetheart by Christmas. But no, it just doesn't look like I'll make it. You have a horse? Yes, but not a very good one. I, um... I don't suppose you'd be willing to take me along with you. I, I could help. I could cook and I could, I could help sell the Miracle Tonic. And I wouldn't be any trouble. Well, now, I don't oh, know. Oh, please, Mr. McCumber. Uh, Dr. McCumber. Dr. McCumber, if, if I don't get away from Wyoming, I just don't know what will happen to me. Well, old Horace McCumber gave in, and next morning, soon as Daddy got the wheel repaired, McCumber and Sally set off down the trail in the wagon. McCumber's mule in the traces and Sally's sorry old mare tied on behind. Three days before Christmas it was, and threatening weather, and neither one of them knowing what they was about to run into. That poor girl. Was she warm enough? Well, I don't reckon anyone was ever warm enough in a Wyoming winter in those days. Ah, but the worst was yet to come, like they say. morning, along the Oregon Trail, the temperature began to drop, and big black clouds boiled in over the Shoshone Basin and piled up against the Rattlesnake Range. Now, Doc McCumber's wagon was pretty snug. It had a big wooden tailgate with crates of tonic bottles lashed to it, blankets and bedrolls and cooking gear inside, and it even had an Edison talking machine, a kind that played cylinder records through a big morning glory horn. But even with all that truck inside, it was, it was bleak country they was traveling through. Lonely country. Can't we go any faster? You'll have to ask Salome. Salome? My mule. Oh, can't you make her move just a little faster than she's going? Nope. This is just about her regular speed. I'll never catch up with Jonah. Tell me something, Sally. Is Jonah expecting you? Well, sure he is. He knows I'd come to him, no, no matter where he'd run off to. Well, if he's running from the law, you think he wants a woman slowing him down? But I wouldn't slow him down. I could ride fast as any man. I could show you. Oh. Oh, it's starting to snow again. Yeah, well, that it is. Well, the sky grew darker and darker, and a wind come up, and the snow blew into the wagon. 
How can you see where we're going? I can't. What if we run off the trail? I leave that up to Salome. She's never failed me yet. Salome? You let a mule do your thinking for you? I'm trying to tell you. She's down there feeling the trail. We're up here in the wagon. The snow keeps up. There isn't going to be any trail. Hey, where are you going? Girl, what are you digging for back in the wagon? I'm getting my things and getting out of here. You can stay here plodding behind your mule if you want to. But I'm taking my horse and I'm getting down the trail. Whoa, Salome. Sally, wait a minute. Thanks for the buggy ride, Mr. McCumber. I hope you get where you're going. So long. Hey, girl. Girl. Sally. How many times I have to tell you, it's not mister, it's doctor. Sally untied her horse from behind the wagon and rode off into the snowstorm. McCumber, he started up again. But now the trail was completely blotted out by the snow. More every minute. Four or five hours went by. Salome would put her head down into the blizzard, feel with one hoof, gradually ease forward, then feel with another. She inherited her sure-footedness from her daddy, who was a donkey, and a strong body from her mama, who was a mare. But up in the wagon sat Doc McCumber. Numb with cold, all wrapped up in an Indian blanket, frost and ice in his beard and eyebrows, but beginning to burn with fever. Keep on going, Salome. Got to keep on going. The old mule inched along, pulling the wagon until darkness fell altogether. The old man sat in the wagon, his mind so near frozen that he didn't know what to do. No telling how long it was before he realized Salome wasn't moving and hadn't moved for some time. When he did realize it, he moved his joints slow like it, like it'd crack if he put on any speed at all. The snow on the blanket turned to ice and it cracked into splinters as he got painfully down from the wagon and walked up to that mule. Salome, you can't stop now, girl. You can't leave us out here tonight. Come on, please, old girl. Just another mile. Find us some shelter. For you and me, I thought we ain't gonna make it. Come, come on, old girl. I'll try and I'll try and lead you for a ways. Come on, now, come on. But that mule wouldn't budge an inch. McCumber, he tugged and he pulled, but the mule just wouldn't move. And then. Through the blowing snow, McCumber saw something up ahead. A little white mound. He stared at it. His frozen brain trying to identify it. And then he st- stumbled off toward it. He stopped beside it and slowly knelt down. Oh, oh no. No! Sally? Sally, girl? Sure enough, it was Sally. She was alive, but barely breathing. McCumber figured she'd been lying there about a half an hour. From the snow that covered her, he struggled to get her on her feet when she came to. It's me, Sally. Dr. McCumber. Come on, I'll I'll walk you in the wagon. I can't walk. My leg broken. My horse fell. Your leg? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Yes, I see. Sally, girl, I'm going to pick you up and carry you back to the wagon. Up you go now. Nobody knows how McCumber managed to struggle back to that wagon with Sally on his back. But he did. Got her as comfortable as possible in the back of the wagon. She was she was out of the wind now, but still half frozen from the cold. Oh, Mr. McCumber... We clear off the trail. My horse strayed. Now it fell over something. I, I shot him. Shot him? You had a gun? With this gun. It's yours. I, I took it from the wagon when I lit out. That's all right, girl. 
Oh, we lost Mr. McCumber. And I'm hurt real bad. Yeah, I know you are. Can, can't you do something for me? Maybe I can, girl. Listen, Sally. Sally, girl, now, you, you drink a bottle of this. What is it? It's my tonic. McCumber's Miracle Tonic. What do I want with that? I need some coffee or a brandy. Yeah, I know you do. We can't get a fire started in this wind. Now you you got to get something in your stomach. Go on now. Drink it. All right. Well, how do you like it? I, I, I don't know. Where are you taking the crate? It's all I've got between us and the blizzard, girl. It's been a long time since Salome had a drink. Well, you're not giving the mule this stuff. It's all I got is the tonic. You know what you are, Mr. McCumber. You're crazy. You were plum crazy. McCumber uncorked six bottles and poured them into the leather water bucket for the mule. There you go, Salome. Drink hearty, old dear. And find us some shelter. Well, the mule stuck her frost-covered nose into the bucket and jumped it back out again. She nickered and tossed her head. She laid her long ears back and shuddered. Then, after, a, after looking a long time at the haggard face of the old McCumber, she gingerly stuck her nose back into the bucket and began to lap it up. Back in the wagon again, McCumber and Sally lay shivering, burning up with fever. The, the wagon's moving. Yeah, I can, I can feel it. Let me look. Oh, no. No. What, what is it? Oh, Sally girl, I've really done it now. Poor old Salome. She's weaving back and forth in the, in the traces. She can't stand up. You made her drink the tonic? It's all I had. What's in this stuff anyway? Well, you know, I can't, can't tell you that. It's a trade, trade secret. I thought you listen here, old man. We're going to die out here. What did you put in this tonic? It's a tribal secret of the old Jimaways. And trusted to me by... by... Oh. For two whole days, the storm lashed the Great Plains, piling up drifts ten feet high. There were thousands of cattle caught on the rangelands and froze huddled together. The ice snapped the telegraph wires. Nothing moved on that prairie but the wind. Then what happened to McCumber and Sally? Christmas morning, Sally, she awoke. She was raging with fever. Mr. McCumber, Mr. McCumber. Let me alone, girl. Let me die. Mr. McCumber, it's, it's getting light. You know what day this is? It's Christmas morning. Oh, what a day to die. And we're not moving anymore. Well, no, we're not. Let's see now. Oh, Salome. What? Salome, she's frozen in her tracks. I drove her to this. I pushed her too far. She was the most loyal friend a man could ever have. A finer, stronger beast never lived. Where are you going, Mr. McCumber? I did this to you, Salome. I, you poor, faithful old friend. You dragged us until you could pull no more. But where have you taken us, Salome? Where are we? Look! Huh? Look, Mr. McCumber. Look over there. Smoke. Yeah, you're right. Good merciful heavens, it's a cabin. Salome, you have saved our lives.
With his last ounce of energy, McCumber helped Sally down from the wagon. And together they plowed through the snow over half a mile to the door of that cabin, now most covered with drifted snow. Together, the half-frozen pair pounded on the door. When it opened, they saw inside a roaring fire, a small fir tree with candles lit, candy canes, and from inside came the aroma of fresh bacon. And standing in the doorway, a, a ruddy-cheeked young man with a dumbfounded look on his face. Who is it, dear? Come hurry, Annie. It's Sally and Dr. McCumber. So you see, under the influence of McCumber's miracle tonic, a miracle did happen. That poor old mule had made a big circle out in the wilderness of Wyoming. It brought them right back to Papa's door. That's a wonderful Christmas story, Mr. Jacobson. I trust Sally and Dr. McCumber survived. Oh, sure they did. Not only that. But when the storm was over, they, they went out back to the wagon and fed the last bottles of that miracle tonic to Salome. And she survived to enjoy many more Christmases with Dr. Horace P. McCumber. Or at least, that's what I remember Papa told me. Tonight, Crisis presented McCumber's Miracle Tonic, written especially for Crisis, and featuring Jay Green, Pat French, Tony Karloff, and Lee Posh. Engineering by Carney Barton, script and direction by yours truly, Jim French. Crisis is produced at Audio Recording Incorporated. Be with us next Thursday at 10 for Crisis, and join Harry Nile at this time Tuesday nights for detective action from the 1940s. And now, a Merry Christmas from all of us on Crisis. Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. Dear Jean, by the time you read this note, it will all be over. Everything. My career, my stab at politics, my standing in this town, our marriage, and my life. But I want you to know I didn't plan it this way. It was the consequence of one event on top of another. By now, what I've done will be front-page news. But I want you to know what happened. What really happened. It's the least I can do now, to be totally honest with you, after being your husband for almost 25 years. So let me begin at the beginning. Which was the night after I'd announced my candidacy for mayor. You remember... We'd thrown a little dinner party for some more influential friends. And after the last of them left, you and I had one final drink on the patio before turning in. Here, there's just an inch left in this bottle. All right, Jane, pour it. And let me get out of this tie. You know, I thought it went off quite nicely. Yes, it did. It did. Nice people. Good people. Oh, Lord, I hope I don't let them down. Why should you? Well, it isn't that I think I will. I I just... Well, I'm beginning to feel the weight of responsibility now. Jeannie, if I'm lucky enough to win this... Here. Uh, Here's to Mayor James G. Hadley. The best mayor the city ever had. I'll get it. Uh, Hadley here. Jim Hadley, you old son of a gun. Yeah, who's this? Centerville High, to you we will be true. Where we go. We'll always wear the crimson and the blue. <laughs> who is this? Jimmy, you'll never guess who this is in a million years. All right, all right, I give up. Who is it? You and I haven't laid eyes on each other for a long, long time, Jimmy, my boy. But I've been following your career. Oh, you bet. And I see by the papers that you're throwing your hat in the ring. Oh, come on now. Who is this? Gonna reform City Hall, huh? 
You know what I did when I read that, Jimmy? I laughed. Yeah, I had a good laugh. Because, see, Jimmy, you and I go back a long ways together. Okay, okay. Now, I'll tell you what. You tell me your name and then we'll... And I remember a lot of things, Jimmy. A lot of things. You may have forgotten I see, I see. I'm beginning not to care who this is. And I got to thinking, I bet old Jim Hadley would like to know what I know. And then I got to thinking, I'll bet a lot of people would like to know what I know. You're getting a little tiresome, friend. If you'll excuse me, it's late. You see, Jimmy, you see, I saw what you did. the intolerable conditions in life that a person may experience, domination by another must be among the worst. Tonight we hear the story of an average man, perhaps a better than average man, and his disintegration. In a minute, Don Briggs returns in the role of solid citizen James Hadley in our crisis tale of suspense entitled, I Saw What You Did. And now, crisis. What are you talking about? I said, I saw what you did. I don't understand. And I've kept quiet about it all this time. But now that you're running for public office, it seems like the whole thing ought to come out. Doesn't it to you? Well, now, you listen to me, whoever you are. If you think you can intimidate me with this trick, you've got another thing coming. I have nothing in my past I'm the least ashamed of, and I'm not afraid of... I forgot one little detail about that little matter. I've got proof of what you did. Proof. You sure you want to be mayor, Jimmy? Well, if you think you've got something on me, mister, then you just go ahead and... uh, Hello. 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 Oh, sure, he hung up. What in the name of reason was all that? I don't know. What was this about something in your past? I said I don't know. I'm sorry, Jean. Someone's playing a low-down trick on me, evidently. Who? Did he accuse you of something? Oh, he pretends that he knows something, something scandalous, evidently, about me. Well, I got news for him. There isn't anything scandalous in my past. Was it one of Mendenhall's people, do you think? Mendenhall? Well, you did kind of scorch him in your speech last night. Mendenhall? Well, would he stoop to such a tactic? No, I can't believe he'd conscience such a thing. What did he say? Well, it was it was almost like I was a little kid again, being bullied by an older kid. Honey, what did he say? Does it matter what he said? Oh, he said, I saw what you did, whatever that's supposed to mean. James, your hand's shaking. Uh, where was that drink you made me? I think I'll have it. Of course, I, I thought it was nothing but a crude trick, but... That night I lay awake until it was light, racking my brain, trying to think, to remember anything that could have happened in my life that I might have forgotten, put out of my memory, but it was no good. My head was all mixed up. All I could remember was the taunting, knowing sound of that guy's voice on the phone, someone who had something on me. Oh, no, no, it was all a trick, wasn't it? Yeah, I decided that. Maybe Jean was right. Maybe it was Fritz Mendenhall's dirty way of trying to intimidate me. I, I knew politics was dirty, but, well, this was just my first baptism in the cesspool of City Hall, Mendenhall's City Hall, which I'd attacked the night before when I threw my hat in the ring. Well, next day I decided to say nothing to anyone about the call. They were just hanging banners in the campaign headquarters when I showed up about ten and four or five girls were busy on the telephones. Sid Davies, my campaign manager, had a list of appointments for me. uh, If you can make it at noon, Jimmy, it's uh, it's a heck of a short notice, but it's good exposure. And most of them are Mendenhall people, you know. Huh? What's that? The the, the Drake Hotel, noon? Oh, I'm I'm sorry. I was thinking about something else. Uh, I don't think a formal speech is necessary. Just uh, restate the ten points in your announcement. 
And, uh, oh, this afternoon I've lined you up to visit Mountain View Convalescent Home. Good, good, good. Say, uh, is there anything the matter? The matter? No, no. Well, you look kind of tired. Well, I, uh, I didn't rest too well last night. How'd the dinner go? Fine, fine, swell. Yeah, we'll get their support. Mr. Hadley, there's a call for you personally on line two. Oh, well, who is it? He didn't say. Uh, well, take a number. Tell him I'll, I'll get back to him, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, Sid, have you got a cigarette? Yeah, sure. Hey, 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 you gave him up, remember? What? Oh, yeah, that's right. I Just reflex, I guess. Well, anyway, uh, the convalescent home at three, and I'm about 90% sure we're going to get some TV coverage on the visit, so I've lined up about a half a dozen residents who are sympathetic. How can they be sympathetic? They don't even know me. Yeah, but they do know Mendenhall, and they're up to here with him. They want him out, and they're going to tell you so on camera. I'm sorry, Mr. Hadley. The man says it's important, and he has to talk to you right now. Huh? The man on the telephone. He says it's important. Why, oh, did you get his name? Honey, always get the name. Find out who it is. I'm sorry. No, she's just a junior high volunteer. All right, all right. I'll take it here. Excuse me, Sid. Sure. I'll be around when you're through. Line two. All right. Now, this is Jim Hadley. Jimmy! I hate to bother such a busy guy, but I wanted to get you where you could talk. I guess last night wasn't too good a time. I suppose Gene was listening. Now, you listen to me. I'm new to politics, I admit, but I'm not new to what you're trying to pull. Now, if you Jimmy, think you can... Jimmy, Jimmy, I'm not trying to pull anything. I'm a guy in possession of some knowledge about you, that's all. Something you did... All right, all right. Now, what is this terrible thing I'm supposed to have done? On the phone? Oh, no. You wouldn't want it on the phone. You never know who's listening these days. Uh-huh. Well, I'll tell you something, fella. You're wasting my time. Whew. I got to get a hold of myself. Anything wrong, Chief? Hey, hey can S- I help? Sid, I, I, I don't want to take any more calls. Period. Unless it's my wife or someone you know personally. Okay, fine. No I... exceptions. And that's it. The worst thing about it now was I began searching my memory for any act I might have committed years earlier. Anything that would be compromising if it were brought out now. But there was nothing, nothing, except, well, maybe there was a little impropriety, perhaps. I couldn't discuss these things with you, Jeannie, because, well, no need to get you concerned. And I admit there were a few chapters in my life that I wasn't overly proud of. But the days rolled on. I'd all but deserted my law practice and heaped all the cases on the shoulders of my partner, Ben Parsons. Campaign seemed to be going pretty well. And if the mysterious caller was still calling, I never knew about it, because Sid Davies was screening all my calls. So, I'd almost put it out of my mind until that Thursday afternoon that Ben insisted I come down to the law offices for a talk. I've got to ask you right out front, Jimmy. Are you in trouble? Well, no, no. Why? Any kind of trouble? Something you're keeping to yourself? No, I'm not, Ben, and I don't know why you ask. I'm asking because I think you're being blackmailed. Uh, why do you say that? Because I've taken some phone calls for you, and I don't like the tone of them. Phone calls? That's right. Want to hear them? Well, sure, I... No. Got them right here on tape. Look, Ben, there's been a crank calling me from time to time, but it's nothing. Or it could be some crackpot with a Mendenhall bunch. Well, if it is, I think we ought to report it. No. Why not? This guy is threatening to expose some kind of uh, episode in your past if you don't step down from the mayor's race. Now, that's actionable. Forget it, Ben. Why? Because I said so. Look, Jimmy, if it's Mendenhall's outfit, it'll clinch the election for I him. just don't want anything made of it, that's all. What have they got on you, Jimmy? Nothing. God is my witness, there is nothing. Then why don't we go public with it? Look, nobody knows about this except you and I, and I want it kept that way. When did he talk to you last? I don't know. Week, maybe. Well, he says he can't get you to the phone anymore, so he's forced to work through others. And that's got to mean Gene, for one. Gene? Sure. He's called Gene? I don't know, but I bet he will. Jimmy, why don't you tell me what he's got on you? We can work something out. For the last time I told you, he's got nothing on me. Nothing. What are you doing? 
I'm going to pour myself a drink, do you mind? At 10.30 in the morning? Now listen here, Ben. One thing I don't need from you is criticism. Sure, Jimmy. Excuse me. Just wanted to help. feel myself changing. Where before I'd been steady and determined in everything, everything that I did, now I was shaky and tentative. I, I didn't know what I was afraid of, but it, it haunted and plagued me, and I, I, I felt guilty. Guilty of what, though? When I left the office, I headed straight for my car to drive out to a shopping center where I was going to do some more handshaking, and... When I got to my car, I noticed something stuck under the windshield wiper. A note. I unfolded it, and my hands were shaking, but I could read it well enough. Dear Jimmy, too bad you won't discuss this like a reasonable man. Now I'm going to have to take further steps. If you think I'm bluffing, just look for me at the shopping center today. I'll be there. Unless, of course, you decide to withdraw from the race. The shopping center. He was going to be at the shopping center. At last, I'd be able to confront this threat face to face. And now, back to Crisis. Jimmy. Jimmy, what happened? Are you all right? Yeah, I, I, I'm perfectly all right. You know what time it is? Not precisely. It's after four, I'd guess. Uh, may I ask where you've been for the past seven hours? Uh, I'm sorry, Sid. You're drunk. You're my campaign manager. You're not my father confessor. Did you forget about the shopping center appearance this morning? No, no, I didn't forget. We had almost 200 people out there and two TV stations. And where was the candidate? Right here. But why, Jimmy? Why? Just give me a cigarette, will Uh, you? Listen. Listen to me, Jimmy. I quit up Miami public relations job to come up here for you because... Because you were Mr. Straight Arrow, the knight in white armor, the the honest lawyer with the guts and the imagination to take a good-sized town and turn it around. And now all of a sudden you crap out on me. Who's seen you this way? Anybody? Huh? Has anybody seen you drinking? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, only Ben. Ben? Ben Parsons. He's my partner. This this is his his office, Uh, too. Okay, okay, now look. Today was a bad mistake, but, but we can cover it up. I'll get you to a telephone and uh, get a few of the right people and, and say the right things, and I think we can get by. But, Jimmy, this has got to be the last time. You understand? The last time. Okay, Sid. You want me to phone Gene? No. Jimmy, can you tell me, please, why you didn't show up at the shopping center and why you got drunk? You don't have a drinking problem. No, no, I guess I can't tell you either thing. Well, what do you want me to do for you? There's nothing. Just let me sit here. Now, you go ahead. You, you, you go on home. I'll be okay in the morning. Only I wasn't okay in the morning. As you know, Janie, I didn't come home that night. For the same reason I didn't make the appearance at the shopping center. I was hiding out. Scared. Afraid of confronting the mystery man who said he'd be there. Afraid of what he'd do. No, no, no. I, What I was really afraid of was myself. My own past. You see, that afternoon I got drunk. I'd started to dig up everything from my past that I could remember. Things I'd buried years and years before. Things I hadn't even thought about in 20 years. I'd gone back up to the office after I discovered the note on my car, and I I started drinking and talking with Ben, and Ben tried to help, but it didn't do any good. So you had a couple minor run-ins with the law when you were a kid. Well, what kid didn't? Well, that, that, that's not all, Ben. There was 
There was this girl when I'd just gotten out of the service. You think Mendenhall would use that against you? That was, what, 30 years ago? Oh, well, there were other things. Like what? Well, like I, I stole. Stole what? Money out of old man Ingersoll's cash register when I worked in the drugstore. How many years ago? Oh, it was when I was going through law school. Oh, ye gods. What did you take? Oh, I don't know. I got mad at him one night because he wouldn't pay me overtime when I'd worked for another kid, so I helped myself to what I figured he owed me. Five dollars, I think it was. Anyone see you do it? No, of course not. Then that isn't it. Now, look, Jocko... You're just too clean. This character is bluffing. He must have known me from high school days. Because he could sing a couple lines of the crummy fight song? I <laughs> Get off my back. And incidentally, that's enough booze. I've never seen you drink like that. If I could only find out what he knows. Jimmy, he doesn't know anything. There's nothing to know, isn't that right? I don't know. All right, I'm your lawyer. Answer me this. You ever kill anyone? No. Embezzle money? No. Romance someone else's wife? No. Uh, burn a building down? I'll cut it out, Ben. I'm trying to think of why the devil you're so willing to be this guy's patsy. If I could just meet him face to face. Well, you could have this morning at the shopping center, according to that note you showed me. But you chickened out. Jimmy, you're afraid of him. Yes. Yes, I am. Well, damn it, you can't go on through life being paranoid about some crackpot. It's destroying you. No, you're right. I've got to find him and face him. So you see, Jane, after Ben left, I went ahead and killed the bottle. And sometime late in the afternoon, Sid Davies found me, and it, it was dark when he left the office, and I just sat there in the dark. No lights on. And then... Just when I'd about made up my mind to come on home, the phone rang. It, it was no use to let it ring. I, I thought it might be you, Janie, or maybe Ben, and I, I had to answer it. I, I couldn't ignore it any longer. I, Hadley and Parsons, this is Jim Hadley speaking. Well, I'll be darned. Jimmy? It's you. Say, we missed you out at the shopping center this morning. Decided to call it quits, Jimmy? Now, listen, I've got to talk to you. That sounds reasonable. All right, where? Where? What's wrong with you now? No, 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 not over the phone. Like you said, it's not, ex it's not secure. You sound like a man who's finally remembered something he tried hard to forget. Right, Jimmy? Just tell me where we can meet. Hmm. I have to think about that. Now, look, you, you want me to drop out of the mayor's race. All right, maybe I will. But I've got to talk to you first. Oh? Well, all right. Tell you what. What? I'll, um, be parked at the end of Mount Carmel Drive. You know where that is? Sure, sure. I know where it is. Well, I'll be there. How soon? Well, say, 30 minutes. I'll be there. See you, Jimmy. Yeah, I'll see you. Jenny, I... I don't know how to explain the way I felt. Like, like, like suddenly there was nothing and nobody left on earth except for myself and the man I was going to meet. I, I went through Ben's desk until I finally found what I knew would be there, his gun. We both bought guns ten years ago, remember, right after Ben and I took on a racketeer who wanted to clear his conscience? I'd sold mine later, but Ben never did. And now... Now I found it, and found the bullets, and put them carefully into the cylinder. At exactly 30 minutes from the time I talked with the blackmailer, I cruised slowly up to the dead end of Mount Carmel Drive. There was no other car there. Maybe... A Maybe I was early. I parked, shut off the motor and the lights. I waited, and then, then the lights of a car came up the road toward me. Yes, it was him. He turned around slowly and came to a stop 
right beside my open window. It was dark, but I could see him getting out of his car, see him walking slowly toward me. I didn't mean to do it, Jeannie. I, I didn't intend to do it at all, but suddenly I felt transfixed by fear and desperation, so I took the gun held it with both hands out my car window, aimed it at the dark form coming toward me, and fired. When I realized what I'd done, I drove away from there just as fast as I could go. I was crazy with fear and revulsion over what I'd done. I I drove... I don't know how long or where, but finally I found myself back at the office. I let myself in, closed the door, and just stood there at the darkness, listening to my heart beat when all of a sudden... Hello? Hello? James? Oh, darling, it is you. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, Jean, I'm all right. Oh, then you didn't go. Go? Well, Ben called. You know that telephone bug thing where he makes recordings of his phone calls? Well, he's been recording all his calls ever since that crackpot started phoning the office. And tonight he listened in somehow, and, and when you arranged to meet that man up in Mount Carmel Drive, he, well, he called me, and he, he told me he was going up there and be with you if the man showed up. Oh, he was so concerned about you, and so was I. Oh, but you didn't go. Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. Good evening. My name is Dr. Edward Carlsworth. I've been invited here tonight to tell you a story. Perhaps a story is not the right, the precise word to use. To tell you the facts about a colleague of mine, Dr. Philip Rogers... It seems now so long ago when it started. But it wasn't really, only eight months ago. Yet we all seem so much older. Or at least most of us do. But then, I'm not even certain about that anymore. After what happened. For time is a strange thing. We consider it in minutes and hours and days and years. All neatly measured and moving forward inexorably. But perhaps time is not that sort of thing at all. At least that's what Philip Rogers believed. That maybe time is something entirely different. And I'm not certain. I don't think any of us can be certain again. Since Dr. Philip Rogers faced his crisis. Tonight, Crisis brings you the story of a man who tampers with time as we present a play by Jack MacDonald, entitled, Once Upon a Time. We were in the faculty dining lounge at the State University when the subject first came up. Phil Rogers and I had been undergraduate students together a long time ago. Now, having gone our separate ways to struggle through the dullness of masters and doctoral thesis, we had ended up, or down, depending on one's attitude about the matter, on the same college staff. Phil may have brought the subject up before. Time is a thing we use, Ed. And if we don't, then it will use us. I don't know what you mean, Phil. Neither do I. You're always talking about time as though you could control it. As though you could do something about it. Yes, Sally, I think I can. Well, that's ridiculous. But no more ridiculous than anything else. No more than, uh, than when I told you I loved you, Sally. And asked you to marry me. But that was real. Wasn't it, Phil? That was, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm just not sure that time, the way we've always thought about it, is real. And I suppose that's what you're going to be teaching the students next semester. That's what I'm probably going to be trying to teach myself. What do you mean? That we've always thought in terms of time controlling us. 
Uh, what I'm what I'm suggesting is that maybe it's possible for us to control time. Oh, not the old time machine bit, Phil. That's been a little overdone in bad fiction. No, not that at all. You see, time is my enemy. Your enemy? That's right, and I'll defeat it. Defeat it? That's impossible. How can you defeat time? You don't even know what it really is. But that's exactly how, Ed. What do you mean? I will defeat my enemy by discovering his true nature. I will win out over time by finding out what it really is. This battle, this fight against the nature of time, became the master thesis of Philip Rogers' life. And after what happened, even that doesn't seem like quite the right way to state it. Phil, I can't find you anymore. You seem to be going away from me. Well, I'm not going away from you, Sally. Well, you're not with me anymore. Maybe I'm just going towards myself. Well, that's so strange. Not strange at all. I, I wish I could tell you, explain to you. I, I wish you were coming along with me. I am with you. We're together. That's why we're going to get married. Yes. And that's why we're going to the dance now. I just wonder, Sally, do we have time? Oh, not that again. Why not? The study of time is the most important thing in my life. I thought I was supposed to be. Nothing is supposed to be anything, Sally. Maybe that's where we all go wrong. This thing about time, it's become an obsession with you. I'm, I'm not sure I can take it anymore. Well, I'm not sure I can either. But I have to try. I think I may be getting close to the answer. Maybe you should just take me home. No, Sally. I, I think we should talk about it. What are we going to do? Stop here in Lover's Lane like a couple of high school kids? Would you like to neck? Oh, sometimes you frighten me. Or talk. I'm not sure I'd like to do either. Don't you understand that, that I have to try? No, I don't. To find out if I'm right? Maybe we should neck. Do you understand at all? I understand that you think you can be God. That you think you can control the time of your life. Yes. I think I can. How? Just tell me how. No. No, I don't even want to know how. Just tell me why. Why would you want to? Of all the elements which make up our world, man alone seems out of harmony with his existence. Now you sound like a pedantic college professor. That's what I am. Not pedantic, I hope, but, but a college professor. That's been my training. I'm simply trying to, to put it to real use. You all have your little chance, like religious fanatics. I'm not chanting. I just think there's a disharmony between man and his world. Well, so what? What are you going to do about and it? And I believe it's because man alone, among everything, because only men among the animals, the trees, the soil, everything that makes up our world, he alone, among the elements, conceives of time and then attempts to live within it. Well, what's wrong with that? Nothing, I suppose. I just happen to believe he conceives of time in the wrong way. Phil, I just don't understand. I don't understand what you're trying to do, where you're going. I'm existing within time, just like anyone else. And? But I want to choose my own direction there within it. only one direction, from birth to death, from the cradle to the grave, from the beginning to the end. But I don't think so. Well, what do you think? Sally, we've always thought in terms of our being in motion, of time standing still, and as if we as human beings were passing through time. Aren't we? No. No, no, no. I think that's wrong. How? Try to consider a different approach. Think of us as stationary in the cosmos. I believe that time passes through us. The time passes through us. Yes, yes, instead of us passing through time. The time is in motion, which it obviously is, and that we are not. And if this is true, if I am right, <laughs> then we can control time. You didn't answer my earlier question. And what was that? Why would you want to control time? Because I think I'm right, and I have to find out. You don't care what happens to us if you pursue this. Of course I care. But I have to find out. Take me home now, Phil. Please. Act Two of Once Upon a Time in Just a Minute. 
And now we return to Once Upon a Time. I didn't see Phil as much during that semester. We were both working hard, trying to establish our careers, or at least I was. Phil was too, I'm sure. Long hours, if I could judge by his appearance on those occasions when we did have lunch or dinner together. Not exactly a haggard look. Just more intense. Something in the eyes, and... And then one day... Dr. Carlsworth. Ed, it's Sally. Well, how are you doing? You've become almost a stranger. Ed, I've got to see you. You sound serious. I am. Is it Phil? Yes. When can we talk? Uh, this afternoon, if you'd like. I've got a two o'clock class, but... I'll be back in my office by 310. I'll be there. Come in. Hello, Ed. Well, sit down. That outfit looks great on you, Sally. Scottish woolen. Yes, I guess so. I don't know. What's the matter, Sally? Ed, I don't know what to do. You know how much I love Phil. I love him more than anyone or anything else in the world. But I can't reach him anymore. He's going away from me, and, and I don't know what to do about it. It's, uh, it's not uh, another woman. Oh, I'm sure it isn't. It's this obsession of his with the nature of time. It's come between us like a, like a great wall. But a wall that I can't see or touch. That I can't batter down or go around or through. A man has to follow the paths in which he believes, Sally. Phil seems to think that he has come upon something totally new, never conceived of by man before. I know, but... And with a man like Phil, who, whether we like to admit it or not, is a, probably as close to a genius as either of us will ever know. With a man like that, sometimes his genius leads him on paths that the rest of us cannot follow because he covers them in passing. But what can I do, Ed? I love him so much. There's only one thing to do. Wait. Wait for him to come back to you, and and I'm sure he will. Oh, I hope he will. Ed, do you ever have the feeling that you hate time? Then things started to happen in other areas. Other people started to notice and to talk. Because it was no longer deniable that Philip Rogers was changing. Even I had to admit that as close as I was to him, as long as I had known him, part of him, an ever-increasing part, was off, away from us. Not off in another world, don't misunderstand me, but off in another time. As if the shell of time which envelops all of us in one ongoing moment after moment no longer held him in its grasp. It's difficult to describe. And then one day he was summoned into the dean's office. I heard about it shortly after it happened. Thank you for coming, Dr. Rogers. It's my pleasure, Dean Carmichael. Well, I've been wanting to have a little talk with you. Uh, would you like some coffee? No? Uh, you see... We've always thought of you as being such a valued part of the philosophy department here at the university. I, I hope that I've lived up to that feeling, Dean. Oh, you have. You have, my boy. Young, bright, intelligent, a surprising rapport with your students, a real talent for teaching. That's very flattering. Yes, I've always had such high hopes for you. <clears throat> I probably shouldn't mention it, but I've even had some visions of you sitting here in this chair, <laughs> heading this department young, dynamic force carrying on. Rather pleasant thought, as those things really did have a continuity. Dean, do, do I gather that, that you've had a change of opinion, that, that, that you no longer have the same feeling? No, it's, it's not that exactly. Well, then what is it, sir? Exactly. Well, it's just that... Well, nothing specific. Just, just talk. From the other instructors, uh, even some of the students. Talk, sir? Yes, to be perfectly frank uh, uh, about your teaching. Your subject is the history of philosophy. Now, it seems you are spending most of your class sessions discussing the mysteries of time. I always thought that history was a matter of discussing time. Well, it is, of course, but 
According to the reports I've heard, you've been getting away from the basics of the outline of the course you're supposed to be teaching. Perhaps I'm simply going toward the basics. Well, <laughs> anyway, my boy, it, it's been nice to have this little chance to have a little chat with you. Huh? <laughs> Just give some thought to what I've said. You've got a great future, a very large future here. Now think about it. I do, sir, all the time. Future and past and present. They all seem to coalesce, don't they? I suppose they do, Rogers. Yes, yes. Uh, now, now I'm afraid you'll have to excuse me. Uh, I've got one of those meetings to get to that are the bane of being a department head. <laughs> no, this sounds uh, that this sound like a curse, but I, but I hope you have the opportunity to find out what I mean someday. That's very kind of you to say, sir. Yes, <laughs> yes. Is is there anything wrong, Rogers? I don't mean to pry, but. Is there something wrong with you? No, I'm fine. Uh, why do you ask? Well, you... You seem different somehow. Different? How? No, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, well, I, I'm glad we've had this little chat. <laughs> we'll do it again someday, huh? Thank so, you. Thank you, Dean Carmichael. Yes? Who is it? Bill, it's Sally. Phil, open the door, please. May I come in? Oh, sure. Sure, I'm sorry. I, I, I was just surprised to see you. You, uh, you haven't called. I... Oh, it's just that I've been busy. I, I've been working pretty hard. You look it. Oh, Phil, you look awful. You're pushing yourself too hard. Oh, I'm fine, fine. I, I, I've got a tough constitution. You know that, don't you? Still working on the same thing? Still got time for nothing but time? Still the same thing. Yes. But I'm getting there. I, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer every day. I wish you were getting closer to me. I will. As soon as, as I've conquered this. Once I have, believe me, Sally, there'll be time for everything. Uh, do you want a drink or anything? Oh, I wish I could understand it, Phil. I, I wish I could, too. Uh, but, but I'm working on it. Uh, you see... The problem is really within our concept of time. We, we've always thought of one event happening before or after another, all in a neat little row, proceeding in one neatly defined direction. I'm sorry, Phil, but I'm not sure I'm following it's, it's you. It's quite simple, really. You see, I've discovered the time isn't that at all. Time, all of time, is one great sea in which we go swimming. It's all there, all together. And, and once we understand that, once we're able to take full possession of this concept, then we can go swimming in any direction we wish in this vast sea of time. I guess that makes sense. I'm not sure. I am. And in this sea of time, Sally, uh, th there are what I call uh, pools of importance. The deep areas, the places where the real life in living takes place. Yes. Look over the time of your life. It doesn't stretch out into one vast, even expanse. God knows most of it's flat and dull and ordinary and uneventful. But out there are some peaks, some pinnacles. And those are the things your memory, your, your mind, seizes upon. Those are the moments of, of living. Minutes. Seconds of intenseness. Those fantastic moments of, of value that make all the rest seem worthwhile. But supposing you do understand that and accept it, then what? But, but don't you see, Sally, that once you really know, really grasp the fact that, that you are not simply passing through time from the cradle to the grave, <laughs> but that time is passing through you, then you have a chance to control it. You can run it forward. You can run it backwards. You can make it stop, go, at will. And when you can do that, then you can find those, those pools of importance I spoke of. And you can seek out and be in the deep areas. And you can make those moments of, of, of intensity become an eternity. <laughs> Sally was relating this strange conversation to me the next day as we were walking across the campus. She was disturbed, of course, but confused, too. I hadn't had a chance to tell her my news about Phil. 
frankly, I didn't know quite how to handle it. What am I going to do, Ed? To be perfectly honest, I don't know, Sally. Because, to be perfectly honest myself, I'm scared. What he's telling me about it, it seems to make sense, to be valid. But then, afterwards, when I, when I get to thinking about it, I know that he's getting on dangerous ground. And it's frightening. Do you, do you think it's something, uh, well... Mental? Well, yes, I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Oh, he's not crazy yet. You know that as well as I do. But he's getting into areas where we were never meant to go. Into regions that aren't really ours to explore. Hi. Where are you two headed? Well, we're just taking a professorial stroll across the campus. I was hoping I'd find you. It's been a long time since you found us, Phil. I was hoping I would find you too, Phil. I have something I have to talk to you about. Can it wait? It could, but I don't think it should. I suppose I could pretend it was none of my business. But it is, really. Because you're probably the best friend I have. Well, let's talk about it this evening, Ed. Uh, that's why I was looking for both of you. I want, I want to invite you over to the apartment. I have something very important to show you. I, I think this is something you should probably know now. Okay, okay, what is it? It's some news that I picked up a little earlier today. I suppose I could have just waited and let Dean Carmichael tell you, but as a friend, I thought I should tell you myself. What is it? They're not going to renew your contract. They're letting you go. Phil, they don't approve. Oh, Phil, no, no. They don't understand, you mean. I'm sorry, Phil. It, it doesn't make any difference. Listen, I'll see you both this evening. Uh, Eight o'clock, all right? What do you mean it doesn't make any difference? It's your career, your life. It doesn't make any difference. And I'll show you why this evening. Because I found the answer. I found the answer. <laughs> The final act of Once Upon a Time in one minute. And now, the concluding act of Once Upon a Time. You're right on time. <laughs> That's a rather amusing introduction to this evening, isn't it? Is it? Well, I think so. Uh, don't just stand there. Come on in. Bill, I'm sorry about the news I had to tell you earlier. I told you it didn't make any difference. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Because I have something very important to tell you, show you, to the two people closest to me in the whole world. Phil, I want Let wanna... me continue, Sally. You both know what I've been working on. Time. Yes, time. Time's influence on us. But uh, more importantly, our influence on time. You... Seem so far behind us. Perhaps I am, or uh, behind you, or even all around you. That's a strange thing to say. Not at all. Different, perhaps, but not strange. Phil, get on with it, please. I, I don't think either of us can take much more of this. That's what I intend to do, to give you a little uh, <laughs> demonstration. The subject, students, is time. A subject that frequently frightens all of us. Don't go on, Phil. Please stop. I can't. I can't stop because I have the power now. I'm in control. I, I've learned that it, that it really is possible to control time, to use it, instead of letting it use us. And it's so simple. It's all a matter of, of concept. It's a matter of knowing. Do you really know what you're doing? Of course I do. I've made experiments already. Little ones. Tonight, I'm going to let you witness a larger one. Oh, Phil, don't. But I must. Uh, even... As we have been talking, you must have started to notice some changes. Oh, my God. They're very, very subtle at first. <laughs> I'm sure that you can uh, see them happening. Bill, for God's sake, stop it now. I'm running time back through me. You see how easy it is? I'm swimming in that great sea we talked about. Swimming. Wherever I want to go. Bill, don't. Don't. See how easy it is? How easy it is to reverse time? To use it? You do it with your mind. Look at him. I can't believe it. Wait a minute. I've lost control over it. Stop it, Phil. It's going too fast. Going too fast. I 
I don't try to explain it. I don't even try to understand it anymore. I simply tell you that's what happened once upon a time. For time can be minutes on a clock, or hours, or days, or years. But just perhaps, yes, just perchance, as Philip Rogers believed, time can be something quite different. Quite different. Quite different. You have heard Once Upon a Time, an original play by Jack McDonald, featuring Ray Court, Russ Money, Pat French, Arthur Kahn, and Bill Kramer. The Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. Well, did you see him? Is that him? That was him. Oh, oh, my dear. My dear Minerva. Not exactly your idea of what Charles Strong would look like, is it? absolutely positive. It's him. Absolutely. Living right here with us at the Franklin. Imagine. Why, he's famous. No, not so much these days, I suppose. But once upon a time, Florence, once upon a time... Yes, yes. There was a time when Charles Strong was the most controversial author. Why, he was banned. Our library wouldn't take a single book of you. And if you were caught with a Charles Strong novel in your possession, it was a scandal. I know, I know. But I thought he died. I, I thought I read somewhere that he had died. Nevertheless... That terrible, wizened-up little old man who's moved on to the seventh floor is the Charles Strong, the bloodiest mystery writer in America, in his day, that is. <laughs> well, do you suppose, uh, do you suppose he'll murder us all in our beds some night? <laughs> For some of our senior citizens, excitement is where you find it, especially in as respectable a place as the Franklin, a moderately expensive apartment hotel which caters to the spinsters, widows, and occasional widowers who can afford the rates. Perched on high ground, expensively landscaped, surrounded by elegant old homes, the Franklin is an unlikely place for a horror story, but that is exactly what we have tonight. Our play is titled, The Franklin Phantom, and we'll have Act One in just a minute. And now, The Franklin Phantom. To say that Miss Minerva Hastings is a busybody would be unkind, but not far from the truth. Despite her 80 years, her eyes are bright and her hearing is sharp, and if her step is slower than it once was... Her mind is as fast and efficient as the works in a well-oiled clock. Oh, it's three. They're having tea with the Reverend Usher in the solarium. But you haven't told me how you did it, Minerva. Did what? Found out about Charles Strong. Perfectly simple. I help them sort the mail, you know. Yes. Well, for over a week now, mail has been arriving here addressed to a Mr. Arlen, a Mr. Roscoe Arlen. Yes, the man on the seventh floor. Yes, well, most of the mail was big brown manila envelopes mailed from Philadelphia. Oh? These envelopes were all marked with the eagle, pen, and book symbol. The symbol for the Adler Publishing Company. Adler means eagle in German. Well, my star. And as it happened, one of the envelopes was so poorly sealed, it uh, just fell open in my hands as I was trying to seal it. And I saw what was inside. Well, what? Bundles of letters. 
Letters? Letters. All addressed to Charles Strong. Oh, oh. Yes. Why, you don't say that poor little old man. <laughs> Not so poor. Oh, no, I suppose you're right. That sort of trashy novel always did sell, I suppose. Well, I'm surprised they'd let him in. Here? Why, yes, we did have standards at one time. Oh, I dare say if Mr. Cooper knew that his Roscoe Arlen was really the most notorious blood and thunder author since Edgar Allan Poe, he'd be flattered all the way down to his arch support. <laughs> Well, I'm off to tea. But, Minerva, what will we say to him? I mean, how will we act? Well, I can't speak for the others, but I intend to go right up to him and introduce myself and say, You're a fraud and a humbug, Charles Strong. You're just as feeble and broken down as the rest of us here at the Franklin, and I'm not scared of you one bit. Well, well, Minerva, we're ready for dessert and not a sign of you know who. I think I'll speak to Mr. Cooper. Here he comes now. Oh, Mr. Cooper! Oh, good evening, ladies. Mrs. Bradbury, you call, Miss Hastings? Yes, I did. Bend down here. I don't want to shout all over the dining room. All right. We have a new neighbor on the seventh floor. Uh, Mr. Arlen, I believe he calls himself. Yes, yes, we have. Just moved in. We were hoping to see him at dinner. Hmm. Isn't down here, is he? No, no, he's not. We've been watching for him. You don't suppose he's ill, do you? Oh, I, I don't think so. Where's he from? I, uh, I can't remember at the moment just where he said he came from. Oh, doesn't... <laughs> Mr. Cooper, you, the manager of the Franklin, is... Efficient a young man as you are, forgetting a thing about any of us, I don't believe it. Minerva thinks he's using an assumed name. What? Florence, I never said any such thing. Shame on you. Why, you did too. Florence, you're flushed. Take your pill. I am? Oh, why? Yes, yes, my pill. Thank you. I, I wouldn't concern myself too much about Mr. Arland, actually. He's probably, oh, a little shy. New surroundings and all that, you know. Well... Enjoy your dessert and have a nice evening. Hmm. Huh. Shy, my foot. Oh, do I still look flushed, Minerva? Huh? Oh. Oh, y yes, you look very flushed. Why don't you go on up to your room, dear, and lie down? Perhaps I'd better. Yes. I'll look in on you later tonight. Don't forget our TV date. Uh, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Well, I suppose he could be asleep. A plain possum. Come on, mister, whoever you are. I know you're in there. You're going to have to come out sooner or later. What you don't know, my fine feathered friend, is that I can be just as stubborn as you. Yes? Oh, uh, uh, I, I, th I thought perhaps you were asleep. If I had been, you'd have waked me up. Well, uh, 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 yes, I, I suppose. <clears throat> my, my, my name is Minerva Hastings. Uh -huh. And are you the Franklin's version of the welcome wagon? <laughs> Delightful sense of humor, Mr. Arlen. I'm, I'm sure we'll get along beautifully. I'm not at all sure of that. Uh, uh, missed you at dinner. Uh, Mrs. Hastings, when I decided to make my home Miss here... Miss Hastings? Huh? Uh, it's Miss Hastings. Oh, my mistake. As I was saying, Miss Hastings, uh, when I decided to make my home here at the Franklin, I was given assurance that my privacy would be respected. Do you get the point? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Arlen. I'm not as dense as you may think. I get the point very clearly. I not only get the point, as a matter of fact, I am fully aware of your reason for this obsessive desire for privacy. Oh, you are? I am. Is that smug expression the result of a tick, or do you really think you know something about me? I know something, Mr. Arlen. 
But I'll trouble you no further. It's been very nice meeting you. Uh, just, uh, just a minute. Yeah? There's no reason we shouldn't be friends now, is there? The apartment's a terrible mess. I'm still unpacking, but, uh, do come in. Well, if you're quite sure... I'm quite sure. Oh, my! You, uh, you are in the throes of it, aren't you? I'd offer you a chair, only there doesn't seem to be one available. Uh, that's quite all right. I like standing. Miss, uh, Miss Hastings, uh, what is it you think you, uh, know? As I said... I happen to know why you value your privacy as you do. Now, why is that? I know who you really are. And let me say, for whatever reason you prefer to use an assumed name, you may count on my discretion. I am not a bearer of tales. You think I'm not who I say I am? If it pleases you to pretend you are not whom you really are, that is your business and none of mine. Correct. And now that you've examined these boxes of my jumbled belongings, perhaps you'll permit me to continue unpacking. I'd be happy to give you a hand if you'd like. I'm very capable and strong, and you seem to be rather frail. If you'll tell me where you'd like some of these things, I'll help you put them away. I don't need your help. These apartments have lots of closet space. Now, shan't I open this closet and hang up a few things? Stay away from there. Well, it's only a closet, Mr. Arlen. My apartment is laid out exactly like yours, and this is a large walk-in closet. Well, you get out of here, and I'll get out. Whatever you say, Mr. Arlen. One word of advice, if I may. We at the Franklin are a congenial lot. We have much to share. And there's no room here for... Oh, there's something spilled all over your carpet. Did you see this here? Here by the closet door. <laughs> what looks like bird seed. Do you keep a bird? Ha <laughs> ha. You found me out, didn't you? That's my secret. I have a bird. I'm very fond of it. I've had it for years. Oh, I know the rule about the pets here, but I hated to part with it. So I hid it in the closet. Uh That was clever of you. As I said, I'm discreet. I certainly hope so. Thank you. Thank you for understanding. Uh, Mr. Arlen. Uh, Yes? Haven't you had your dinner? You ought to eat something. Oh, uh, don't worry about me, Miss Hastings. I could bring you a little something. I have influence in the kitchen. No, no, it won't be necessary. Uh, Thanks, anyway. Oh, uh... Uh, by the way, what kind of a bird is it? Oh, it's, uh, uh, uh well, you know, uh, 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 uh... Parakeet! Yes, yes, parakeet. Oh, how lovely. Good night, Mr. Arlen. Yes, good night. Minerva has spent only a few minutes in the mysterious Mr. Arlen's room, but she's learned a great deal. Now, what will she do with what she knows? And where will it lead her? The answers in just one minute. And now, back to the Franklin Phantom. It's a few minutes later now, and Minerva and Florence are talking over Minerva's adventure in Mr. Arlen's room. I gained a little advantage over him, and from now on, I think he'll go out of his way to be accommodating to me. Why? What did you do? Well, if I gave it away, then I wouldn't have the advantage, would I? Minerva, but we're friends. I'm the closest friend you've got at the Franklin. You said so yourself. Let's just say that Mr. Arlen knows I know something about him that he wouldn't like to have circulated What is it, please? Never you mind. Minerva, if I tell you a very dark secret, will you tell me what you've got on Arlen? A dark secret? You've got a dark secret? I have, and nobody knows it. Not a soul. Not even you. What could you possibly keep from me? Do we swap? 
Well, all right. You go first. Follow me. Here, in the back of my closet. <gasps> you have a bookcase in the back of your clothes. And look what's in it. What? <gasps> Florence Bradbury, I never suspected it. <laughs> the complete collected works of Charles Strong. Lawrence, I'm surprised at you. I knew you would be. Now, what's your secret? Well, Mr. Arlen, or Mr. Strong, I mean, has a parakeet. A parakeet? But, but that's against the rule. Of course it is. I discovered it because it spilled a little bird seed right by the door to the closet, where it keeps the thing. He keeps the poor bird in the closet? No, probably just when he lets someone into his apartment. Are you going to report him to Mr. Cooper? No, but he doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do, now that you know? Do? Nothing. It just amuses me to know what I know. You see, Florence... I know something about every single person living here at the Franklin. Even the shiniest coin has a dark side. What does that mean? It means every one of our high-toned neighbors has something she'd like to hide. There's the former art gallery owner with her private stock of naughty pictures. And the retired stockbroker who drinks absinthe and makes eyes at Mr. Cooper. And one of us takes cocaine. And one of us practiced witchcraft. One of us was a stripper in Alaska. And there's even you, Florence. There's even you. Me? You have a library of sorts, haven't you, dear? I should never have told you. Mm, but you did. <laughs> well, anyway, we've missed our TV programs. I'm going home to bed. And tomorrow, I've an idea I'll be tied up with your favorite author. Ah, today I can offer a little hospitality, Miss Hastings. Uh, won't you join me in a snort? <laughs> Later, perhaps. Oh, my, you got your apartment put to rights in a hurry. Well, I was up half the night doing it. Oh, then I should leave and let you sleep today. Oh, no, no. Stay right where you are. I'm, I'm glad you dropped in. I've been wanting to continue where we left off last night. You fascinate me, Minerva. Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, really? Yes, you evidently detected who I really am. You are Charles Strong. Indeed I am, at your service. I knew you were, you know. I, I knew it even before you moved into the Franklin. My entire scheme to protect my identity blown sky high. How do you do it? Oh, I have ways. You certainly must have. Well, now that you know that the dean of low literature resides among you, uh, what do you plan on doing about it? Oh, uh, <laughs> nothing, probably. <laughs> well, I see that if I'm to, if I'm to have the peaceful dotage I've counted on here, I'll have to enlist you as an ally. Come on, Minerva, have yourself a little snort. <laughs> well, <laughs> and then I want you to. Uh, then I want you to meet my parakeet. Why didn't you tell me this before, Mrs. Bradbury? Because I was afraid. It's been four whole days since anyone has seen Miss Hastings? Yes. Well, well, we'll find her, don't worry, but I do wish you'd said something earlier. Oh, I just couldn't, you see. If I had told you about her seeing Mr. Arlen, then you'd probably find out he's really tall, strong, and he has a parakeet in his apartment. A and, parakeet? And then everyone would know, and Minerva would spill the beans about my having all these books. Mrs. Oh. Bradbury, what oh, are you talking damn, about? Excuse me, I, I let the cat out of the bag. You, you got me mixed up. You, you say that Mr. Arlen is really someone else? He's really Charles Strong. The, the one who wrote all those that's books? The, that's the one. Minerva spotted him, and in fact, the last time I saw her... Four days ago, she was going up to the seventh floor to see him. That 
was the last time you saw her. That's right. Oh, my. You don't suppose? I, I don't know, but but he came to the Franklin under false pretenses, if, if, if he's really who you say he is. And I'm going to have a visit with him right now and see what he knows about Miss Hastings. And I'm coming with you. It's Mr. Cooper, Mr. Arlen. Please open the door. Yes? I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Arlen, but there are some things we have to talk about. Oh, uh, this is uh, Miss Bradbury, a friend of Mrs. Hastings. You've got it backwards. No, I'm Mrs. and Minerva's well, Miss. Well, anyway, may, may we come in? If you're sure you all know who you are, I guess it's all right. I'll come, I'll come right to the point. One of our long-term residents, Minerva Hastings... Is missing. And you may have been the last person to see her. Well, how long has she been gone? Four days. Four days? And you're just starting to look for her now? Well, we didn't know she disappeared until Mrs. Bradbury here reported it just a few minutes ago. Right on the old ball, aren't you, Mrs. Oh, Bradbury? Oh, you keep a civil tongue in your head. And after I bought every filthy book you ever wrote. Huh? And that's another thing. I have to ask you, sir... Are you, in fact, Charles Strong? No, I am, in fact, Roscoe Arling. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to prove that. And what's your name? Well, you know my name. I'm Marvin Cooper, the manager. Can you prove it? Well, of course I can prove it, but that's not the issue. What have you done with Minerva? Yes. No. I mean, Mrs. Brad- Mrs. Bradbury, just stay out of this, please. We have a very strict rule here at the Franklin, Mr. Arland. We do not register persons under assumed names. We do not allow pets. And we don't allow kidnappers. Kidnappers? Where is Minerva? Do you have her? Look here, Cooper. Get this old battle axe out of my room. He's keeping a parakeet. I am not. You are so. Minerva told me. It's in this closet right here. My word. What in God's name have you got there, man? Well, there's no parakeet. Rats. As big as cats. Rats as big as cats. Very nice. You know, Hallmark could use you. What is the meaning of this? Your apartment's got rats. That's the meaning of it. I was going to report it. You are Charles Strong. Mrs. Bradbury, be quiet. Now, Mr. Arlen, what are you going to do with these enormous rats in those cages? They're my friends. I couldn't bear to part with them. And and, and who are you, Roscoe Arlen or Charles Strong? Both. I wrote under the name of Charles Strong, but my legal name is Roscoe Arlen. Oh, oh, I see. Well, under the circumstances... But you'll have to get rid of those big black rats. Okay, what color do you prefer? Mr. Cooper, you're not going to let this monster get away with it, are you? Get away with what, Mrs. Bradbury? My love is murder. Oh, now look here. I knew he was Charles Strong the moment I laid eyes on those rats. And I know how he killed poor Minerva. Oh, the poor thing. And she thought she was so smart. She thought it was burnt seed on the carpet and it was grain for the rest. I think we'll leave, Mr. Arlen, now, Mrs. Bradbury. Come along. But don't you see? That's how he killed Minerva. He gave her to the rats. That's gross. I know it is. But that's how Charles Strong wrote it in his book. Frenzy in the sewer. Ah, frenzy in the sewer. That kept me in Havana cigars for several it years. It was just horrible. The most nauseating story I ever heard. And the most terrible part of it was the rats ate up the evidence and the police could never prove how the victims were murdered. I don't want to hear any more about it. Uh, Mr. Arland, I want those rodents out of here immediately. It breaks my heart to do it, but I'm a law-abiding citizen, Mr. Cooper. Come on, Mrs. Bradbury. Oh, uh, Mrs. Bradbury, now that we've met, uh, why don't you stay a while? Stay a while? The police are going to come and get you, you, you fiend. Really? There'll have to be an investigation. Fine. Bring them in. Love to meet them. You see, Cooper, it's like Mrs. Bradbury says. I have nothing to hide. Absolutely nothing. Right, Rudy? Right, Herman? Right, Adolf? Right, Freddy? Well, whatever did become of the busybody Minerva? Someone reading the script suggested she was consumed with curiosity, but that seemed too pat a solution. 
I guess it's just going to be one of those thousands of unsolved disappearances you read about. The names of our players and a preview of next week's program in just a minute. The Golden West Radio Network presents Crisis. Show me a man who claims no vices, and I'll show you a liar, so says the skeptic. Well, there can be no doubt that all of us fall short of perfection in one way or another, but if it's any comfort to us, there's nothing new about our vices. Name any one you like. We have records that show mankind has been failing in that same department for hundreds, even thousands of years. Every generation simply adds its own distinctive twist to a very ancient list of human failings. Come on, Midnight. Faster. Faster. You can do it. You can do it, girl. Come on, we're almost there. Faster. Faster, Midnight. Now. Now. Ha ha. I beat you, Handsacker, just as I said I would. Yes, yes, you beat me, Tribble. You owe me ten dollars. Yes, yes, you have your winnings. What did you have to, uh, what did you have to give for that mare you're riding, huh? A deal more than old Midnight cost me, I'll wager. Well, she's very valuable to me. That's why I reined in. You reined in? When? When you overtook me. You're talking like a poor loser, Hansacker. I reined her in rather than do her harm. Harm? Don't make me laugh. You rode as fast as you could ride, but Midnight and I were faster, and I am considerably lighter than you are. Well, I wouldn't punish horse flesh the way you do, Tribble. Here. Here's your ten dollars. Ah, very good, Mr. Hunsacker. <laughs> well, you laughed. Does winning ten dollars please you so much? No, I was just thinking of the situation, that's all. Huh? What situation? Why the difference between you and me? You, a rich and important man, powerful, influential, and me, your tenant, your serf, a poor widower, scratching to make his living by keeping your books and a few other people's books and never turning away a penny's worth of extra work if I can make it. And uh, you find that amusing? What I find amusing, Mr. Hunsaker, is that although our fortunes are far apart, we seem to share the same vices. What vices? What vices? You forget. I keep your accounts. I know what goes in and what goes out. I know how you spend every dollar. Oh, I'm the soul of discretion, you understand. But nevertheless, it's amusing to me to know that you are as much a prisoner of your vice as I am. Oh, well, let's leave it at that. I have given you my complete trust, Tribble. Of course, and I honor that trust. Betrayal is not one of my vices. No, sir. I'm proud to say that Jacob Tribble is as good as his word. All I say to you is, you are compelled to gamble. You will wager on anything. So will I. But then I'm only a humble private bookkeeper. But you, Mr. Hunsaker, you own the bank, and you're gambling with funds which do not belong to you. Our story, A Betting Man, continues in one minute. Now, Crisis brings you A Betting Man. Daddy, I know I'm not to interrupt. Well, that's I... right, Katie, my dear. Not while I'm trying to finish my accounts. One little mistake in my arithmetic and I... But, Daddy, I've just been out feeding midnight, and there's something wrong with her. Hmm? Well, her breathing is strange, and she seems to be bloated. Oh. Daddy, did you run her this afternoon? Run her? Oh, I may have let her have her head a little. And the water trough was empty. Well, she's acting as if she'd been run too much and then took too much water. Oh, she'll be all right. Now, let me get back to my figures. Yes, Daddy. Oh, by the way, Kate, my dear, come here. Yes? Look here what I have for you. Do you think you can put this to good use at the Emporium for a new dress and some ribbon and such as that? Ten dollars? Daddy, where did you get it? Oh, can we afford it? Yes, yes, we can afford it. Now, you take it for being such a sweet girl. <laughs> but, but so much. Well, where did it come from? Why, from a grateful client. A little bonus, as you might say. Oh, 
you must be a wonderful bookkeeper. I, I know you are. Yes, well, you, you take this down to the Emporium tomorrow and see what it'll buy. Oh, Daddy, thank you. You're welcome, Katie. Now, why don't you let me see if I can finish these books tonight for Mr. Hunsaker? Mr. Hunsaker? Is he very rich? <laughs> Is he very rich? Well, if you add up all the mortgages he owns, including ours, and all the interest being paid to him, uh, not counting what he takes out of his banking business, you might say that Mr. Hunsaker owns this town and about half the people in it. Ugh, he's so fat and ugly. What kind of a man is he? What kind? Mr. Micah Hunsaker is no more saintly than any of the rest of us, and probably no more of a sinner either, for that matter. The chief difference with Mr. Hunsaker is he is able to enjoy the luxury of deciding what to do with his money. Most men don't have that luxury. Every penny we can earn is committed, but the rich have options. Oh, I'll see who it is. One of your bowl, I'll bet you. Oh, Daddy. Good evening, Kate. Daniel MacArthur. I'm sorry to be calling so late, but uh, I was riding past on the way from seeing a patient, and I... A patient? A horse or a dog? <laughs> well, it, w it was a pony, actually. A, a birthday gift to a young man who wasn't taught how to care for it, I'm sorry to say. Oh. Oh, how wonderful that you're here. Who is it, Kate? Uh, Dr. MacArthur, Daddy. Oh, he's doing his books. You uh, said it was wonderful that I'm here? Oh, yes, uh, because there's something wrong with Midnight. Your mayor? Where, where is she? I'll see her right now. And that's about the best I can do for her tonight, Mr. Tribble. Well, you're kind to spend so much time with the old girl, Doctor. Only I have a feeling it's not the veterinarian that's so devoted. Sir? Well, that horse doesn't require bedside nursing. Could it be there's another attraction hereabouts? Uh, Daddy. Well? Well, you're perfectly right, Mr. Tribble. It's purely a joy for me to be here because, well, because of Kate. You have a wonderful daughter, sir. You must be very proud of her. Well, that I am, my friend. That I am. And I aim to keep her around for a few more years. Daddy! <laughs> I don't blame you in the least, sir. No, not in the least. You see, Dr. MacArthur, I'm a widower. Katie's mother passed on four years ago this summer, and, well, Kate and I sort of comfort each other. She's the cook, and I try to be both mother and father to her. Of course. We, we need each other, is, is what it comes down to. I understand that. Hey, Daddy, for heaven's sake, he didn't ask for my hand. Why, Daniel and I are just friends. Isn't that right, Daniel? Just friends? Uh, yes, Kate. Uh, I'll be whatever you want me to be. There, you see. A level-headed young man in a vital and respected profession. A good friend to have. But just a friend for now. Correct, my dear? Come in. Here's me. Oh, oh, Tribble, Tribble. Yes, here, um, I'll take the books. Everything's in order. Oh, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Well, I'll be going. You, uh, look tired, Tribble. It's only 10.30 in the morning. Well, I worked on your books until late last night, and I walked to town this morning. Oh? You didn't ride midnight? She's, uh, got something the matter with her. Yes, I expect she has. Look, uh, sit down here, Tribble. Uh, Tribble, I, I'm disturbed at a remark you made to me yesterday. Oh, what was that? Uh, about my gambling with funds, other people's funds. That is slander, Tribble. I didn't mean anything by it's it. It's a terrible thing to say. My banking affairs are completely separate from my personal affairs, and... Funds I may use for uh, speculation, wagering, or my own. Is that clear? Yes, sir. I didn't mean anything by it. All the same, I've been doing some serious thinking, Tribble. I've decided to relieve you of the responsibility of doing my accounts. Ah, you... <laughs> it appears that you have taken a personal interest in how I spend my personal funds. <laughs> and I cannot tolerate that... What I spend for my own recreation is nobody's business but my own. But you ran it through your books, sir, as a loan. What difference does it make? It makes no difference to you. Not anymore. 
I shan't require your services after today, Tribble. I see. All right. Oh, and uh, there is one other thing. A matter of bank business, Mr. Tribble. You were two months in arrears on your mortgage payment. Why, why, I've been two months behind for over a year now. You've always been willing to carry me. But no more, Tribble. No more. The bank is obligated to carry out sound business practices. I'm afraid if your payments are not brought up to date immediately, the bank will have no choice but to foreclose. Now, now, wait a minute. This can't be. Why, yesterday afternoon we were racing our horses together, betting together, and now... And now our positions are once again clear. You are the debtor. I am the creditor. But you're cutting me out. How can I... Pay the back payments when you cut me out. How indeed. Now, wait. You're a sporting man, Hunsaker. Suppose, suppose we say, suppose we say double or nothing. A cut of the cards. I'll either owe you twice the value of the mortgage payments or I'll owe you nothing. And what good would it do me to have you owe double what you owe now? You can't repay me as it is. But there must be something, something of mine that you'd take. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Yes, perhaps there is. Name it. It's yours. Ah, uh, but it isn't yours to give. What are you talking oh, about? Oh, nothing, nothing, Tribble, nothing. I'll, I'll think on it a while. Then I'll come and see you. In the meantime, we'll let things stand as they are. Then the, uh, the books and the mortgage? You will continue to do my accounts, and I shall continue carrying your mortgage until we come to terms. So far, Hunsaker sounds like a mixture of Scrooge and Simon Legree, and Tribble, a less sympathetic Bob Cratchit. Except, don't forget, both men, despite their completely opposite financial standing, share the same passion for gambling. And in the next few minutes of our story, this mutually shared vice will provide us with a wind-up that should surprise you. It's been nearly a week since banker Hunsaker threatened to foreclose and then changed his mind. Out of the Tribble's bungalow at the edge of town, Jacob hasn't had a moment's peace, tormented by the knowledge that Hunsaker is playing him as a cat toys with a mouse just before it devours him. Maybe he's really had a change of heart. Hunsaker, a change of heart? He doesn't own a heart, Katie. And all his money can't buy one. Well, what do you think he'll ask of you? I can't imagine. This old place is worthless. We don't have a fortune. We don't even have good land to, to, enough to farm here. Well, why must he torment us so? Oh, well, it's my problem, not yours, my dear. Oh. Maybe it's young MacArthur. Yes, maybe it is. I'll go. Well, good day, Miss Tribble. Uh, Mr. Hunsaker. I've come to see your father, if he's in. Uh, yes, yes, he's in. Uh, come inside. Uh, thank you, thank you. Ah, Tribble. So, you've come. Yes. You know my daughter, Kate. Oh, yes, indeed. I've seen her many times. Watched her grow up, as a matter of fact. When I first saw you, young lady, you were no higher than your father's belt. <laughs> you've grown some. How old would you be now? <laughs> oh, excuse me. Not a very gentlemanly thing to ask of a young lady now, is it? She's 19. Can I get you anything, Mr. Hunsaker? Katie, haven't we a drop of sherry in that old bottle? No, no, no. I, I won't be needing anything to drink, thank you. I took care of that proposition before coming to your door. Uh, I think I have chores to finish, uh, if you'll excuse me. Go ahead, Katie. Uh, may, uh, may I take a chair, Tribble? What? Oh, oh, yes, certainly, certainly. I'm sorry. Uh, well, <sighs> aren't you going to sit down? Huh? Oh, oh, yes, 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 of course. <laughs> good, good. Hunsaker, you've made this past week a living hell. I have? Yes. Not knowing whether we'll be evicted, not knowing what you may have in mind. Well, now it has taken me some time to deliberate on the questions, Tribble. Yes, I've had to cogitate, to weigh the situation carefully. 
owing to your recklessness with money, you may be expected never to acquire anything of value that might be taken in trade for what is owed me. I suppose you're right. And yet, the debt must be paid. Oh, of course, the debt must be paid. Never mind that you're rolling in wealth while I have barely two coppers to rub together at the end of a month. Yet you and your kind get richer while I and my kind get poorer uh, by keeping you rich. Tut, tut, tut now, Tribble. You make the common error all poor people make. You somehow think that to have sufficient means is to have no further needs. But I assure you that even a man in comfortable financial circumstances still must live, still must seek satisfactions that... Well, money cannot buy. Which, by the way, brings me to my proposition. Yes? And what is it? I propose, Jacob Tribble, to offer you a way to settle your long-standing indebtedness. A sporting way. A way which will appeal to your spirit of adventure. Do you have a deck of playing cards? Oh, yes. Will you get them and put them here on this table, please? Here. They're in this drawer. Good. Here you are. Here you are, right here. All right. Very well. Now... The other day, you proposed settling your debt with a cut of the cards. Now, I am agreeable to that proposition now, but with slightly different stakes. Yes, go on. You will cut the deck, conceal the card that lies on the bottom half of the deck. Then I will do the same. Then we will turn over our respective cards. Now, the holder of the higher card will win. I suggest aces high. Yes, all right, but uh, but what are the stakes? If your card is uh, the higher, I will tear up the mortgage on this property and will personally cancel all other notes held by the bank or by me personally, which you owe. You, you mean... I mean you would be out of debt, free and clear. Probably for the first time in your life. Very generous, but what if you win? If I turn up the higher card of the two cards, you will still be free and clear of all debts. What? I don't understand. Your debts will be canceled because you will have forfeited something I want very much to possess. What? What? Now, what is it? Your daughter. What? I'm a very rich man, Tribble, but a very lonely man. No woman ever chose to accept my proposals of marriage. What I propose is to make your daughter comfortable for the rest of her life as my wife. Kate? Married to you? A man, she's only 19. You must be 55. A very comfortable accommodation can be reached here, Tribble. Think. However you cut the cards, you cannot possibly lose. Either way, you are free of debt. But Kate... She will never lack for anything in this whole wide world. I know she's interested in that young, that young veterinarian, but what can he give her? Believe me, Tribble, I'm offering you a chance to give your daughter a life of plenty. Something I doubt she could ever enjoy otherwise. Oh, this is monstrous. I I just won't do it. Ah, but you will. I... And here's why. Number one, you can't resist the odds. 50-50. You may win. You have every bit as good a chance to win as I do. And number two, if you refuse my proposition, Triple, I shall foreclose on you immediately and call in all the notes you owe. And you and your daughter will be in the street within 72 hours. Now... What do you say? Do you care to shuffle or shall I? Go right ahead. All right. Very well. Now, make your cut. All right. Now it's my turn. Huh? All right. Now, go ahead. Look at your card. They... Nine of diamonds. The nine. Hmm. Very well. Let's see what I have. Oh, well, well, well. The ace. The ace of hearts. <laughs> How appropriate, Tribble. <laughs> Very well. I am a man of my word. You shall have Kate as your wife. But as her father, I'm entitled to make certain conditions. Well... As you know, Kate will be broken-hearted. She will get over it. It'll take time to prepare her for the marriage, unless you wish a weeping wife. How much time? Six months. Six months? 
Six months from today, Kate will be yours. She must be prepared for this, Hunsaker. What's six months out of a lifetime? Well, very well. And during this time, you must not attempt to see her, to court her, or call on her. What? If I were you, and I mean this for your own good, I would bend every effort to lose some weight. You should attempt to look like a younger man, for her sake, as well as your own. In six months' time, you could do it. Hmm. Well, perhaps you're right. Very well. Let it stand. In six months, I shall be slim and trim and ready to claim your daughter. Well, here I am. I can scarcely believe my eyes. You've done it. I weigh what a man of 25 might weigh. And you look elegant. A fine figure for your son-in-law, eh, Jacob? (laughs) Uh, Yes. Well, now, uh, where uh, where is she? It is six months to the day. Is she reconciled to marrying me? Oh, yes. Well, uh, where is she? In her room. Does she know what I've done with myself? No, I've left it as a surprise. Uh, I can hardly wait. Uh, Let me call her. Katie? Uh, Katie, Mr. Hunsaker's here. Come on out now. And here she is. As good as my word, Hunsaker, I present to you my only daughter, Katie Tribble, your bride. Tribble? What have you done? What have you done to her? What? Is that any way to speak to the girl of your dreams? Look at her. In heaven's name, Tribble, look. Why, why she, she's grotesque. <laughs> now see what you've done. What I've done. I've gone through six months of torture and fasting to lose a hundred pounds. And all the while... All the while, poor Katie's been so miserable, she's eaten herself into a state of uh, extreme obesity. I'm very much afraid she's gained a hundred pounds. She's a cow. A buffalo tribble. No one would have her. I'd be the laughing stock of the county. You... You tricked me. But she's yours. Take her. I wouldn't be seen dead with her, tribble. Goodbye. <laughs> All right. All right, Katie. He's gone. Now you can now you can go back to your room and take those bed pillows off and spit out that cotton in your cheeks and let's get on with the real wedding. Oh, Daddy, do you mean it? Or can I tell him? Of course you can tell him. Tell him you'll be Mrs. Daniel MacArthur as soon as you two can arrange it. But you better not let him see you like that. Oh, Daddy. And you won't change your mind. Kate Treble, don't you know, I am a man of my word. We'll be back with a word about next week's program in just a minute. Tonight, Crisis presented A Betting Man. With Tony Karloff, Doug Young, Debbie Adair, and Mark Wayne. The program was written and produced by yours truly, Jim French, at Audio Recording Incorporated in Seattle. Sound by Jeff Thompson, engineering by Connie Barton. We invite you to join us next week for Crisis. Tune in to nostalgia. Tune in to now. Golden Radio Hour.